Chapter Seven, Part Two of Nana by Emile Zola, translated by Burton Rasco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seven, Part Two. She pressed him with questions, asking everything, insisting on having details, and she laughed so heartily with such sudden outbursts as made her roll about in her nightdress, which one moment slipped from her shoulders and the next curled itself up under her and displayed her skin shining like gold in front of the blazing fire that the count little by little gave her the history of his wedding night he no longer felt any repugnance and ended by thinking it great fun to explain he merely chose his words through a remnant of shame the young woman very excited questioned him about the countess she was beautifully made but a regular icicle so he pretended oh you've no cause for jealousy he despicably murmured nana had left off laughing and had resumed her seat her back to the fire and her chin resting on her knees round which she had clasped her hands my dear fellow it's the greatest mistake out for a man to appear a ninny to his wife on the first night declared she in a grave tone of voice why asked the count in surprise because replied she slowly like a professor she was lecturing she wagged her head however she deigned to explain herself you see i know all about it well my boy women don't like simpletons they say nothing on account of their modesty you know but you may be quite sure they think a great deal and sooner or later when they haven't had what they expected they seek for it elsewhere there now you know as much as i do he did not seem to understand so she was more circumstantial she became quite maternal and gave him this lesson in a friendly way out of the kindness of her heart ever since she had heard that he was a cuckold the knowledge of this circumstance worried her she had a hankering to discuss the matter with him well really i've been talking of things that don't concern me what i say is simply because i want every one to be happy we're merely having a chat aren't we come now you must answer me truly but she interrupted herself to change her position the fire was so fierce by jove isn't it hot my back's quite cooked wait a moment i'll cook my stomach a bit now it's good for the spasms and when she had turned herself round with her legs doubled under her she resumed you and your wife don't occupy the same room do you no i assure you replied mifa afraid not to answer and you think that she's a regular stick he affirmatively bowed his head and that's why you come to me answer me i shan't be angry he bowed his head again very well concluded she i thought as much ah poor fellow you know my aunt madame Lara. next time she comes get her to tell you the story of the green grocer who lives in her street just fancy the green grocer dread it the fire is hot i must turn round again i'll cook my left side this time as she presented her hip to the flames a funny idea seized hold of her and she joked herself in a jolly sort of way delighted at seeing how plump and rosy she looked in the reflection of the fire i say i'm just like a goose yes that's it a goose roasting i turn i turn really i'm cooking in my own juice again she laughed aloud when suddenly there was a sound of voices and of closing doors mifa surprised interrogated her with a look she at once became serious and there was an anxious expression on her face it was no doubt zoe's cat a confounded beast that was always breaking everything half past twelve whatever had she been thinking of wasting her time in working for her cuckold's happiness now that the other one was there she must get rid of him and quickly too what were you saying asked the count complacently delighted at finding her so amiable but in her desire to send him off her humour quickly changed she was coarse and no longer minced her words ah uh, yes the greengrocer and his wife well my boy they never got on together not a bit she you know expected all sorts of things but he was a ninny and so it went on till it ended like this he thinking her a stick went with a lot of strumpets and got more than he bargained for whilst she on her side consoled herself with some fellows who knew a trifle more than her simpleton of a husband and it always ends like that when you don't understand each other i know it does 
Mifa paled, understanding at last her allusions, and wished to make her leave off. But she intended to have her say. No, hold your row. If you were not all a set of fools, you would be just as nice with your wives as you are with us. And if your wives were not a lot of geese, they would take the same trouble to keep you to themselves that we take to hook you. But you all give yourself such confounded airs. There, my boy, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Do not talk about respectable women, said he severely. You do not know anything about them. On hearing this, Nana rose on her knees. I don't know anything about them. But they're not even clean, your respectable women. No, they're not even clean. I defy you to find one who would dare to show herself as I am here. Really, you make me laugh with your respectable women. Don't drive me too hard. Don't force me to say things that I should regret afterwards. For sole rejoinder, the Count muttered a foul word between his teeth. Nana, in her turn, became deadly pale. She looked at him for a few seconds without speaking. Then, in a clear voice, she asked, What would you do if your wife deceived you? He made a menacing gesture. Well, and I, supposing I deceived you? Oh, you, he murmured, shrugging his shoulders. Nana was certainly not unfeeling. Ever since the first word she had been resisting a desire to tell him of his cuckoldom to his face. She would have liked to have confessed to him quietly. But he exasperated her. She must put an end to it. Therefore, my boy, she resumed, I don't know what the devil you're doing here. You've done nothing but pester me for the last two hours. So go and join your wife who's consoling herself with faucherie. Yes, I know what I'm saying. In the Rue Thébou, at the corner of the Rue de Provence. I give you the address, you see. Then, seeing Mufa rise on his feet, staggering like an ox that had just received a stunning blow, she added triumphantly, Ah, they're getting on well, your respectable women. They even interfere with us now and take our lovers. But she was unable to continue. In a terrible passion he threw her full length on the floor and raising his heel was about to crush her face to silence her. For the moment she had an awful fright, but he blinded and as though mad left her and rushed helplessly about the room. Then the choking silence he maintained, the sight of the internal struggle which shook his frame brought tears to her eyes. She felt a mortal regret, and curling herself up before the fire so as to cook her right side, she undertook to console him. I assure you, darling, I thought you knew of it. Otherwise, I certainly would not have spoken. Then, after all, perhaps it isn't true. I'm not sure of anything. I merely heard it. People talk about it. But that proves nothing, does it? Ah, really now, you're very stupid to be put out about it. If I was a man, I wouldn't care a tinker's curse for any woman. Women, my boy, high or low, are all the same. All loose fish. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. She went in for abusing women in general so as to make the blow less hard to bear. But he did not listen to her. He did not hear her. While stamping about he had somehow or other managed to get on his boots and his overcoat. For a moment longer he wandered about the room. Then with a last rush, as though he had only just discovered the door, he disappeared. Nana felt very much put out. Well, ta-ta! she continued aloud, though all alone. He's polite he is when he's being spoken to, and I, who was sweating away to make it up again with him. Anyhow, I was the first to hold out my hand. I made quite enough excuses, I think. Besides, he shouldn't have stopped here annoying me. However, she remained displeased with herself, scratching her legs with both hands, but she at length muttered consolingly, Oh, dash it! It isn't my fault that he's a cuckold and, roasted on all sides, as hot as a quail just removed from the spit, she jumped into bed, after ringing for Zoe to usher in the other one who was waiting in the kitchen. Outside, Mifa continued to hurry on. Another shower had just fallen. He slipped along the greasy pavement. As he mechanically looked up in the air, he saw large black clouds floating rapidly across the moon. At that hour, the boulevard houseman was almost deserted. He passed the scaffoldings of the new opera house, keeping in the shadow and stammering disconnected sentences. The girl lied. She had cruelly invented that to annoy him. He ought to have crushed her head when he had it beneath his heel. 
It was too shameful. He would never touch her nor see her again. If he did, he would indeed be a cur. And he drew a long breath of relief at his deliverance. Ah, that stupid naked monster cooking like a goose, driveling about all that he had respected for forty years past. The clouds had cleared away from the moon, which now lighted up the empty street. He was seized with fear and burst into sobs, suddenly giving way to despair, as though he had been precipitated into illimitable space. Oh, heaven, he stammered, all is over, there is nothing more. Along the boulevards a few belated pedestrians were hurrying home. The Count tried to compose himself. The girl's story kept perplexing his heated brain. He wished to examine it calmly. That very morning the Countess was to return from Madame de Chazelle's chateau. There was nothing to have prevented her returning on the previous evening and passing the night with that man. He now recalled certain things that had occurred during their stay at Les Fondettes. One night he had found Sabine wandering about among the trees, and she was so agitated that for some time she was unable to answer him. That man was there, then. Why should she not be with him now? The more he thought of it, the more it seemed to him possible. He ended by thinking it only natural and even inevitable. Whilst he had been taking off his coat at a harlot's, his wife had been disrobing herself in a lover's bedchamber. There was nothing more simple or more logical. And as he reasoned thus, he forced himself to keep cool. He experienced the sensation of a fall into the follies of the flesh, which spreading and gaining on him swept the world away from around him. Phantoms created by his heated imagination pursued him. Nana, undressed, abruptly evoked Sabine, undressed also. At this vision, which gave the two women a like parentage of wantonness and the same inordinate desires, he stumbled. A cab passing along the road nearly crushed him. Some women coming out of a café pushed up against him, laughing coarsely. Then, again giving way to tears, in spite of his efforts and not wishing to sob aloud before the passers-by, he turned down a dark empty street, the Rue Rossini, where he cried like a child as he moved past the silent houses. "'All is over,' he kept saying in a hollow voice. "'There is nothing more, nothing more.' His tears so mastered him that he leant against a door, burying his wet face in his hands. A sound of footsteps chased him away. He felt such shame and such fear that he fled from everyone with the cautious tread of a night prowler. Whenever anybody passed him on the pavement, he tried to assume a careless gait, as though he imagined that his history could be read in the movement of his shoulders. He had turned down the Rue de la Grande Batelière and reached the Faubourg Montmartre, but the bright lights caused him to retrace his footsteps, and for close upon an hour he wandered thus about the neighborhood, choosing always the darkest turnings. He had no doubt a goal to which his feet instinctively conducted him, patiently and by a most circuitous road. At length, at the turn of a street, he raised his eyes. He had arrived. It was the corner of the Rue Thébou and of the Rue de Provence. He had, in the painful disorder of his brain, taken an hour to reach it, while he might have done so in five minutes. One morning in the previous month he recollected having called on Faucherie to thank him for having mentioned his name in the description of a ball at the Tuileries. The apartment was on the first floor, with little square windows half hidden by the colossal signboard of the shop. The last window on the left was divided by a streak of brilliant light, the ray of a lamp passing between the partly closed curtains and with his eyes fixed on that bright line he stood absorbed, awaiting something. The moon had disappeared in an inky sky from which a drizzling icy rain fell. Two o'clock struck at the Church of the Trinity. The Rue de Provence and the Rue Thébou with their lighted gas lamps disappeared in the distance in a yellow vapor. Mufa did not stir. That was the room. He recollected it well, hung in crimson and with a Louis the Thirteenth bedstead at the back of the apartment, the lamp was probably to the right on the mantelpiece. No doubt they were in bed, for not a shadow passed the immovable line of light. And he, still watching, arranged a plan. He would ring, and hastening upstairs, in spite of the doorkeeper, would burst into the room and fall upon them in bed, without even giving them time to disengage their arms. The knowledge that he had no weapon arrested him for a moment. Then he decided that he would strangle them. He turned his plan over in his head. He perfected it always awaiting something, some sign, to make him certain. 
had the shadow of a woman's form appeared in that moment he would have rung the bell but the thought that he was perhaps mistaken froze him what would he be able to say his doubts returned to him his wife could not be with that man the idea was monstrous and impossible but still he stayed on overcome by degrees by numbness succumbing to weakness in that long vigil to which the fixity of his look imparted a sense of hallucination the shower increased two police officers drew near and he was obliged to leave the doorpost against which he had sought shelter when they had disappeared down the rue de provence he returned wet and shivering the bright line still showed across the window this time he was going away when a shadow passed the movement was so rapid that he thought he might be mistaken but one after another other shadows passed and there seemed quite a commotion in the room riveted again to the pavement opposite he experienced an insupportable sensation of burning in the stomach profiles or arms and legs came and went an enormous hand bearing the silhouette of a water-can glided by he distinguished nothing clearly yet he thought he recognized a woman's head of hair and he argued within himself it was like sabine's headdress only the back of the neck seemed broader than hers but at that hour he was incapable of determining he could not tell his stomach caused him so much suffering that he pressed up against a door like a shivering outcast to obtain relief in the agony of this frightful uncertainty then as in spite of all he could not take his eyes from off that window his anger melted into the imagination of a moralist he saw himself a deputy he was speaking in the chamber inveighing against debauchery prophesying catastrophes and he repeated the arguments in fauchery's article on the poisonous fly and declared that society could no longer exist with the manners and customs of the second empire this did him some good the shadows had now disappeared no doubt they had gone back to bed he ever on the watch still waited three o'clock struck then four o'clock he could not tear himself away each time a shower came down he squeezed up against the doorpost the rain beating on his legs no one passed by now occasionally his eyes closed as though burnt by the ray of light on which with obstinate folly he persistently fixed them twice again did the shadows reappear going through the same movements carrying the same gigantic water-can and each time afterwards all became still as before whilst the lamp continued to glimmer discreetly these shadows increased his doubts besides a sudden idea had just appeased him in deferring the hour of action he had merely to wait till the woman came out he would easily recognize sabine nothing could be simpler there would be no scandal and he would no longer be in doubt all he had to do was to remain there of all the confused feelings that had hitherto agitated him he no longer experienced anything but a morbid desire to know having nothing to do however standing up against that door soon made him feel drowsy to keep himself awake he tried to calculate the time it would be necessary for him to wait sabine was to arrive at the station at about nine o'clock that gave him almost four and a half hours he was full of patience he would never have moved again finding a charm in fancying that his night vigil would be an eternal one suddenly the ray of light disappeared this very simple occurrence was an unexpected catastrophe for him something disagreeable and annoying they had evidently turned out the lamp and were going to sleep at such an hour it was only natural but he felt irritated because that window being now in darkness no longer interested him he watched it for a quarter of an hour longer then it tired him so he left the doorway and took a few steps along the pavement until five o'clock he walked to and fro occasionally raising his eyes the window remained in the same dormant state and at times he would ask himself whether he had not dreamed that he had seen shadows cross those panes a great fatigue overwhelmed him which made him forget what he was waiting for at that street corner stumbling over the paving stones awaking with starts and the cold shiver of a man who no longer knows where he is what was the good of his bothering himself about the matter as the people had gone to sleep all he had to do was to leave them in peace why should he mix himself up in their affairs it was very dark no one would know of his having waited there and then all feeling in him even his curiosity fled carried away in a desire to have done with it all and to seek some solace elsewhere 
the cold increased the street became unbearable twice he moved away then returned slowly but only to move away again farther off it was over there was nothing more he went in the direction of the boulevards and did not return he wandered silently through the streets he walked slowly always with the same step and keeping close to the wall his heels resounded on the pavement he beheld nothing but his shadow which turned at each lamp-post becoming larger and smaller that amused him mechanically occupying him afterwards he would never recall through what streets he had gone he seemed to have dragged himself along for hours in a circle one single recollection remained and that very clearly he had found himself he could not tell how with his face pressed against the iron railings that closed the passage des panorama clasping the bars in his hands he was not shaking them he was merely trying to see into the passage under the influence of an emotion with which his heart was bursting but he could distinguish nothing darkness reigned in the deserted gallery whilst the wind which entered by the rue saint marc blew the dampness of a cellar into his face and a strange infatuation kept him there then awakening as though from a dream he was filled with surprise and asked himself what he was seeking at that hour pressed against those railings with such a force that the bars had left their marks upon his face and he resumed his tramp in despair his heart filled with a great sadness as if betrayed and alone for evermore in all that darkness day at length broke and to the winter night there succeeded that dull light which looks so melancholy on the muddy pavement of paris Mufa had returned into the large new roads that were being made around the scaffoldings of the new opera house soaked by the showers broken up by the heavy carts the chalky soil had become changed into a miry lake and without looking where he placed his feet he continued walking on slipping and with difficulty keeping his legs the awakening of paris the gangs of scavengers and the early groups of workmen brought him a fresh worry as the day advanced he was stared at with surprise with his wild appearance his muddy clothes and his hat soaked with the rain for a long time he sought refuge against the palings among the scaffolding in his empty head one idea alone remained which was that he was very miserable then his thoughts turned to god the sudden idea of divine assistance of a superhuman consolation surprised him like something extraordinary and unexpected it awakened in his mind the picture of monsieur Venot. he beheld his plump little person his decayed teeth for certain m venot whom for months past he had been grieving by not going near him would be very happy were he now to knock at his door and weep on his breast at other times god had always been merciful to him at the least sorrow or the smallest obstacle encountered in life he would enter a church and kneeling would humble himself before the supreme being and he would come out fortified by prayer ready to enjoy the sweets of life with the sole desire for the salvation of his soul but now he could only pray by fits and starts just when a fear of hell seized upon him he had given way to a great indolence nana interfered with his duties and the thought of god surprised him why had he not thought of the almighty in the first instance during that frightful crisis in which his weak humanity succumbed then with feeble footsteps he sought a church he could remember nothing the early hours seemed to alter the streets as he turned the corner of the rue de la chassée d'antin however he caught sight of the church of the trinity in the distance its steeple seen very indistinctly in the fog the white statues overlooking the naked garden appeared like so many shining venuses among the faded yellow leaves of a park beneath the porch he paused a moment to take breath fatigued by the ascent of the high flight of steps then he entered the church was very cold the great stove having been extinguished the previous evening and the tall arches were filled with a fine mist which had filtered in through the apertures of the glass windows a shadow hung over the lower part not a soul was there beyond a beetle who in the midst of that semi-darkness dragged his feet over the stones in the sullenness of the awaking hour Mufa, after knocking up against the number of chairs feeling lost his heart fit to burst had fallen on his knees against the railings of a little side chapel close to a holy water font he had clasped his hands trying to find a prayer in which he could pour forth his very soul but his lips alone muttered words his mind was elsewhere outside following the streets without repose as though beneath the lash of some implacable necessity and he repeated 
o oh, lord help me o oh, god do not abandon your creature who abandons himself to your justice o oh, merciful father i adore you will you let me perish beneath the blows of your enemies nothing seemed to answer the shadow and the cold hung about his shoulders the noise of the beetle walking in the distance continued and prevented him from praying he heard not but that irritating sound in the deserted church which had not even then been swept nor had the early mass been performed then holding on to a chair he raised himself with a cracking of his knees god had not yet arrived why should he go and weep on m venot's breast that man could do nothing and he mechanically returned to nana's outside having slipped he felt tears come to his eyes not with anger against fate but simply because he felt weak and ill he was really too tired he had been out too long in the rain he felt the cold too much it froze him to think of going back to his dismal home in the rue miromenil at nana's the street door was not open he had to wait till the concierge appeared as he went upstairs he smiled already feeling the pleasant warmth of that nest where he would at length be able to stretch himself and sleep when zoe let him in she made a gesture of amazement and uneasiness madame having been seized by a violent headache hadn't closed her eyes all night however she would go and see whether she had fallen asleep or not and she glided into the bedroom whilst he sank down on a chair in the drawing-room but nana appeared almost instantly she had jumped out of bed scarcely taking time to put on a petticoat and entered with bare feet her hair hanging about her shoulders her night-dress rumpled and torn in the disorder of a night of love what you are here again cried she red with passion under the influence of her rage she was hastening to put him out herself but seeing him in such a state so utterly helpless she was once more moved to pity well you're in a nice mess my poor fellow she resumed in a more pleasant tone of voice what is the matter with you ah you've been watching them you've been having a time of it he said nothing he looked like a stunned ox yet she understood that he had not been able to obtain any proof as she added just to bring him to himself again you see i was mistaken your wife is all right on my word she is now my boy you must go home and get to bed you are in want of sleep he did not stir come be off i can't keep you here you don't i suppose want to stop at this time of day yes let us go to sleep he muttered she repressed a violent gesture she was fast losing patience was he going crazy come be off said she a second time no then thoroughly exasperated she broke out in revolt but it's disgusting understand me i've had a great deal too much of you go and find your wife who's making a cuckold of you yes she's making a cuckold of you it's i who tell you so now there have you got what you wanted will you leave me or not mifa's eyes filled with tears he clasped his hands let us go to sleep nana scarcely knew what she did choking as she was with nervous sobs it was too much did all these matters concern her she had certainly taken all possible precaution in telling him so as not to hurt his feelings and now she was to pay for the broken glass oh no if you please she was good-natured but not to that extent damnation i've had enough of it all swore she striking the furniture with her clenched fists ah well i who took so much care to keep faithful why my fine fellow i could be as rich as ever to-morrow if i only said a word he raised his head in surprise he had never given the money question a thought if she would express a desire he would gratify it at once his whole fortune was hers no it's too late replied she furiously i like the men who give without being asked no were you to offer me a million for one embrace i would refuse you it's all over i have something better there be off or i will no longer answer for myself i shall do something dreadful and she advanced towards him menacingly but in the midst of this exasperation of a kind-hearted girl pushed to extremes and convinced of her right and of her superiority over the worthy people who pestered her the door suddenly opened and steiner appeared 
This was the last straw. She uttered a terrible cry. Hello, here's the other one now. Steiner, bewildered by the noise of her voice, stood still. Mifa's unexpected presence annoyed him, for he was afraid of an explanation from which he had kept aloof for three months past. Blinking his eyes, he twisted himself about in an uneasy sort of way and avoided looking at the Count, and he breathed hard with the red and distorted features of a man who has rushed about Paris to bring some good news and who finds he has fallen into a catastrophe. "'What do you want, you, eh?' asked Nana roughly, speaking familiarly to him in spite of the Count's presence. "'I, I,' he stammered, "'I have brought you. You know what?' what's that he hesitated two days before she had told him not to show himself there again without bringing a thousand francs which she required to pay a bill for two days he had been seeking the money and he had just succeeded in completing the sum that very morning the thousand francs he ended by saying as he withdrew an envelope from his pocket nana had forgotten all about them the thousand francs cried she do i ask for charity look see what i do with your thousand francs and seizing the envelope she threw it in his face like a prudent jew he picked it up though painfully he glanced at the young woman in a stupefied fashion mifa exchanged a look of despair with him whilst nana placed her hands on her hips in order to shout the louder i say now have you nearly finished insulting me as for you my boy i'm glad you've also come for now look here i can have a clean sweep now then out you go then as they did not seem to hurry themselves but stood as though paralyzed she went on what you say i'm foolish that's possible but you've plagued me too much and drat it all i've had enough of a fashionable existence if i bust up it's my lookout one two you refuse to go well look here then i've got a friend with a sudden movement she threw the bedroom door wide open then the two men beheld Fontaine in the middle of the tumbled bed. He had not expected to be exhibited thus, with his dusky person spread out like a goat in the midst of the crumpled lace, his legs showing under the flying tail of his nightshirt. He was not, however, by any means embarrassed, used as he was to the surprises of the stage. After the first shock was over, he was able to make a face which ensured him the honors of war. He did the rabbit, as he called it, thrusting out his mouth, curling his nose and moving all the muscles of his face at the same time his head resembling that of a libidinous fawn exuded vice through every pore it was fontan whom nana seized by that mad infatuation of women for the hideous grimaces of ugly comic actors had been fetching nightly for a week past from the variety theatre there said she pointing to him with a tragic gesture mifa who was prepared for almost anything indignantly resented the affront strumpet he stammered but nana already in the bedroom returned to have the last word strumpet indeed then what about your wife and turning on her heel she loudly banged the door after her and bolted it the two men left alone looked at each other in silence zoe then entered the room she did not hurry them off but talked very sensibly to them like a reasonable being she thought madame had behaved very foolishly however she took her part her mania for that wretched stroller wouldn't last long all they had to do was to wait till she had got over it they then withdrew they had not uttered a word outside on the pavement moved by a sort of fraternal feeling they silently shook hands and turning their backs on each other and dragging their legs along they went off in opposite directions when mifa at length returned to his house in the rue miromenil his wife had just arrived there they both met on the broad staircase, the sombre walls of which diffused an icy chill around. Raising their eyes, they beheld each other. The Count was still in his muddy clothes, and his face had the frightful pallor of a man returning from a surfeit of vice. The Countess, blear-eyed with her hair all dishevelled, and looking thoroughly exhausted by a night passed in the train, seemed scarcely able to keep awake. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight, Part One of Nana by Emile Zola, translated by Burton Roscoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight Part One. 
it was in the rue veron at montmartre in a little apartment on the fourth floor nana and fonta had invited a few friends to partake of their twelfth night cake they had only got settled three days before and intended having a housewarming everything had been done hastily in the first ardour of their honeymoon without any fixed intention of their living together on the morrow of her grand brawl when she had so energetically sent the count and the banker about their business nana felt that she had got herself into a fine mess she saw her position at a glance the creditors would invade her ante-room interfere in her love affairs and talk of selling her up if she was not reasonable there would be endless quarrels and constant worries just to keep a few sticks of furniture from their grasp she preferred to let all go besides she was sick of her apartment in the boulevard houseman it was unbearable with its great gilded rooms in her infatuation for fontan her dream of her girlhood returned to her of the days when she was apprenticed to the artificial flower-maker and longed for nothing more than a pretty bright little room with a wardrobe of violet ebony with a glass door and a bed hung with blue rep in two days she sold everything that she could safely remove knick-knacks jewels and the like and disappeared with about ten thousand francs without saying a word to the landlord a perfect header and not a trace remaining behind that accomplished there was no fear of having any men dangling about her petticoats fontan was very nice he didn't say no he let her do as she liked in fact he behaved altogether like a regular chum he possessed about seven thousand francs and agreed to put them with nana's ten thousand although he had the reputation of being miserly that seemed to them something solid to start housekeeping on and they commenced thus each taking what he or she required out of the common fund furnishing the two rooms in the rue veron and sharing everything alike at the beginning this kind of life was simply delicious on twelfth night madame lerat was the first to arrive with little louis as fontan had not returned she ventured to express her fears for she trembled to see her niece renouncing fortune oh aunt i love him so much cried nana pressing her hands prettily across her breast these words produced an extraordinary effect on madame lerat her eyes moistened that's right said she in a convincing manner love before everything and she praised the prettiness of the rooms nana showed her everything in the bedroom and the dining-room and even in the kitchen well they were not large but they had been newly painted and papered and the sun shone there so brilliantly then madame lerat kept the young woman in the bedroom whilst little louis went and installed himself in the kitchen behind the charwoman in order to see her put a chicken down to roast if she ventured to make any remarks it was because zoe had been to see her only a short time before zoe was so devoted to madame that she bravely remained at the breach madame would pay her some time or other she had no anxiety on that score and in the downfall of the establishment of the boulevard houseman she coped with the creditors operating a masterly retreat saving waifs from the wreck and telling every one that madame was travelling but without ever giving an address and for fear too of being followed she denied herself the pleasure of calling on madame however that very morning she had hastened to madame lerat because there was something new in the wind the day before several creditors had called the upholsterer the coal merchant the milliner and they had offered to give time proposing even to advance a considerable sum of money to madame if madame would return to her apartment and consent to act like a sensible being the aunt repeated zoe's very words there was no doubt some gentleman at the bottom of all that never declared nana indignantly well they're a dirty lot those tradespeople do they think that i'm going to sell myself just for the sake of seeing their bills paid listen to me now i'd sooner die of hunger than deceive fontan that's just what i answered said madame lerat i told her that you would only obey the dictates of your heart nana however was very annoyed to hear that la mignotte had been sold and that la bordette had purchased it for the most ridiculous sum for caroline Ecke. that put her in a rage against the clique they were nothing better than street walkers in spite of their grand airs ah yes by jove she was worth more than the whole lot of them they may laugh she wound up by saying money will never get them real happiness and then look you aunt i no longer know even whether these people are in existence i am too happy to give them a thought 
just then madame maloire entered with one of those extraordinary bonnets which she alone had the science of making it was quite a happy meeting madame maloire explained that greatness intimidated her but that now she would call occasionally to have a game at bezique for the second time they went over the apartments and in the kitchen in the presence of the charwoman who was basting the chicken nana talked of how economical she was going to be saying that a servant would cost too much and that she intended to do the housework herself whilst little louis greedily watched the chicken roasting but there was a sound of voices it was fontan with bosque and prudiere the dinner could be served at once and the soup was already on the table when nana for the third time showed her guests over the rooms ah children how comfortable you must be here bus kept saying simply to please the friends who stood him a dinner for in reality the question of the nest as he called it did not affect him in the least in the bedroom he seemed scarcely able to find sufficient words to express his admiration usually he alluded to women as being no better than animals and the idea that a man could embarrass himself with one of the dirty hussies raised in him the only indignation of which he was capable in the drunken disdain with which he enveloped the world ah the lucky ones he continued blinking his eyes they've done it all on the sly well really you're right it'll be charming and we'll come and see you i'm blowed if we won't but as little louise just then galloped in riding on a broom handle prudiere said with a malicious giggle what you've already got that big baby they all thought it very funny madame lerat and madame maloire nearly spit their sides with laughing nana far from feeling offended smiled in a loving sort of way saying that unfortunately it was not the case she would have liked it to have been so for the little one's sake and her own but perhaps they would have one all the same fontan acting the kind-hearted man took little louis in his arms playing with him and stuttering all the same you love your papa don't you call me papa you little monkey papa papa lisped the child every one caressed and fondled him busk taking no real interest in the matter moved that they should go to dinner that was the only thing worth living for nana asked to be allowed to have little louis beside her the meal was a very merry one busk however did not get on very well on account of the child's proximity to him and his time was taken up in defending his plate from the youngster's attacks madame lerat disturbed him also she became very tender and whispered in his ear most mysterious things stories of gentlemen very well off who still followed her about and on two separate occasions he was obliged to move his knee for she kept pushing hers against it looking at him most lovingly the while Prudiere behaved most shamefully to madame maloire not helping her to a single thing he was occupied solely with nana greatly annoyed at seeing her with fontan the turtle doves too were becoming a nuisance kissing each other at every moment in spite of all the usages they had persisted in sitting side by side do leave off and eat your dinners bus kept on saying with his mouth full you will have plenty of time to cuddle each other afterwards wait till we have gone but nana could not restrain herself she was all wrapped up in her love as rosy as a virgin and full of endearing smiles and glances with her eyes fixed on fontan she called him all the pretty names she could think of ducky darling cherub and whenever he handed her anything the water or the salt she leant forward and kissed him on whatever part of his head her lips encountered on his eyes his nose or his ears then if the other scolded her she retired again to her seat with most wary tactics and the humility and suppleness of a cat that had just been whipped though at the same time slyly taking hold of his hand beneath the table to kiss it again at the first opportunity she must touch some part of him fontan assumed an important air and condescendingly allowed himself to be adored his big nose quivered with a sensual joy his goatish physiognomy his ugliness suggestive of some ridiculous monster seemed to expand beneath the devout adoration of that superb girl so plump and white occasionally he would return her kiss like a man who though having the best of it still wishes to act nicely look here you two you are really unbearable exclaimed prudiere at length get out of there you and he turned fontan out of his seat changing the plates and glasses and took the place beside nana 
this called forth no end of exclamations outbursts of applause and some rather indecent remarks fontan pretended to be in despair and assumed his comical look of vulcan crying for venus Rulière at once made himself very attentive but nana whose foot he tried to touch under the table gave him a kick to force him to leave off no she would certainly not have anything to do with him the month before she had been slightly smitten with his handsome head but now she detested him if he pinched her again when pretending to pick up his napkin she would throw her glass in his face but everything went off well they naturally talked of the variety theatre that rogue bordenave would never die it seemed his foul diseases had broken out again and he was in such a state that one could scarcely touch him with a pair of tongs the day before he had done nothing but blackguard simon all through the rehearsal nobody would weep for him over much nana said that if he dared to offer her another part she would send him to the devil besides she didn't think she would go up on the stage again she preferred being at home to being at the theatre fontan who was not in the new piece nor yet in the one they were rehearsing also exaggerated the sweets of liberty and the felicity of spending his evenings with his little darling his legs stretched out before the fire and the others called them lucky creatures pretending to envy their happiness they had cut the twelfth night cake the bean had fallen to madame lerat who at once put it in bust glass then they all shouted the king drinks the king drinks nana took advantage of this outburst of gaiety to put her arms around fontan's neck and kiss him and whisper in his ear but Prulière, with the vexed laugh of a handsome fellow who finds his good looks are not appreciated cried out that it was not fair little louis had been put to sleep on two chairs and the party did not break up till one in the morning the guests calling out good night as they descended the stairs and for three weeks the life of the two lovers was sweet indeed nana thought herself back at the commencement of her career when her first silk dress had caused her so much pleasure she went out but little affecting solicitude and simplicity one morning early when going to buy some fish at the rochefoucauld market she was astonished to find herself face to face with francis the hairdresser he was dressed with his habitual correctness fine clean linen and an irreproachable overcoat and she was ashamed at being seen by him in the street in a dirty morning gown her hair all in disorder and with a pair of old shoes upon her feet but he had the tact to be even more exaggerated in his politeness he did not ask a question but pretended to think that madame had been abroad ah madame had broken a great many hearts by going away it was a loss for all the world the young woman however seized with a curiosity which ended by dispelling her first embarrassment could not refrain from questioning him as the crowd kept jostling against them she drew him into a doorway and stood in front of him with her little basket in her hand what was being said about her little escapade well really the ladies at whose houses he called said this and that in short it had caused quite a commotion and was undoubtedly a tremendous success and steiner m steiner had fallen very low he would end badly unless he succeeded in some fresh speculation and dagonet oh he was doing very well m dagonet was settling down nana excited by her reminiscences was on the point of asking some fresh question but she felt a restraint in uttering Bifa's name then francis smilingly alluded to him as for the count it was shocking to see him he had suffered so much after madame's departure he looked like the ghost of some unburied corpse as he wandered about the various places that madame used to frequent however m mignon having come across him had taken him home this news made nana laugh but in a constrained manner ah so he's with rose now said she well you know francis i don't care a hang the old hypocrite he's got into such habits he can't even abstain from them for a few days and he swore that he would never have anything to do with any woman after me though outwardly calm she was in reality greatly enraged it's my leavings she resumed rose has treated herself to a queer fish oh i see it all she wanted to have her revenge for my carrying off that old beast steiner from her she's done a smart thing in taking a man into her house that i turned out of mine m mignon tells a different story said the hairdresser according to him it was the count who turned you out yes and in a rather unpleasant way too with a kick behind 
on hearing this nana became deadly pale a what exclaimed she a kick behind well that's too much that is why my boy it was i who chucked him downstairs the cuckold for he is a cuckold as i dare say you know his countess has no end of lovers even that filthy faucherie and that mignon who walks the streets for his monkey-faced wife whom no one will touch because she's so skinny what a beastly world what a beastly world she was choking she stopped to take breath ah so they say that well my little francis i'll just go and seek them out shall we go together at once yes i'll go and we'll see if they'll have the cheek to talk then about kicks behind kicks why i have never submitted to be kicked by any one and i'll never be beaten either because look you i'd killed the man who laid a finger on me but she gradually quieted down after all they could say what they liked she thought no more of them than of the mud on her shoes it would defile her to pay the least attention to such people she had her conscience and that was enough for her and francis became more familiar seeing her expose her inmost feelings as she stood there in her dirty old gown and he ventured to give her some advice she was foolish to sacrifice everything simply for an infatuation infatuation spoilt life she listened to him holding down her head whilst he spoke in a sad tone of voice like a connoisseur who grieved to see so lovely a girl throw herself away in such a manner that's my business she ended by saying but thanks all the same old fellow she squeezed his hand which was always a trifle greasy in spite of his perfect get-up then she left him and went to buy her fish during the day the story of the kick behind occupied her a great deal she even spoke of it to fontan again affecting the style of a strong-minded woman who would not submit to an insult from any one fontan like the superior being he was declared that all those grand gentlemen were muffs and that they should despise them and from that moment nana was filled with a real disdain it happened that evening that they went to the Bouff theatre to see a little woman whom fontan knew make her first appearance in a part of ten lines it was nearly one o'clock in the morning when they at last got back to montmartre on foot in the rue de la chaussee d'antin they had stopped to buy a cake a mocha and they ate it in bed because the night was cold and it was not worth while lighting a fire sitting up in bed side by side with the clothes well over them and the pillows piled up high behind they talked of the little woman as they supped nana thought her ugly and quite without go fontan who slept on the outside of the bed passed the slices of cake which stood on the night table between a box of matches and the candle but they ended by quarrelling oh is it possible to talk so cried nana her eyes are like gimlet holes and her hair is the colour of tow shut up replied fontan she has beautiful hair and her eyes are full of fire it's funny that you women always pull each other to pieces he seemed greatly annoyed there that's enough he said at length in a rough tone of voice you know i don't like wrangling we'll go to sleep or there'll be a row and he blew out the candle nana was furious and continued talking she was not going to be spoken to like that she was in the habit of being respected as he no longer answered she was obliged to leave off but she could not go to sleep she kept turning over and turning over damn it all have you finished moving about he asked suddenly jumping up in a sitting posture it's not my fault if there are crumbs in the bed said she sharply and there were indeed crumbs in the bed she even felt them under her legs they were all about her the smallest crumb irritated her and made her scratch herself till her flesh bled besides when one eats anything in bed one should always shake the clothes afterwards fontan in a towering rage lit the candle they both got out and in their night-dresses and with their feet bare they uncovered the bed and swept the crumbs away with their hands he who was shivering all the time hastily got back into bed and told her to go to the devil because she asked him to wipe his feet then she returned to her place but she had scarcely lain down again before she recommenced her dance there were still some crumbs left of course i knew it said she you brought them back again on your feet i can't go to sleep like this i tell you i can't and she rose in bed as though about to step over him then unable to stand it any longer and wishing to go to sleep fontan thrust out his arm and slapped her 
the blow was given with such force that nana at once found herself lying down in bed again with her head on the pillow she lay still as though stunned oh said she simply sighing like a child he threatened her with another smack if she moved again then blowing out the candle he turned on his back and soon began to snore she buried her face in her pillow to smother her sobs it was cowardly to take advantage of her inferior strength but she was dreadfully frightened fontan's usually funny face had looked so terrible and her anger disappeared as though the smack had appeased it she respected him she squeezed up against the wall to leave him all the room with her cheek tingling her eyes full of tears she even ended by falling asleep in such a delicious dejection of spirits in such a wearied state of submission that she no longer felt the crumbs in the morning when she awoke she had her arms round fontan holding him very tightly he would never do it again would he now she loved him too much still it was even nice to be beaten by him from that night their life entirely changed for a yes or a no fontan struck her she getting used to it submitted occasionally she cried out or menaced him but he forced her against the wall and talked of strangling her and that made her yield more frequently she fell on to a chair and sobbed for five minutes then she forgot all about it becoming very gay and singing and laughing and skipping about the room the worst was that fontan now disappeared all day and never came home before midnight he frequented the cafes where he was likely to meet his friends nana tremblingly and caressingly submitted to everything not daring to utter a reproach for fear of never seeing him again but some days when she had neither madame maloire nor her aunt with little louis to help her pass away the time she felt very wretched indeed therefore one sunday when she had gone to the rochefoucauld market to purchase some pigeons she was delighted to come across satin who was buying a bunch of radishes ever since the evening when the prince had partaken of fontan's champagne they had lost sight of each other what it's you you live in this neighbourhood asked satin amazed at seeing her out of doors in her slippers at that time of day ah my poor girl you must be down in your luck nana frowned at her to make her leave off because there were some other women there women in dressing-gowns and who did not appear to have any underclothes on whose hair was all dishevelled and whose faces were smothered with powder every morning all the loose women of the neighbourhood having scarcely got rid of the men picked up the night before came to make their purchases dragging their old shoes over the pavement their eyes heavy with want of sleep and in the bad temper caused by the fatigue of a night of dissipation down every street leading to the market they could be seen coming all looking very pale some quite young girls most seductive in appearance others regular old hags both fat and flabby not minding in the least to be seen thus outside their business hours whilst the passers-by might turn to look at them without even one of them deigning to smile for they were all in too much of a hurry for that and went about their errands with the disdainful airs of thrifty women who have no dealings with men whatever just as satin was paying for her bunch of radishes a young man some clerk who was late called to her as he passed good morning darling she at once drew herself up with the dignity of an offended queen saying what's the matter with that pig there then she thought she knew him three days before as she was returning from the boulevards about midnight she had spoken to him for about half an hour at the corner of the rue la bruyere before he would make up his mind but the recollection only annoyed her the more what fools men are to call out such things in the daytime she resumed when one goes out on one's private business one ought to be respected nana had at length selected her pigeons though she had doubts as to their freshness then satin wanted to show her where she lived it was close by in the rue rochefoucauld and as soon as they were alone together nana related the story of her love for fontan when she reached her door the little one stood with her radishes under her arm interested by the final particulars given by the other who was lying in her turn saying that she had sent count mifa out of her place with a kick behind oh that was grand very grand observed satin a kick behind oh splendid and he didn't dare say a word did he men are such cowards i should have liked to have been there to have seen his mug my dear you were right drat their money ay when i've a fancy i'd die for it well you'll come and see me won't you the door on the left 
knock three times, for there are always a lot of people who come to bother me. After that day, whenever Nana felt dull, she went to see Satin. She was always certain of finding her in, for the little one never went out before six in the evening. Satin had two rooms which a chemist had furnished for her so that she should be safe from the police. But in less than thirteen months she had broken the furniture, destroyed the seats of the chairs, soiled the curtains, and got everything into such a state of dirt and disorder that the rooms looked as though they were occupied by a troop of mad tabbies. The mornings when she herself, quite disgusted, started cleaning, legs of chairs and shreds of curtains remained in her hands, so hard was the battle she had to fight with the filth. On those days everything looked dirtier still, and it was impossible to enter the rooms, for all manner of things were piled up in the doorways. At length she ended by neglecting her home altogether. In the lamplight the wardrobe with its mirror, the clock, and what remained of the curtains looked sufficiently well to satisfy the men who came to see her. Besides, for six months past, her landlord had been threatening to turn her out, so why should she trouble herself by looking after the place? And for him, perhaps, not if she knew it. And whenever she got up in a bad temper, she shouted out, Gee up, gee up, giving formidable kicks on the sides of the wardrobe and the chest of drawers, which were cracking all over. Nana nearly always found her in bed. Even the days when Satin went out on her errands, she was always so tired on her return that she would fall asleep again on the edge of the bed. During the daytime she merely dragged herself about, dozing on the chairs and never rousing from this state of languor till the evening when the gas lamps were lit. And Nana always felt very comfortable there, sitting doing nothing in the midst of the untidy bed, of the basins full of dirty water placed on the floor and of the muddy skirts cast off the night before, soiling the chairs on which they had been carelessly thrown. She would cackle and talk of her private affairs without ceasing, whilst Satin, in her shift and sprawling on the bed with her feet in the air, listened to her and smoked cigarettes. Sometimes, on the afternoons when they had troubles which they wanted to forget, as they said, they treated each other to absinthe. Then, without going downstairs or even putting on a petticoat, Satin would call over the balusters for what she wanted to the concierge's little girl, a youngster of ten, who looked at the lady's naked legs when she brought up the absinthe in a glass. All the conversation of the two women had reference to men's abominable ways. Nana was quite unendurable with her fontan. She could not utter ten words without alluding to something he had said or done. But Satin good-naturedly listened to these eternal stories of watchings at the window, of quarrels about a burned stew, and of reconciliations in bed after hours of sulking. Through a hankering always to talk about him, Nana ended by recounting all the blows that he gave her. Only the previous week he had blackened her eye, and the evening before, not being able to find his slippers, he had given her a blow which had sent her reeling against the night-table. And the other expressed no surprise, quietly puffing her cigarette, and only interrupting Nana to say that for her part she always ducked, with the result of sending the gentleman and his blow to the other end of the room. They both became deeply interested in these stories of beatings, feeling happy and diverted by the constant repetition of the same stupid incidents, and yielding over again to the warm and sluggish lassitude occasioned by the infamous thrashings of which they spoke. It was the enjoyment of discussing Fontan's blows, of always talking about him, even to describing his way of taking off his boots that brought Nana there every day, the more especially as Satin invariably sympathized with her. She told in return of things that happened to her which were even worse, of a pastry cook who would leave her on the ground for dead, and whom all the same she loved more than ever. Then came the days when Nana cried, and declared that she could not put up with it any longer. Satin accompanied her to her door, and waited an hour in the street to see if Fontan didn't murder her, and on the morrow, the two women enjoyed the afternoon discussing the reconciliation, preferring, however, though without saying so, the days when there was a good row on, because that impassioned them the more. They became inseparable. Yet Satin never went to Nana's, Fontan having declared that he would not have any strumpets in his place. They would walk out together, and it was thus that one day Satin took her to call on a woman who turned out to be the Madame Robert whom Nana often thought about, with a certain respect ever since she had declined to come to her supper. Madame Robert lived in the Rue Mounier, one of the new and quiet streets near the Place de l'Europe, not containing a single shop, and the handsome houses of which, with their tiny suites of apartments, are entirely occupied by ladies. It was five o'clock. 
down the silent thoroughfare amidst the aristocratic quietude of the tall white houses the brooms of stock jobbers and merchants awaited whilst men hurried along the foot pavements raising their eyes to the windows where women in dressing gowns seemed to be watching for them nana at first would not go upstairs saying stiffly that she was not acquainted with the lady but sat and insisted one could always take a friend with one she was merely paying a visit of politeness madame robert whom she had met the day before in a restaurant had behaved very nicely to her and had made her promise to come and see her so nana at length gave in upstairs a little servant half asleep said that her mistress was out however she ushered them into the drawing-room and left them there by jove how handsome murmured satin it was furnished in the severe style of the middle classes and the hangings were of sombre hue whilst the whole had appearance of gentility usually to be seen in the surroundings of the parisian shopkeeper who has retired on a fortune nana drawing her own conclusions from all this began to make a few broad remarks but satin got angry and answered for madame robert's virtue she was always to be met in company with grave elderly gentlemen with whom she walked arm in arm just now she had a retired chocolate manufacturer who was of a most serious turn of mind he was so delighted with the genteel appearance of the establishment that whenever he visited there he always made the servant announce him and addressed madame robert as his child but look that's she said satin pointing to a photograph placed in front of the clock nana studied the portrait for a minute it represented a very dark woman with a long face and lips smiling discreetly one would at once have said a lady of fashion but more reserved it's funny murmured she at length i've certainly seen that face somewhere where i no longer recollect but it could not have been in a respectable place oh no it was decidedly not in a respectable place and she added turning towards her friend so she made you promise to come and see her what does she want with you what does she want with me why to have a chat no doubt to be a little while together it's mere politeness nana looked at satin straight in the eyes then she slightly smacked her tongue well it didn't matter to her however as the lady was a long time in coming she declared that she would not wait any further and they both went away on the morrow Fontan having told nana that he would not be home to dinner she started off early to find satin in order to treat her to a feast at a restaurant the selection of the restaurant was a weighty affair satin suggested various places all of which nana thought abominable at last she induced her to try lars it was an ordinary in the rue des martyrs where the charge for dinner was three francs a head tired of waiting until the time when it began and not knowing how to occupy themselves in the street they went to laws fully twenty minutes too soon the three rooms were still empty they seated themselves at a table in the room where la pied fer sat throned behind a high counter la was a person about fifty years old of a most massive figure which was kept in shape by the aid of tightly laced stays and waistbands a number of women quickly began to arrive and standing on tiptoe and leaning over the piles of little salvers filled with lumps of sugar they kissed laure on the mouth with tender familiarity whilst the fat monster with moist eyes tried to divide her attention so as not to occasion any jealousies the maid who waited on the guests unlike her mistress was tall and scraggy with an emaciated look about her and black eyelids beneath which her eyes were lighted up with a sombre fire the three rooms rapidly filled there were about a hundred customers disseminated according to the hazard of the tables most of them about forty years old enormous in size overloaded with flesh and with faces bloated by vice and mingling with this assemblage of turgid breasts and stomachs were a few slim pretty girls looking still ingenuous in spite of their brazen gestures beginners picked up at low dancing establishments and brought by some of the customers to laws where the multitude of big flabby women thrown quite into a flutter by the sight of their youth jostled one another and formed a court around them like a crowd of anxious old boys while treating them to all sorts of dainties as for the men they were few in number ten or fifteen at the most and they all looked very humble amidst the overwhelming shoal of skirts with the exception of four fellows who had merely come to see the show and who joked about it very much at their ease it's very good there's too isn't it asked satin nana nodded her head with an air of satisfaction it was a solid dinner such as used to be given in country hotels vol au vent 
stewed fowl and rice, haricot beans with gravy and iced vanilla cream. The ladies went in especially for the stewed fowl and rice, almost bursting in their stays and slowly wiping their lips. At first Nana was afraid of meeting some of her old acquaintances who might have asked her stupid questions. But she grew more easy as she noticed no one she knew amongst that very mixed crowd, in which faded dresses and weather-beaten bonnets were to be seen side by side with the most elegant costumes in the fraternity of the same corruption. For a minute she was interested in a young man with short curly hair and an impudent-looking face, who kept a whole table of women bursting with fat and bent on satisfying his every whim in a breathless state of anxiety. But on the young man laughing, his breast rose. "'Why, it's a woman!' Nana exclaimed with a smothered cry. Satin, who was stuffing herself with fowl, raised her head and then whispered, "'Ah, yes, I know her. She's quite the go. They're all after her.' nana pouted with disgust she couldn't understand that yet she said in her reasonable sort of way that it was no use arguing about tastes and colours for one never knew what one might like some day and she ate her ice cream with a philosophical air perfectly aware of the sensation satin was causing among the neighbouring tables with her big blue virgin-like eyes she more especially noticed a large fair-haired person seated near her who was making herself most amiable she gave such glances and edged up so close that Nana was on the point of interfering. But just at that moment a woman entered the room who caused her a great surprise. She had recognized Madame Robert. The latter, with her pretty look of a little brown mouse, nodded familiarly to the tall, scraggy maid, and then went and leaned against Laura's counter, and they both kissed each other a long time. Nana thought this caress rather peculiar on the part of so ladylike a woman, the more especially as madame robert no longer had her modest look but the contrary she glanced about the room as she conversed in a low tone of voice la had just sat down again once more throning herself with the majesty of an old idol of vice with face worn and polished by the kisses of the faithful and from above the plates of viands she reigned over her collection of big bloated women bulkier than even the most enormous of them and enjoying the fortune that had rewarded forty years of labour madame robert however had caught sight of satin so leaving law she hastened to her and was most amiable saying she regretted extremely having been out on the previous day and as satin quite charmed insisted on making room for her at the table she declared that she had dined she had merely come to look about as she talked standing up behind her new friend she leant on her shoulders and in a smiling wheedling way kept saying when shall i see you do you happen to be free nana unfortunately was unable to hear more the conversation annoyed her and she was burning to give that respectable woman a bit of her mind but the sight of a troop of people just arrived paralyzed her it consisted of some very stylish women in gorgeous dresses and diamonds displaying their hundreds of francs worth of precious stones on their persons and seized with an inclination to visit the old haunt they had come in a party to laure's whom they treated most familiarly to dine there at three francs a head amidst the jealous astonishment of the other poor mud bedabbled women when they entered with loud voices and clear ringing laughter bringing as it were a ray of sunshine from the outside nana quickly turned her head greatly annoyed at seeing lucy stewart and maria blonde amongst them for close upon five minutes during the whole time these ladies were conversing with law before passing into the next room she kept her face bent down pretending to be very busy in rolling some bread-crumbs over the cloth then when she was at length able to turn round she was aghast at seeing that the chair next to her was empty satin had disappeared whatever has become of her she unconsciously exclaimed aloud the big fair-haired woman who had been so attentive to satin laughed ill-humouredly and as nana irritated by the laugh gave her a menacing look she said softly in a drawling tone of voice it's certainly not i who've run away with her it's the other one and nana understanding that she would only get laughed at held her tongue she even remained seated a short time longer not wishing to show her annoyance from the other room she could hear the voice of lucy stewart who was standing treat to a whole table of girls who had come from the dancing places of montmartre and la chapelle it was very warm the maid was removing piles of dirty plates smelling strongly of the stewed fowl and rice 
whilst the four gentlemen had ended by standing some strong wine to several different parties of women in hope of making them drunk and of hearing something smutty what exasperated nana was having to pay for satin's dinner she was a nice hussy to allow herself to be well stuffed and then to go off with the first who asked her without even saying thank you it was it is true only three francs but she thought it hard all the same it was such a dirty trick to play she paid however banging her six francs down before law whom she despised then more than the mud in the gutter in the rue des martyrs nana's rancor increased she certainly wouldn't go and run after satin she wouldn't go near such a vile creature but all the same her evening was spoilt and she returned slowly towards montmartre feeling frightfully enraged with madame robert that one certainly had a famous cheek to pretend she was a respectable woman she was respectable enough for a dustbin now she recollected perfectly of having seen her at the butterfly a foul dancing place in the rue des poissonniers where she used to sell herself for thirty sous and she got hold of government officials by her modest ways and she refused suppers to which she had been honoured by an invitation just to pretend that she was a virtuous person ah she should have some virtue given her it was always such prudes as she who got hold of the most shocking diseases in ignoble holes that no one else knew of however nana while thinking of all these things had at length arrived home in the rue veron she was amazed to see a light in the windows Fontan, having been left directly after dinner by the friend who had invited him had come home in a very bad humour he listened in a cold way to the explanation she hastened to give in her fear of being knocked about and her bewilderment at seeing him there when she had not expected him before one in the morning she lied for though she admitted spending six francs she said she had been with madame Malois. he remained wrapped in his dignity and handed her a letter which he had coolly opened although addressed to her it was a letter from georges who was still kept at les fondettes and who gave vent to his feelings every week in several pages of the most impassioned language nana was delighted when any one wrote to her especially letters full of vows of love she read them to every one fontan was acquainted with georges style and appreciated it but that night she so feared a row that she affected the greatest indifference she glanced through the letter in a sulky sort of way and then threw it on one side Fontan was beating the tattoo on a window pane, not wanting to go to bed so early, and not knowing what to do to while away the evening. Suddenly he turned round. Suppose we write an answer to the youngster at once, said he. It was usually he who wrote. He had a much finer style. And then he was pleased when Nana, full of admiration for his letter, which he would read out loud, would kiss him and exclaim that only he could find such pretty things to say and all that ended by exciting them and they adored each other as you like she replied i will make some tea we can go to bed afterwards then fontan made himself comfortable at the table with a great display of pen ink and paper he rounded his arms and thrust out his chin my heart he began reading out loud End of chapter eight part one Chapter Eight, Part Two of Nana by Emile Zola, translated by Burton Rasco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight, Part Two. And he worked away for more than an hour, reflecting occasionally about a sentence, his head buried in his hands, and laughing to himself whenever he thought of some expression exceptionally tender. Nana had already taken two cups of tea in silence at length he read the letter as they read on the stage just making a few gestures he wrote on five sides of paper about the delicious hours passed at la mignotte the memory of which would remain like subtle perfumes he swore an eternal fidelity to that springtide of love and ended in declaring that his sole desire was to recommence that happiness if happiness can recommence again you know he explained i say all that out of politeness as it's only for fun well i think it'll do he was delighted with himself but nana still dreading a row was foolish enough not to throw her arms round his neck and utter words of admiration she thought the letter would do very well but that was all then he was very much put out if his letter did not please her she could write another one and instead of embracing each other as they usually did after a great many protestations of love they remained very cold on either side of the table 
she had however poured him out a cup of tea what muck he cried as he wetted his lips with it you have been putting salt into it nana unhappily shrugged her shoulders he became furious ah uh, everything's going wrong this evening and the quarrel started from that it was only ten by the clock so it was a way of killing time he worked himself up he flung all sorts of accusations at her full of insults without giving her time to answer them she was dirty she was idiotic she had led a fine life then he raved about the money was he in the habit of spending six francs when he dined out he had his dinners paid for otherwise he would have taken pot luck at home and all for that old procurus maloir too an old hag whom he would pitch downstairs if she dared show herself there again ah well they would go far if every day they chucked six francs into the street in that style first of all cried he i must have your accounts come give me the money let me see how we stand now all his miserly instincts were awakened nana subdued and terrified hastened to fetch the money that was left from the drawer and laid it out before him until then the key had been left in the lock and they had each taken what they needed what said he after counting there are scarcely seven thousand francs remaining out of seventeen thousand and we have only been living together for three months it isn't possible he rushed from his seat and turned out the drawer by the light of the lamp but there were really only six thousand eight hundred and a few odd francs then the row became a regular storm ten thousand francs in three months he bellowed damnation what have you done with them eh answer me it all goes to your old hag of an aunt eh or else you've been treating yourself that's very clear answer me at once ah you get in a passion instantly said nana it's very easy to make up the account you forget all the furniture then i was obliged to buy a lot of linen money soon goes when there is everything to buy but though he demanded explanations he would not listen to them yes it goes a great deal too quickly resumed he in a calmer tone of voice and look here young woman i've had enough of this share and share like business these seven thousand francs you know are mine well now i've got them i intend to stick to them as you're so wasteful as all that i'll take care i'm not ruined one has a right to one's own and he magisterially put the money in his pocket whilst nana looked at him in amazement then he complacently continued you understand i'm not such a fool as to keep aunts and children who are not mine it pleased you to spend your money and that was your business but mine is sacred when you cook a leg of mutton i'll pay half every night we'll settle up on hearing this nana revolted she could not restrain a cry i say that's disgusting you had your share of my ten thousand francs but he did not waste more time in discussion leaning across the table he gave her a slap in the face with all his might exclaiming say that again she did so in spite of the slap and then he fell upon her with kicks and blows he soon put her into such a state that she ended as usual by undressing herself and going sobbing to bed he puffed and blowed and was about to get into bed when he noticed the letter he had written for georges lying on the table then he folded it up with care and turning towards the bed said menacingly the letter will do very well i will post it myself because i don't intend to put up with any caprices and don't whine for it annoys me nana who was weeping bitterly held her breath when he got into bed she felt as though choking and throwing herself on his breast sobbed aloud their battles always ended thus she trembled at the thought of losing him she felt a mean want of knowing he was all her own in spite of everything he twice pushed her away with a haughty gesture but the warm embrace of the supplicating woman with her large tearful eyes resembling those of some faithful animal kindled a flame of desire within him and he acted the good prince without however stooping to make any advances he let himself be caressed and so to say taken by force in the style of a man whose forgiveness is worth winning then he was seized with anxiety he feared that nana had only been acting a little comedy to get possession of the cash again he had blown out the candle when he thought it necessary to assert once more his authority you know my girl i meant what i said 
I intend to keep the money. Nana, who was going to sleep with her arms round his neck, said sublimely, Yes, never fear. I will work. But from that evening their life together became worse than ever. From one end of the week to the other the sound of slaps could be heard, just like the tick-tick of a pendulum which seemed to regulate their existence. Nana, through being beaten so frequently, became as supple as fine linen, and it made her skin so delicate and so soft to the touch, her complexion so pink and white, so clear to the eye, that she was more beautiful than ever. And that was why Prullière was forever dangling about her skirts, calling when he knew Fontan would not be there, and pushing her up into corners and trying to kiss her, but she, at once becoming highly indignant, struggled and blushed with shame. She thought it disgusting of him to wish to deceive his friend. Then Prullière sneered with vexation. Really, she was becoming precious stupid. How could she stick to such a monkey? For Fontan was indeed a monkey, with his big nose forever on the move. A disgusting pig and a fellow, too, who was always knocking her about. That may be, but I love him as he is, she replied one day, in the cool way of a woman owning to some most revolting taste. Busk contented himself with dining there as often as possible. He shrugged his shoulders behind Prullière, a handsome fellow but not serious. He had often assisted at rows in the house. During dessert, when Fontan slapped Nana, he would continue chewing in a matter-of-fact way, thinking it the most natural thing in the world. By the way of paying for his dinners, he always pretended to be in raptures at the sight of their happiness. He proclaimed himself a philosopher. He had renounced everything, even glory. Prullière and Fontan, leaning back in their chairs, would sometimes forget themselves after the table had been cleared, and fall to relating their successes up to two o'clock in the morning with their stage voices and gestures, whilst he, wrapped in thought and only occasionally giving a little sniff of disdain, would silently finish the bottle of brandy. What was left of Talma? Nothing. Then they had better shut up and not make such fools of themselves. One night he found Nana in tears. She removed her bodice and showed him her back and arms covered with bruises. He looked at the skin without being tempted to take advantage of the situation as that fool Prullière would have been. Then he sententiously observed, My child, wherever there are women, there are slaps. It was Napoleon who said that, I think. Bathe yourself with salt water. Salt water is excellent for such trifles. Take my word for it, you will receive a great many more, and do not complain so long as there is nothing broken. You know I shall invite myself to dinner. I noticed a leg of mutton. But Madame Lerat was not gifted with similar philosophy. Each time Nana showed her a fresh bruise on her white skin, she complained loudly. Her niece was being murdered. It could not last. The truth was, Fontan had turned Madame Lerat out and said that he would not have her in the place again. And ever since that day, if she happened to be there when he returned home, she was obliged to take her departure by way of the kitchen, which humiliated her immensely. And so she never ceased abusing that unmannerly person. With the airs of a most well-bred woman to whom no one could teach anything pertaining to a polite education, she reproached him with having been shockingly badly brought up. Oh, one can see that at a glance, she would say to Nana. He has no idea of even the slightest propriety. His mother must have been a very low woman. Don't deny it, he shows it only too plainly. I do not say it on my own account, although a person of my age has a right to a certain respect. But you, really now, how do you manage to put up with his bad manners? for without flattering myself, I always taught you how to behave yourself, and in your own home you received the very best advice. We were all very respectable in our family, were we not? Nana did not protest. She listened with her head bowed down. Then, continued the aunt, you have only been acquainted with well-to-do people. We were just talking about it last night at home with Zoe. She can't understand either why you put up with all this. How, said she, can madame, who could do just as she pleased with the count, for between ourselves you appear to have treated him as though he were a donkey, how can madame allow herself to be massacred by that ugly clown? I added that slaps might even be born, but that I would never have submitted to such a want of respect. In short, he has nothing whatever in his favor. 
i wouldn't have his portrait in my room on any account and you are ruining yourself for such a sorry bird as he is yes you are ruining yourself my darling you are going about in want of everything when there are so many others and far richer ones too and gentlemen connected with the government but that's enough it's not i who ought to tell you all this however were i in your place the very next time he treated me ill i'd leave him to himself with a sir whom do you take me for said in your grand style you know which would show him you were not going to be made a fool of any longer then nana burst into tears and sobbed oh aunt i love him the truth was madame lerat was feeling very anxious seeing that it was only with the greatest difficulty that her niece managed to give her a twenty sous piece at distant intervals to pay for little louis's board of course she would do her utmost she would keep the child all the same and wait for better times but the idea that it was fontan who was the cause why she the child and its mother were not rolling in wealth enraged her to such a pitch that she denied the existence of love accordingly she concluded with these harsh words listen one day when he has skinned you alive you will come and knock at my door and i will let you in the want of funds soon became nana's great care the seven thousand francs fontan had taken had quite disappeared no doubt he had put them in some safe place and she did not dare question him for she was very timid with that sorry bird as madame lerat styled him she trembled lest he should think her capable of sticking to him for the sake of his money he had promised to give something towards the housekeeping expenses and he started by giving three francs every morning but he expected all sorts of things for his money he wanted everything from his three francs butter meat early fruit and vegetables and if she hazarded an observation if she insinuated that it was impossible to purchase all in the market for three twenty sous pieces he fumed he called her a good-for-nothing an extravagant hussy a stupid fool whom the market people robbed and invariably wound up by threatening to get his meals elsewhere then after the expiration of a month on some mornings he would forget to leave the three francs on the top of the chest of drawers she ventured to ask him for them timidly in a roundabout way but this had occasioned such quarrels he made her life so miserable on the first pretext he could get hold of that she preferred no longer to count on him whenever he had not left the money and found all the same a good dinner ready for him he was as gay as a lark and most amiable embracing nana and waltzing about the room with the chairs and this made her so happy that she reached the point of wishing not to find anything on the drawers in spite of the difficulty she had in making both ends meet one morning even she returned him his three francs telling him a long rigmarole about having some money left from the previous day as he had given nothing for two days he hesitated for a moment fearing a lesson but she looked at him with her eyes overflowing with love she embraced him with a complete abandonment of her whole person and he put the money back into his pocket with the slight convulsive trepidation of a miser recovering an amount that had been in danger from that day he ceased to trouble himself never asking where the money came from looking very black when there were only potatoes and laughing fit to dislocate his jaws on beholding a turkey or a leg of mutton without prejudice however to sundry cuffs with which he favoured nana even in his happiest moments just to keep his hand in training nana had therefore found means of supplying everything on certain days the house was glutted with food busk feasted there so sumptuously twice a week that he suffered from indigestion one evening as madame lerat was leaving angry at seeing before the fire an abundant dinner of which she was not to partake she could not resist bluntly asking who it was who paid for it nana taken by surprise no longer knew what she was about and began to cry well it's a nice state of things said the aunt who understood nana had resigned herself for the sake of peace and quietness in her home it was partly too the fault of old tricon whom she had met in the rue de laval one day when fontan had gone off in a fury because there had been nothing but salt cod for dinner so she had said yes to old tricon who happened to be in a difficulty after that as fontan never came home before six in the evening she was able to dispose of her afternoons and often brought back as much as forty or sixty francs and sometimes more she might have made as much as ten and fifteen louis had she been entirely free but still she was very glad to get enough to keep things going 
at night-time she forgot all when busk was almost bursting with food and fontan with his elbows on the table let her kiss his eyes with the self-satisfied air of a man who is loved for himself alone then whilst adoring her darling her dear love with a passion all the more blinding as it was she who now paid for all nana reverted again to the depravity of her early days she walked the streets as she did when a young girl in quest of a five francs piece one sunday at the rochefoucauld market she made it up with satin after flying at her and bullying her on account of madame robert but satin merely replied that when one did not like a thing one had no right to seek to disgust others with it and nana who was by no means narrow-minded yielded to the philosophical idea that one never knows how one may end and forgave her and her curiosity being awakened she even questioned her in regard to some details of vice amazed at learning something fresh at her age after all she knew she laughed and thought it very funny yet feeling all the time a slight repugnance for at heart she was rather conservative in her habits she often went to laws when fontan dined out she was amused with the stories she heard there with the loves and the jealousies which had so much interest for the other customers though they never caused them to lose a mouthful however she was never mixed up with them as she said stout law with her maternal affection often invited her to spend a few days at her villa at asnières a country house where there were rooms for seven ladies she declined she was afraid but satin having declared to her that she was mistaken that gentlemen from paris would swing them and play at different games in the garden with them she promised to come later on as soon as she was able to get away at that time nana was very worried and was not much inclined for a spree she was greatly in want of money when old tricon had nothing for her and that occurred only too often she did not know whom to go to then she would wander about with satin all over paris amidst that degrading vice which prowls along the muddy by-streets beneath the dim glimmer of the gas-lamps nana returned to the low dancing places of the barriers where she had first learned to hop about with her dirty skirts she once more beheld the dark corners of the outer boulevards the posts against which men used to kiss her when she was only fifteen years old whilst her father was seeking her to give her a hiding they both hastened along visiting all the balls and the cafes of a locality crawling upstairs wet with saliva and spilt beer or else they walked slowly following street after street and standing up every now and then in the doorways satin who had first appeared in the quartier latin took nana there to bullier's and to the cafes of the boulevard st michel but it was vacation time and the quarter was almost deserted so they returned to the principal boulevards it was there that they met with most luck from the heights of montmartre to the plateau where the observatory was situated they thus rambled about the entire city rainy nights when their shoes would become trodden down at heel warm nights which made their clothes adhere to their skin long waits and endless wanderings jostlings and quarrels brutal abuse from a passer-by enticed into some obscure lodging down the dirty stairs of which he retired swearing the summer was drawing to a close a stormy summer with sultry nights they would start off together after dinner about nine o'clock along the pavements of the rue notre dame de lorette two lines of women keeping close to the shops holding up their skirts their noses pointing to the ground might be seen hastening towards the boulevards without bestowing a glance on the displays in the windows and looking as though they had some most important business on hand it was the famished onslaught of the breda quarter which commenced with the first glimmer of the gaslight nana and satin passed close to the church and always went along the rue le pelletier then at a hundred yards from the cafe riche having reached the exercising ground they would let fall the trains of their dresses which until that moment they had carefully held in their hands and after then regardless of the dust sweeping the pavement and swinging their bodies they would walk slowly along moving slower still whenever they came into the flood of light of some large cafe holding their heads high laughing loudly and looking back after the men who turned to glance at them they were in their element their whitened faces spotted with the red of their lips and the black of their eyelashes assumed in the shadow the disturbing charm of some imitation eastern bazaar held in the open street until twelve o'clock in spite of the jostling of the crowd they promenaded gaily along merely muttering stupid fool now and again behind the backs of the awkward fellows whose heels caught in their flounces they exchanged familiar nods with the cafe waiters 
lingered sometimes to talk at the tables accepting drinks which they swallowed slowly like persons happy at having the chance to sit down while waiting till the people came out of the theatres but as the night advanced if they had not made one or two trips to the rue la rochefoucauld their pursuit became more eager they no longer picked and chose beneath the trees of the now gloomy and almost deserted boulevards ferocious bargains were made and occasionally the sound of oaths and blows would be heard whilst fathers of families with their wives and daughters used to such encounters would pass sedately by without hastening their footsteps then after having made the tour ten times from the opera to the gymnase theatre finding that the men avoided them and hurried along all the faster in the increasing obscurity nana and satin would adjourn to the rue du faubourg montmartre there up till two o'clock in the morning the lights of the restaurants of the beer saloons and of the pork butchers blazed away whilst quite a swarm of women hung about the doors of the cafes it was the last bright and animated corner of nocturnal paris the last open market for the contracts of a night where business was overtly transacted among the various groups from one end of the street to the other the same as in the spacious hall of some public building and on the nights when they returned home unsuccessful they wrangled with each other the rue notre dame de lorette appeared dark and deserted with only the occasional shadow of some woman dragging herself along it was the tardy return of the poor girls of the neighbourhood exasperated by an evening of forced idleness and pertinaciously striving for better luck as they argued in a hoarse voice with some drunkard who had lost his way and whom they detained at the corner of the rue breda or the rue fontaine however they occasionally had some very good windfalls louis given them by well-dressed gentlemen who put their decorations in their pockets as they accompanied them satin especially scented them from afar on wet nights when dank paris emitted the unsavoury smell of a vast alcove seldom cleansed she knew that the dampness of the atmosphere the fetidness of the low haunts excited the men and she watched for those that were the best off she could see it in their pale eyes it was like a stroke of carnal madness passing over the city it is true that she was at times rather frightened for she knew that the most gentlemanly-looking men were generally the most filthy-minded all the polish vanished and the brute appeared beneath exacting in his monstrous taste and refined in his perversion so satin therefore had no respect for the great people in their carriages but would say that their coachmen were far nicer for they treated women as they should be treated and did not half kill them with ideas worthy of hell this fall of well-to-do people into the crapulence of vice still astonished nana who had reserved certain prejudices of which satin relieved her when seriously discussing the subject she would ask was there then no virtue from the highest to the lowest all seemed to grovel in vice well there were some pretty doings in paris from nine in the evening till three in the morning and then she would laugh aloud and exclaim that if one were only able to look into all the rooms one would witness some very queer things the lower classes going in for a regular treat and here and there not a few of the upper classes poking their noses even more than the others into the beastly goings-on she was completing her education one night on calling for satin she recognized the marquis de choix coming down the stairs leaning heavily on the balustrade his legs yielding beneath him and his face ghastly pale she took out her handkerchief and pretended to blow her nose then when she found satin surrounded by the accustomed filth the room not having been touched for more than a week past basins and other utensils lying about on all sides the bed in a most dirty condition she expressed her astonishment that her friend should know the marquis ah yes she knew him in fact he had been an awful nuisance when she and her pastry-cook were living together now he came from time to time but he pestered her immensely he sniffed about in every dirty place he could find even in her slippers yes my dear in my slippers oh he's a filthy beast he's always wanting things what most troubled nana was the sincerity of these low debaucheries she recalled to mind her comedies of pleasure during the days of her fast life whilst she saw the girls about her losing their health at it day by day then satin frightened her terribly with the police she was full of stories about them once she used to keep up an acquaintance with one of the inspectors of public morals so as to ensure being left alone on two occasions he had prevented her name from being entered in their books and now she trembled for she knew what to expect if they caught her a third time it was shocking to hear her 
the police arrested as many women as they possibly could in order to get bribes they seized all they came across and silenced you with a slap in the mouth if you cried out for they were certain of being upheld and rewarded even though there happened to be a respectable girl among the number in the summer they would start off twelve or fifteen together and make a round-up on the boulevards surrounding one of the footpaths and securing as many as thirty women in an evening satin however knew their favourite spots as soon as ever she caught a glimpse of a policeman away she bolted amidst the wild flight of the long trains through the crowd there was a dread of the law a terror of the prefecture of police so great that many remained as though paralyzed at the doors of the cafes in spite of the advancing policemen who swept the road before them but satin most dreaded being informed against her pastry-cook had been mean enough to threaten to denounce her when he left her yes some men lived on their mistresses by those means without counting the dirty woman who would betray you through jealousy if you were better looking than they nana listened to all these stories which greatly increased her fears she had always trembled at the name of the law that unknown power that vengeance of men which could suppress her without any one in the world defending her the prison of st lazare appeared to her like a tomb an enormous black hole in which women were buried alive after having had their hair cut off she would say to herself that she had only to give up fontan to find no end of protectors and satin might tell her hundreds of times of certain lists of women accompanied by their photographs that the policeman had to consult and be careful never to interfere with the originals she was nevertheless dreadfully frightened she was always seeing herself jostled and dragged off to be inspected on the morrow and the idea of the inspection filled her with agony and shame she who had so often thrown her chemise over the housetops it so happened that one night towards the end of september as she was walking with satin along the boulevard poissonniere the latter suddenly started off at full gallop and as she asked her why she did so the police panted her friend hurry up hurry up there was a headlong rush through the crowd skirts were torn in their flight there were blows and cries a woman fell to the ground the mob laughingly looked on at the brutal onslaught of the police who rapidly contracted their circle nana however had soon lost sight of satin she felt her legs failing her she was on the point of being caught when a man taking her arm in his led her off in the face of the infuriated policeman it was prulière who had just at that moment recognized her without speaking he turned with her down the rue rougemont which was almost deserted where she was able to take breath but she felt so faint that he had to support her she did not even thank him well said he at length you had better come round to my place and rest yourself a bit he lived close by in the rue bergere but she pulled herself together at once no i won't but every one does he roughly resumed why won't you because to her mind that said everything she loved fontan too much to deceive him with a friend the others did not count as it was from necessity and not pleasure that she listened to them in the face of such stupid obstinacy prulière behaved with the meanness of a handsome man wounded in his pride well please yourself said he only i'm not going your way my dear get out of the mess by yourself and he walked off all her fright came back again she returned to montmartre by a most roundabout way keeping close to the shops and turning pale every time a man came near her it was on the morrow that nana still feeling the shock of her terrors of the night before suddenly found herself face to face with la bordette in a quiet little street at batignolles as she was on her way to her aunt's at first they both seemed rather uneasy he though always most obliging had some business which he kept to himself however he was the first to regain his composure and express his pleasure at the meeting really every one was still amazed at nana's total eclipse she was inquired after everywhere her old friends were all pining away and becoming paternal he preached her a little sermon now frankly my dear between ourselves you are making a fool of yourself one can understand a bit of infatuation but not being reduced to the point you are to be eaten up to that extent and then only to pocket kicks and blows are you going in for the prize of virtue she listened to him in an embarrassed manner but when he spoke to her of rose who was triumphing with her conquest of count Mufa, her eyes sparkled she murmured oh if i choose he at once offered his mediation in his obliging way but she refused then he attacked her on another subject 
he told her that bordenave was going to bring out a new piece by faucherie in which there was a capital part that would suit her splendidly what a new piece with a part that would suit me she exclaimed in amazement but he is in it and he never told me she did not name fontan besides she became calm again almost directly she would never return to the stage no doubt la bordette was not convinced for he insisted with a smile you know you have nothing to fear with me i will prepare mifa you will return to the theatre and then i will lead him to you like a lamb no said she energetically and she left him her heroism caused her to bemoan her fate a cat of a man would not have sacrificed himself like that without trumpeting it abroad yet one thing struck her la bordette had given her exactly the same advice as francis that evening when fontan returned home she questioned him about faucherie's piece he had been back at the variety theatre for two months past why had he not told her about the part what part asked he in his cross voice do you happen to mean the part of the grand lady really now do you think then yourself a genius but my girl you could no more play that part than fly upon my word you make me laugh her feelings were dreadfully hurt all night he chaffed her calling her mademoiselle mars and the more he ridiculed her the more she stood up for herself feeling a strange pleasure in that heroic defence of her whim which in her own eyes made her appear very great and very loving ever since she had been consorting with other men for the purpose of feeding him she loved him the more in spite of all the fatigue and the loathing which this existence caused her he became her vice for which she paid and which beneath the sting of the blow she could not do without he seeing her as loving and obedient as an animal ended by abusing his power she irritated his nerves he became seized with a ferocious hatred to such an extent that he lost sight altogether of his own interests whenever busk made an observation on the subject he exclaimed exasperated without any one knowing why that he did not care a curse for her or her good dinners and that he would turn her out of the place just for the sake of spending the seven thousand francs on another woman and that was indeed the end of their intimacy one night nana on coming home about eleven o'clock found the door bolted on the inside she knocked a first time no answer a second time still no answer yet she could see a light under the door and fontan was walking about inside she knocked again and again without ceasing and calling to him angrily at length fontan said in a slow thick voice go to the devil she knocked with both her fists go to the devil she knocked louder almost enough to break the panel go to the devil and for a quarter of an hour the same words answered her like a jeering echo of the blows she hammered on the door then seeing that she did not tire he suddenly opened it and standing on the threshold with his arms crossed said in the same cold brutal tone of voice damnation have you nearly done what is it you want you had better let us go to sleep you can see very well that i am not alone and true enough he was not alone nana caught a glimpse of the little woman of the boeuf theatre already in her night-dress with her curly hair that looked like tow and her eyes like gimlet holes who was enjoying the fun in the midst of the furniture that nana had paid for fontan stepped out on to the landing looking terrible and opening his big finger said be off or i'll strangle you then nana burst into nervous sobs she was frightened and ran off this time it was she who was turned out in her anger she suddenly thought of mifa and of how she had treated him but really it was not for fontan to avenge him outside her first idea was to go and sleep with satin if no one else was with her she met her outside her house she having also been chucked out but by her landlord who had put a padlock on her door against all legal right as the furniture was hers satin cursed and swore and talked of having him up before the commissary of police however as midnight was striking the first thing to do was to obtain a bed somewhere and satin thinking it best not to make the policeman acquainted with the state of her affairs ended by taking nana to a lady who kept a licensed lodging-house in the rue de laval they obtained a small back room on the first floor overlooking the courtyard i might have gone to madame robert's said satin there is always room there for me but i couldn't have taken you 
she's becoming most ridiculously jealous. The other night she beat me. When they had fastened themselves in, Nana, who up till then had not unbosomed herself, burst into tears, and related again and again the dirty trick that Fontan had played her. She listened complacently, consoled her, and became even more indignant than she, abusing the men heartily. Oh, the pigs! Oh, the pigs! You should have nothing more to do with such pigs. Then she helped Nana to undress. She hovered around her like a gentle and obliging little woman and kept saying coaxingly, Let's get into bed, quickly, my dear. We shall be much better there. Ah, how silly you are to be worried. I tell you that they're a foul set. Don't think of them any more. You know I love you very much. Now leave off crying. Do, for your little darling's sake. And in bed she at once took Nana in her arms so as to calm her. She would not hear Fontaine's name mentioned again. Each time that it came to her friend's lips she stopped it with a kiss prettily pouting with anger, her hair all loose and looking childingly beautiful and full of tenderness. Then, little by little, in this sweet embrace, Nana dried her tears. She was touched. She returned Satin's caresses. When two o'clock struck, the light was still burning. Both were laughing gently and uttering words of love. But suddenly a great noise was heard in the house. Satin, half-naked, jumped out of bed and listened. The police! said she, pale with fear. Ah, damn it, we've no luck. We're done for. She had told of the searches the policemen made in the hotels and lodging houses fully twenty times, and yet, when they went to the Rue de Laval that night, they had neither of them given the matter a thought. At the word police, Nana lost her wits entirely. She jumped out of bed and, running across the room, opened the window with the wild look of a madwoman about to jump out. But fortunately the little courtyard was covered with glass, and over this was a wire network on a level with the window. She did not hesitate, but stepping on to the sill disappeared in the darkness, her chemise blowing about her, and her bare legs exposed to the keen night air. "'Stay here!' cried Satin, terrified. "'You will kill yourself!' Then, as they were knocking at the door, she good-naturedly closed the window and threw her friend's clothes into the bottom of a cupboard. She had already resigned herself to her fate, saying to herself that, after all, if they did put her on their list, she would no more have occasion for that stupid fright. She pretended to be sound asleep, yawned, parlayed, and ended by opening the door to a big fellow with a dirty beard who said, "'Show your hands. You've no needle-marks on your fingers. You don't work. Come, dress yourself.' "'But I'm not a needle-woman. I'm a burnisher,' declared Satin boldly. But all the same she quietly dressed herself, for she knew that it was no use arguing. Cries were heard about the house. One girl held on to the door, refusing to move. Another, who was in bed with her lover and for whom he became responsible, acted the part of the grossly insulted respectable woman, and threatened to take proceedings against the prefect of police. For nearly an hour there was a noise of heavy boots on the stairs, of doors shaken by violent blows, of piercing shrieks ending in sobs, of women's skirts grazing the walls, all the abrupt awakening and the terrified departure of a flock of women, brutally collared by three policemen under the charge of a little fair-haired and very polite commissary of police. Then a great silence reigned throughout the house. No one had betrayed her. Nana was saved. She crept back into the room, shivering and almost dead with fright. Her bare feet were bleeding from the scratches caused by the wire. For a long while she remained, listening, seated on the edge of the bed. Towards morning, however, she fell asleep. But at eight o'clock, when she awoke, she quickly left the house and hastened to her aunt's. When Madame Lerat, who happened to be just taking her breakfast with Zoe, saw her at that early hour, dressed in such a slovenly way, and with a scared look about her face, she understood it at once. "'Ah, so it's happened, has it?' she exclaimed. I told you he would even want the skin of your body. Well, come in. You're always welcome here. Zoe had risen and murmured with respectful familiarity. At length, madame is restored to us. I was expecting madame. But madame Lerat wished Nana to kiss little Louis at once, because, said she, the child's happiness consisted in his mother's good sense. Little Louis was still sleeping, looking sickly through lack of blood. 
and when nana leant over his white scrofulous face all her troubles of the last few months returned to her and seemed to stick in her throat and almost strangle her oh my poor little one my poor little one she stuttered in a last outburst of sobs End of chapter eight chapter nine part one of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain nine part one they were rehearsing the little duchess at the variety theatre the first act had just been gone through and they were about to commence the second in two old armchairs placed close to the footlights fauchery and bordonave were arguing together whilst the prompter old cassard a little hunchback was seated on a rush-bottomed chair a pencil between his lips turning over the leaves of the manuscript well what are you all waiting for suddenly exclaimed bordonave thumping furiously on the boards with his heavy walking-stick barillot why don't you begin it's monsieur bosque he's disappeared replied barillot who was acting as assistant stage manager then there was quite a storm of shouts every one called bosque bourdonneuve cursed and swore damn it all it's always the same one may ring and call they're always where they oughtn't to be and then they grumble when they're kept after four o'clock busk however arrived with serene coolness hey what who wants me ah it's time for my entrance then why didn't you say so good simon give me my cue there are the guests arriving and i enter how am i to enter why through the door of course shouted fauchery losing patience yes but where is the door this time bourdonneuve attacked barillot cursing and swearing again and banging his stick on the board sufficient to split them damn it all i said a chair was to be placed there to represent the door every day i have to repeat the same thing Barrio, where's Barrio? There's another. They all bolt off. Barrio, however, bowing beneath the tempest, came and placed the chair without saying a word, and the rehearsal continued. Simone, with her bonnet on and enveloped in her fur cloak, assumed the airs of a servant arranging some furniture. She interrupted herself to say, You know I am not very warm, so I shall keep my hands in my muff. Then, changing her voice, she greeted Bosque with a faint cry and said, why it's the count you are the first sir and madame will be very pleased busk had on a muddy pair of trousers a big drab overcoat and an immense muffler rolled round his neck with his hands in his pockets and an old hat on his head he said in a hollow voice without any acting but merely dragging himself along do not disturb your mistress isabella i wish to give her a surprise the rehearsal went on bourdonneuve scowling and buried in his armchair listened with an air of fatigue fauchery nervous and constantly changing his position was seized every minute with a desire to interrupt which however he repressed but he heard whispering behind him in the dark and empty house is she there he asked leaning towards bourdonneuve the latter nodded his head before accepting the part of geraldine which he had offered her nana had wished to see the piece for she hesitated before agreeing to act the part of a gay woman what she longed for was to appear on the stage as a lady she was half hidden in the shadow of a box with la bordette who was exerting himself with bordonneuve for her fauchery glanced round at her and then gave all his attention to the rehearsal only the front of the stage was lighted up a large jet of gas issuing from a pipe erected at the junction of the footlights and the glare of which was disseminated by means of a powerful reflector looked like a great yellow eye in the semi-obscurity where it blazed with a sort of dubious sadness against the slender gas-pipe stood cassard holding up the manuscript close to the light which vividly exposed the outline of his hump then more in the shadow were fauchery and bordonneuve in the midst of the enormous structure this light which illumined the distance of a few yards only looked like the glimmer of a lantern fixed to a post at some railway station the actors appearing like so many strange phantoms with their shadows dancing before them the rest of the stage full of a kind of fine dust similar to that which hangs about houses in the course of demolition resembled a gigantic nave undergoing repair with its ladders its frameworks and its side scenes the faded paint on which imitated heaps of rubbish 
and the drop scenes suspended up aloft had an appearance of frippery hanging to the beams of some vast rag warehouse whilst a ray of sunshine which had penetrated through some window intersected the darkness above like a bar of gold at the back of the stage some of the actors were conversing together while waiting for their cues they had gradually raised their voices i say there will you keep quiet yelled bordonave who sprung from his chair in a rage i can't hear a word go outside if you want to talk we're working barrio if any one talks again i'll find the whole lot they held their tongues for a short time they formed a little group seated on a bench and some rustic chairs in a bit of a garden the first scene for the evening which was placed there ready to be fixed fontan and prulière were listening to rose mignon who had just received a splendid offer from the manager of the folie dramatique theatre but a voice called out the duchess saint firmin now then the duchess and saint firmin prulière did not recollect till the second call that he was saint firmin rose who played the part of the duchess hélène was waiting for him to make their entrance slowly dragging his feet over the vacant sonorous boards old busk returned to sit down then clarisse offered him half the bench what does he yell about like that for asked she speaking of bordenave it will be getting unbearable soon he can't bring out a new piece now without giving vent to his feelings in that way busk shrugged his shoulders he was above all those shindies fontan whispered he smells a failure i think it's a most idiotic piece then returning to rose's story he said to clarisse do you believe it eh three hundred francs a night and a hundred performances guaranteed why not a country house into the bargain if his wife was offered three hundred francs mignon would chuck up bordenave and without warning too clarisse believed in the truth of the offer fontan was always running his comrades down but simone interrupted them she was shivering all well buttoned up and with scarves round their necks looked up at the sunbeam which shone without descending into the mournful coldness that hung about the stage outside it was freezing beneath a clear november sky and there's no fire in the green room said simone it's disgusting he's becoming beastly miserly i've a good mind to go home i don't want to be ill silence there cried bordenave again in a voice of thunder then for a few minutes nothing was heard but the confused voices of the actors they scarcely indicated the gestures and spoke in a quiet voice so as not to tire themselves however when they intended to score a point they glanced at the auditorium it appeared to them like an enormous hole in which floated a vague shadow similar to a fine dust confined in a big loft without windows the house which was in darkness except for the feeble light transmitted from the stage seemed wrapped in a troubled and melancholy sleep the paintings on the ceiling were veiled in obscurity from the top to the bottom of the stage boxes on the right and left hung immense breadths of coarse grey linen to protect the hangings and strips of the same material were thrown over the velvet of the balustrades girdling the balconies with a double winding sheet staining as it were the gloom with their pale tint in the general discoloration one could only distinguish the darker recesses of the boxes which indicated the different stories and the breaks caused by the seats the red velvet of which had a blackish look the great crystal gasolier lowered almost to the ground filled the stalls with its pendants and gave one the idea of a removal of a departure of the public on a journey from which it would never return rose in her part of the little duchess lost at the house of some fast woman just then advanced towards the footlights she raised her hands and pouted adorably to that dark empty house which was as sad as though it were in mourning good heavens what curious people said she accentuating the phrase certain of the effect at the back of the box in which she was seated nana wrapped in a large shawl was listening to the piece and devouring rose with her eyes she turned to la bordette and asked him in a low voice you're sure he's coming quite sure no doubt he will come with mignon as a pretext as soon as he arrives you must go up into mathilde's dressing-room and i will bring him there to you they were talking of count muffat it was an interview on neutral ground arranged by la bordette he had had a serious talk with bordenave whom two successive failures had brought to a very low ebb 
and Baudelaire had hastened to lend his theatre and offer a part to Nana, wishing to get on good terms with the Count with the view of borrowing some money of him. "'And the part of Géraldine, what do you think of it?' resumed La Bordette. But Nana neither answered nor moved. After the first act, in which the author made the Duc de Beaurivage deceive his wife with the fair Géraldine, an operatic star, came the second act, where the Duchess Hélène went to the actresses on the night of a masked ball to learn by what magic power such creatures conquered and retained the husbands of better women. It was a cousin, the handsome Oscar de Saint-Firmin, who introduced her there, hoping to seduce her. And, to her great surprise, as a first lesson she heard Géraldine abusing the Duke in the language of a navvy, whilst the latter seemed to be delighted. This sight drew from her the cry, "'Ah, well!' if that's the way the men must be spoken to. This was about the only scene Geraldine had in the act. As for the Duchess, she was soon punished for her curiosity. An old beau, the Baron de Tardivaux, took her for one of the gay women and attacked her vigorously, whilst on the other side, Bourrivage made it up with Geraldine, who was reclining in an easy chair and kissed her. As the part of the latter was not filled up, old Cassard had risen to read it, and he accentuated certain passages in spite of himself and acted in Bosque's arms. They had reached this scene, the rehearsal dragged on tediously, when suddenly Fauchery jumped up from his chair. He had restrained himself till then, but his nerves had at length got the better of him. "'That isn't it!' he exclaimed. The actors paused, their arms dangling beside them. Fontan, screwing up his nose, asked in a sneering way, "'What? What isn't it? You're all wrong. It's not that at all. Not that at all,' resumed Faucherie, who marched about the stage, gesticulating, and went through the scene. "'Look here, Fontan. You must understand Tardivaux's excitement. You lean forward like this, with this gesture, to seize hold of the Duchess. And you, Rose, it's then that you pass, quickly, like this, but not too soon.' not till you hear the kiss. He interrupted himself and called to Gossard in the heat of his explanations. Géraldine, give the kiss, loud, so that it can be well heard. Old Gossard turned towards Busk and smacked his lips vigorously. Good, that's the kiss, said Faucherie jubilantly. Give the kiss once more. Now you see, Rose, I've had time to pass, and then I utter a faint cry. Ah, she has kissed him. But for that, Tardivaux must follow you towards the back of the stage. Do you hear, Fontan? You must follow her to the back of the stage. Now try it over again, and all together. The actors went through the scene a second time, but Fontan played his part with such ill will that it was worse than ever. Twice again Fauchery gave his directions, acting the mimic each time with more warmth. They all listened to him in a mournful way, looked at one another for an instant, as though he had asked them to walk on their heads, and then awkwardly tried again, to stop almost directly with the rigidity of puppets whose strings have just been broken. No, it's too much for me. I can't understand it, Fontan ended by saying in his insolent tone of voice. During all this while, Baudonnev had not opened his lips. Buried in the depths of his armchair, one could only see by the pale light of the gas jet the top of his hat, which he had pulled over his eyes and his immense stomach, in front of which was his walking stick, abandoned between his legs, and one would have thought him asleep. Suddenly he rose up. My young friend, it's absurd, said he to Faucherie in a quiet tone of voice. How absurd! exclaimed the author, turning very pale. You are absurd yourself, my boy. Bordenave at once flew into a passion. He repeated the word absurd, and, seeking for something stronger, substituted imbecile and idiotic. It would be hissed they would never be allowed to finish the act, and as Faucherie exasperated, though not particularly offended by his abuse, which occurred each time they rehearsed a new piece together, roundly called him a brute, Bordenave lost all control of himself. He twirled his stick in his hand, and breathing like a mad bull, exclaimed, "'Damnation! Go to the deuce!' There's another quarter of an hour wasted in stupidity. Yes, stupidity. There's not the least particle of common sense in it. And yet it's so simple. You, Fontan, you're not to budge. You, Rose, you make a little movement, like this, you know. But no more, and then you come forward. Now try it that way. Off you go. Cassard, give the kiss. 
The scene went no better, the confusion became greater. Then Bordenave also began to mimic with the gracefulness of an elephant, whilst Faucherie stood by sneering and shrugging his shoulders in a pitying sort of way. Then Fontan mixed himself up in it, and even Busque ventured to give his advice. Rose, quite tired out, had finished by sitting down on the chair which indicated the door. No one any longer knew what they were about. To crown the confusion, Simone, thinking she heard her cue, made her entrance too soon in the midst of the disorder. This so enraged Baldenave that, whirling his stick round in a terrible manner, it alighted with great force on her posterior. He often struck the women who had been his mistresses during rehearsals. She rushed off, pursued by this furious cry, "'Take that home with you, and damn it all! I'll shut up the show if I'm bothered any more!' Faucherie had pressed his hat down on his head and pretended to leave the theatre. But he remained standing at the back of the stage and came forward again when he saw Baldenave return to his armchair in a frightful state of perspiration. He resumed his own seat. They remained a short time, side by side, without stirring, whilst complete silence reigned throughout the house. The actors waited nearly two minutes. They all seemed to be in a state of the greatest dejection, as though they had just gone through a most fatiguing task. "'Well, continue,' said Bordenave at length in his ordinary tone of voice, and perfectly calm. "'Yes, continue,' repeated Faucherie. "'We will arrange the scene to-morrow.' And they stretched themselves out, and the rehearsal resumed its course of tediousness and supreme indifference." During the row between the manager and the author, Fontan and the others had had a most enjoyable time at the back, seated on the bench in the rustic chairs. They had laughed quietly among themselves with numerous grunts and witty remarks, but when Simone returned with her whack behind and her voice broken by sobs, they went in for tragedy, saying that in her place they would have strangled the old pig. She wiped her eyes, nodding her head the while. It was all over. She would leave him more especially as Steiner the day before had offered to provide for her. Clarisse was lost in astonishment. The banker was without a sou. But Prullière laughed and reminded her of how the confounded Jew had advertised himself by means of Rose when he had been working the shares of the salt works of the land. Just then he had another project, a tunnel under the Bosphorus. Simone listened very much interested. As for Clarisse, she had been in an awful rage for a week past. That beast, La Faloise, whom she had flung into Gaga's venerable arms, had just inherited the property of a very rich uncle. She had no luck. She was always warming the house for the next tenant. Then that brute Bordenave had only given her a wretched part of fifty lines when she could very well have played Géraldine. She was longing for the part and had great hopes that Nana would refuse it. Well, and I, said Prullière indignantly, I haven't two hundred lines. I wish to decline the part. It's an insult to ask me to play that Saint-Firmin. It's as bad as being shelved. And what a piece, my friends. You know it'll be an awful fiasco. Here Simone, who had been talking with old Barillot, returned and said all out of breath, I say, Nana's here. Whereabouts? asked Clarisse, rising quickly from her seat to see. The news passed rapidly from one to the other. Everyone leant forward to have a look. For an instant the rehearsal was interrupted, but Bordenave suddenly roused himself and yelled, "'Well, what's the matter? Finish the act, can't you? And keep quiet, you over there. The row you kick up is intolerable.' Nana was still watching the piece from her box. La Bordette had twice addressed her, but she had impatiently pushed him with her elbow to make him leave off. The second act was just about ending when two figures appeared at the back of the stage. As they walked down to the front on the tips of their toes so as not to make any noise, Nana recognized Mignon and Count Mufa, who nodded in silence to Bordenave. "'Ah, there they are,' murmured she with a sigh of relief. Rose Mignon gave the last cue. Then Bordenave said that they must go through the second act again before touching the third one and leaving the rehearsal he greeted the count with most exaggerated politeness whilst faucherie pretended to be wholly engaged with the actors around him mignon whistled quietly to himself with his hands behind his back and looking tenderly at his wife who seemed rather nervous well shall we go up asked la bordette of nana i will make you comfortable in the room and then come back for him nana left the box at once 
she had to feel her way along the passage which led to the boxes and stalls but bourdonnave guessed she was there as she was hurrying along in the dark and he caught her up at the end of the corridor which passed behind the stage a narrow place where the gas was kept burning night and day there so as to get the matter settled quickly he at once attacked her about the part of geraldine eh hey, what a part what go there is in it it is exactly suited to you come to-morrow to rehearsal nana kept very cool she wished to see the third act oh the third act is superb the duchess plays at being a fast woman in her own home which disgusts borivage and gives him a lesson and then there's a very funny imbroglio tardivo arrives and thinking he is at some dancers and what does geraldine do in all that interrupted nana geraldine repeated bourdonnave slightly embarrassed she has a scene not very long but a capital one the part is a splendid one for you i tell you come and sign an agreement now for a few seconds she looked him straight in the face and then replied we'll talk it over by and by and she joined la bordette who was waiting for her on the stairs every one in the theatre had recognized her they were all whispering together her return quite scandalized Brulière, and clarisse was very uneasy about the part she was longing for as for fontan he pretended supreme indifference it was not for him to abuse a woman he had loved in his heart in his old infatuation now turned to hatred he entertained a ferocious grudge against her on account of her devotion to him of her beauty and of that dual existence which he had severed through the perversion of his monster-like inclinations however when la bordette returned and went up to the count rose mignon already put on her guard from the knowledge of nana's presence suddenly understood what was going on Mifa bored her immensely but the thought of being thrown over in that fashion was too much for her she broke the silence she usually maintained with her husband on those matters and said to him bluntly you see what is going on well i give you my word that if she tries on the steiner dodge again i will scratch her eyes out mignon calm and serene shrugged his shoulders with the air of a man who sees everything be quiet will you he murmured just oblige me by holding your tongue he knew what he was about he had got pretty well all he could out of mifa he felt that on a sign from nana the count was ready to lie down and be her footstool it was impossible to fight with such a passion as his and so knowing what men are his only thought was to get the most he could out of the situation he must wait and see how things went and he waited rose it's your scene cried bordenave the second act over again go resumed mignon leave me to manage this then in his bantering way he amused himself by complimenting faucherie on his piece it was a capital play only why was his grand lady so extremely virtuous it was not natural and he jeeringly asked who was the original of the duc de beau rivage the fool whom geraldine did what she liked with faucherie far from being annoyed began to smile but bordenave glancing in the direction of mifa seemed annoyed and that made mignon serious again and set him thinking damn it all are we ever going to begin yelled the manager look sharp barillot eh busk isn't there does he think he's going to make a fool of me any longer but at that moment busk quietly appeared and took his place the rehearsal recommenced just as la bordette went off with the count the latter trembled at the thought of seeing nana again after their rupture he had felt himself alone in the world he had allowed himself to be led to rose not knowing how to employ his time and thinking he was merely suffering from the alteration in his habits besides in the state of stupor in which he then was he wished to be ignorant of everything forbidding himself to seek nana and avoiding an explanation with the countess it seemed to him that he owed that oblivion to his dignity but there was a secret power at work and nana slowly reconquered him by his recollections by the weaknesses of his flesh and by new feelings exclusive tender and almost paternal the abominable scene in which he had taken part was forgotten he no longer beheld fontan he no longer heard nana ordering him out as she twitted him with his wife's adultery they were mere words which passed by as soon as they were uttered whilst in his heart there remained a sting the pangs of which almost suffocated him 
his thoughts at times became quite childish he accused himself imagining that she would not have deceived him had he really loved her his agony became intolerable and he was most unhappy it was like the smart of an old wound no longer that blind and impatient desire putting up with anything but a jealous love of that woman a need of her alone of her hair of her mouth of her body that haunted him whenever he recalled the sound of her voice a tremor ran through his limbs he longed for her with the exigencies of a miser and infinite delicacy and this love had seized upon him so grievously that at the first words la bordette uttered when sounding him respecting an interview he threw himself into his arms by an irresistible movement ashamed afterwards of having given way in a manner so ridiculous for a man of his rank but la bordette knew how to see and forget he gave another proof of his tact in leaving the count at the foot of the stairs with these simple words quickly uttered on the second floor turn to the right the door is only pushed to Mifa found himself alone in this silent corner of the building as he passed by the green room he noticed through the open doors the dilapidation of the vast apartment which in the daylight appeared in a disgraceful state through dirt and constant wear and tear but what surprised him on his leaving the noise and semi-obscurity of the stage were the bright clear light the intense quietude of that staircase which he had seen one night smoky with gas and sonorous with the rush of women scurrying about from floor to floor one could tell the dressing-rooms were unoccupied the passages deserted for there was not a soul not a sound whilst through the small square windows on a level with the stairs entered the pale november sun in the yellow rays of which an infinitesimal dust distorted itself whilst a death-like peacefulness hung over all he felt happy in this silence and calm he mounted the stairs slowly trying not to get out of breath his heart bounded against his breast and he was seized with the fear of acting like a child with sighs and tears then when he reached the first landing he leant against the wall certain of not being seen and holding his handkerchief to his mouth he looked at the warped steps at the iron hand railings shining from the constant friction at the soiled walls at all the wretchedness which gave the place the look of some low brothel displayed in all its bareness at that drowsy hour of the afternoon when the girls are sleeping when he arrived at the second landing he had to step over a big tortoise-shell cat curled up asleep on the top stair with its eyes half closed this cat watched all alone over the house always in a state of somnolency from the cool and stuffy odours left behind there every night by the women in the passage on the right the door of the dressing-room was as la bordette had said only pushed to nana was waiting there that little slut of a mathilde kept her dressing-room in a slovenly state there were cracked pots scattered all about a dirty wash-hand basin and a chair stained with rouge as though someone had been bleeding on the rush seat the paper which covered the walls and the ceiling was splashed all over with soapy water there was such a stench there such a smell of lavender turned musty that nana opened the window she stood there for a minute breathing the fresh air and leaning out to catch a glimpse of madame bron whom she heard vigorously sweeping the green flagstones on the shady side of the narrow courtyard a canary in a cage hung up against a shutter was uttering some piercing roulades one could not hear the sounds of the vehicles on the boulevard or in the neighbouring streets all was as peaceful as in the country though the sun but seldom penetrated there on raising her eyes nana saw the little buildings and the shining glass roofs of the galerie of the passage then farther off in front of her the high houses of the rue vivienne the backs of which were so devoid of life that they seemed empty terraces rose one above another on a roof a photographer had perched an enormous cage of blue glass it looked very gay nana was becoming absorbed in contemplating the scene when she thought she heard a knock at the door she turned round and called out come in end of chapter nine part one chapter nine part two of nana by Emile Zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain nine part two on seeing the count enter she closed the window the day was cold and it was not necessary that curious madame bro should overhear them they looked at one another gravely then as he stood very stiff and speechless she laughed and said well so there you are you big booby his emotion was so strong that he seemed frozen 
he called her madame and said how happy he was to see her again so to bring matters to the point that she desired she became more familiar still now don't stand on your dignity as you wish to see me it was not for us to look at each other like a couple of china dogs i suppose we've both been wrong as for me i forgive you and it was agreed that they would not refer to the subject again he nodded his approval he was becoming calmer but as yet could find nothing to say out of the tumultuous flow of words which rushed to his lips surprised at his coldness she played her trump card well now you're reasonable she resumed with a slight smile as we've made our peace let's shake hands and remain good friends for the future how good friends murmured he becoming suddenly anxious yes perhaps it's stupid of me but i was desirous of your esteem at present we've explained matters and if we ever meet each other anywhere we at least won't look like a couple of fools he seemed on the point of interrupting her let me finish what i have to say no man do you hear no man has ever had anything to reproach me with well it vexed me to begin with you we all have our honour my pet but that's not it he exclaimed violently sit down and listen to me and as though he feared she might go away he pushed her on to the only chair he walked about his agitation increasing the little dressing-room close and full of sunshine had a moist warm atmosphere and not a sound from outside reached it except the canary's piercing roulades which in the pauses seemed like the distant trills of a flute listen said he standing before her i have come to take you back yes i want to begin again you know it well so why do you talk to me like this tell me you consent she held down her head and was scratching with her nail the red-coloured rush seat which appeared to be bleeding beneath her and seeing him so anxious she did not hurry herself at length she raised her face now become serious while to her eyes she had managed to give an expression of sadness oh impossible little man never again will i live with you w why stuttered he as a twinge of intense suffering passed over his countenance why well because it's impossible that's all i don't wish it he looked at her ardently for a few seconds longer then bending his legs he knelt on the floor she looked annoyed and contented herself by adding oh don't be a child but he was already behaving as one fallen at her feet he had seized her round the waist which he squeezed tightly with his face between her knees which he was pressing against his breast when he felt her thus when he felt again the velvet-like texture of her limbs beneath the thin material of her dress his frame shook convulsively and shivering with fever and distracted he pressed harder against her as though he wished to become a part of her the old chair creaked sighs of desire were stifled beneath the low ceiling in the atmosphere rendered foul by stale perfumes well and what next said nana letting him do as he pleased all this will not help you when i tell you it's not possible dear me how young you are he became quieter but he remained on the ground he did not let go of her and he said in a voice broken by sobs at least listen to what i came to offer you i have already seen a mansion near the parc monceau i would realize all your desires to have you all my own i would give my fortune yes that would be the only condition all my own you understand me and if you consent to be mine alone oh i should wish you to be the most admired and also the richest carriages diamonds dresses nana proudly shook her head at each offer then as he continued as he talked of settling money on her not knowing what more to lay at her feet she seemed to lose patience come have you finished mauling me about i'm good-natured i let you do it for a minute because you seem so upset but there now that's enough isn't it let me get up you're tiring me she shook him off when she rose she said no 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 i won't then he regained his feet painfully and having no strength left he dropped on to the chair leaning against the back his face buried in his hands nana in her turn walked about for a moment she looked at the stained wallpaper the greasy dressing-table all over that dirty hole bathed in the pale sunlight then stopping in front of the count she spoke without the slightest emotion 
it's funny how rich people suppose they can have everything for their money. Well, but if I won't, I don't care a pin for your presence. You might give me all Paris, and I would say no and always no. It isn't very clean in here, as you see. Well, I should think it lovely if it pleased me to live here with you, whereas one pines away in your palaces if one's heart isn't there. Ah, money! My poor fellow, I have some somewhere. But let me tell you, I dance on money. More, I spit upon it. And she assumed a look of disgust. Then she went in for sentiment and added in a melancholy tone of voice, I know of something that is worth more than money. Ah, if any one gave me what I desire. He slowly raised his head, his eyes sparkled with hope. Oh, you can't give it to me, she resumed. It's not in your power to do so, and that is why I speak of it to you. Well, this is only between ourselves. I wish for the part of the grand lady in their new piece. What grand lady? murmured he in surprise. Their Duchess Hélène, of course. If they think I'm going to play Géraldine, they're very much mistaken. A part of no consequence at all. One scene, and not much in that. Besides, it's not only that. I've had enough of gay women. Always gay women. One would think I've nothing in me but gay women. It's become annoying in the long run, for I can see clear enough they fancy I'm ill-bred. Ah, well, my friend, they make a slight mistake. When I choose to be the grand lady, I do it as well as any one. Just look at this. And she retreated to the window, then advanced, carrying her head high, measuring her steps with the circumspect air of a fat old hen hesitating to dirty her feet. He watched her with his eyes still full of tears, stupefied by this sudden bit of comedy traversing his anguish. She walked about for a while to show all her by-play, smiling delicately, blinking her eyelids, swaying her skirts. Then stopping in front of him, she said, Well, I think that's good enough, isn't it? Oh, quite, he stammered, with a choking sensation in his throat and his glance still dim. I told you I could do the grand lady. I tried it at home, and there's not one of them that has my little air of a duchess who doesn't care a hang for the men. Did you notice, when I passed in front of you, how I quizzed you? That air only comes with the blood. And then I want to play the part of a respectable woman. It has been my dream. It is making me quite unhappy. I must have the part. Do you hear? I must have it. She spoke in a harsh tone of voice. She had become serious now, and was greatly affected, suffering from her stupid desire. Mifa, not yet recovered from the blow of her refusals, waited without understanding. There was a short silence which was not disturbed by the least sound. Do you know, she resumed without any more beating about the bush, you must get that part given to me. He was astounded. Then with a gesture of despair he said, But it is not possible. You said yourself that I had no power to do so. She interrupted him with a shrug of her shoulders. You've only to go downstairs and say to Bordenave that you want the part. Pray, don't be so simple. Bordenave is in want of money. Well, you can lend him some, as you've such a lot to throw out of the window. And as he still argued against it, she grew angry. Very well, I understand. You're afraid Rose won't like it. I didn't speak to you of her when you were sobbing on the ground. I should have had too much to say about her. Yes, when a man swears to a woman that he will love her forever, he shouldn't go the next day and make up to the first one he meets. Oh, the wound is here. I shan't forget it. Besides, my friend, it's not so pleasant after all to take the mignon's leavings. Before you went and made a fool of yourself down at my knees, you would have done better to have broken off entirely with that dirty set. He kept protesting, and ended at last by being able to say a few words. But I don't care a button for Rose. I will cast her off at once. Nana appeared to be satisfied on that point. She resumed. Then what is it that bothers you? Bordenave's the master. You'll tell me that besides Bordenave there's Faucherie. She spoke slower now. She was arriving at the delicate part of the matter. Mifa, his eyes fixed on the ground, said nothing. He had remained in a voluntary ignorance respecting Faucherie's assiduities for the countess, gradually quieting his suspicions, and hoping that he had been mistaken on that frightful night passed by him in the doorway of the Rue Thébou. 
but he entertained a certain repugnance and a secret anger against the man. Well, what? Faucherie isn't the devil, repeated Nana, feeling her way, wishing to find out how things were between the husband and the lover. It's easy enough to get over Faucherie. He is at the bottom a very decent fellow, I assure you. Well, it's understood. You'll tell him it's for me. The mere idea of such an undertaking was revolting to the Count. No, no, never, cried he. She waited. This phrase came to her lips. Faucherie can refuse you nothing. But she felt that it would be rather too strong an argument to use. Only she smiled, and her smile, which was a peculiar one, seemed to speak the words. Mifa, glancing up at her face, lowered his gaze again and looked pale and embarrassed. Ah, you're not at all obliging, murmured she at length. I cannot, said he in a voice full of agony. Everything you wish but not that my love oh i pray you so she did not waste any more time in arguing with her little hand she bent back his head then stooping forward she pressed her lips to his in one long embrace a thrill passed through his frame he started beneath her his eyes were closed his reason gone and she raised him from his seat go said she simply he walked, he moved towards the door, but as he was about to leave the room, she took him once more in her arms, and looking up at him meekly and coaxingly, she rubbed her cat-like chin against his waistcoat. "'Where is the mansion?' asked she in a very low voice, in the confused and laughing way of a child returning to some good things it would not at first look at. "'In the Avenue de Villiers.' "'And are there any carriages?' "'Yes.' and lace and diamonds yes oh how kind you are my ducky you know just now it was because i was jealous and this time i swear to you shan't be like the first for now you know what a woman requires you give me everything don't you then i shan't have to want anything to do with anyone else look they're only for you now that and that and that when she had pushed him outside after stimulating him with a shower of kisses on his face and hands, she stood a moment to take breath. Good heavens! What a stench there was in the dressing-room of that untidy Mathilde! It was warm in there, just like a room in the south of France with the winter sun shining upon it. But, really, it smelt too much of stale lavender water and of other things not very clean. Nana opened the window. She looked out as before and examined the glass roof of the passage to pass the time away. Mufa staggered downstairs with a buzzing in his ears. What was he to say? How could he enter into this matter which was none of his business? As he reached the stage he heard sounds of quarrelling. They were finishing the second act. Prullière was in a fury because Faucherie had wished to strike out one of his speeches. Strike them all out, then, cried he. I would rather you did that. What? I haven't two hundred lines, and now some of those are to be taken away. No, I've had enough of it. I throw up my part. He pulled out of his pocket a crumpled little memorandum and turned it over in his trembling hands, as though about to throw it on to Cassal's knees. His injured vanity convulsed his pale face, his lips being tightly compressed and his eyes on fire, without his being able to conceal that internal revolution. He, Prullière, the idol of the public, to perform a part of two hundred lines. Why not make me bring in letters on a salver? resumed he bitterly. Come, Prullière, do be pleasant, said Bordenave, who humoured him on account of his influence on the people in the boxes. Don't begin your complaints again. We will find you some good effects. Eh, Faucherie? You'll introduce some effects for him. In the third act we could even lengthen one of the scenes. Then, declared the actor, I must have the word at the end. You certainly owe me that. Faucherie's silence appeared to give consent, and Prillière put his part back in his pocket, still excited and discontented all the same. Bosque and Fontan, during the discussion, had assumed looks of supreme indifference. Everyone for himself. It did not concern them. They took no interest in it. And all the actors surrounded Faucherie, questioning him and fishing for compliments, whilst Mignon listened to Prullière's final complaints without losing sight of Count Muffat, whose return he had been watching for. 
the count remained in shadow at the back of the stage hesitating to advance into the midst of the quarrel but bordenave catching sight of him hastened to where he stood aren't they a set of grumblers murmured he you've no idea count what trouble i have with those people they're all more vain one than the other and so disobliging and spiteful always slandering other people and only too delighted if i make myself ill in keeping them to their business but excuse me i'm losing my temper he stopped and silence ensued between them Mifa was seeking a way of leading up to the subject that occupied his mind but failing in his endeavour he ended by abruptly saying so as to get it over the sooner nana wants to play the part of the duchess bordenave started violently as he exclaimed pooh that's absurd then glancing at the count he saw him looking so pale so agitated that he regained his composure at once the deuce he added simply and there was again silence between them as for himself he did not care a fig it would perhaps be funny to have that fat nana to play the part of the duchess besides he would thus have a strong hold on mifa so his decision was soon formed he turned round and called faucherie the count made a slight gesture to stop him faucherie did not hear fontan had got him up against the proscenium wall and was giving him his ideas of the part of tardivaux the actor thought he should make up as a marseillais with the southern accent which he kept imitating he made whole speeches that way was that the proper rendering of the part he seemed only to be giving his own ideas and which he himself had doubts about but faucherie keeping very cool in the matter and offering numerous objections fontan became annoyed at once very well as the correct reading of the part had entirely escaped him it would be far better for every one that he should not play it faucherie bourdonnab called again then the young man hurried away glad of the opportunity of escaping from the actor who felt highly indignant at being left in so abrupt a manner don't let us remain here resumed bordenave come gentlemen to be out of the way of indiscreet ears he took them to the property room behind the stage mignon watched them go off greatly surprised a few steps descended to the room which was square with a couple of windows looking on to the courtyard the ceiling was low and the dirty window-panes only admitted that dim light usually met with in cellars in pigeon-holes placed about the room was a collection of all sorts of things the turnout of a second-hand dealer of the rue de lappe selling off an odd medley of plates of cups in gilded pasteboard of old red umbrellas of italian pitchers of clocks of every shape and size of trays and inkstands of firearms and squirts the whole heaped anyhow chipped broken unrecognizable and layered with a layer of dust an inch thick and an unbearable stench of old iron and rags and of damp pasteboard arose from the piles formed of the remains of the pieces produced during a period of fifty years come in here said bordenave we shall at least be by ourselves the count very much embarrassed moved on a few steps to leave the manager to arrange matters by himself faucherie could not make it all out what's up he asked well it's just this said bordenave at length an idea has occurred to us now don't jump it's very serious what do you think of nana playing the part of the duchess at first the author was quite bewildered then he burst out oh no you can't mean it it must be a joke every one would laugh at it well it's something to get people to laugh think it over dear boy the count is very much smitten with the idea Mufa, to conceal his emotion, had taken an object that he did not seem to recognize from amidst the dust on a shelf. It was an egg-cup, the foot of which had been mended with plaster. He kept it in his hand without knowing he did so, and advanced towards the others to murmur, Yes, yes, it would be capital. Faucherie turned round upon him with an impatient gesture. The Count had nothing to do with his piece, and he exclaimed in a decided tone of voice, Never! nana as the gay woman as much as you like but as the grand lady not if i know it you do not judge her fairly i assure you resumed mufa becoming bolder only just now she was showing me how well she could play the grand lady where inquired faucherie whose astonishment increased upstairs in one of the dressing-rooms well she did it splendidly oh such distinction she can give such glances too you know in passing 
this way and with the egg-cup in his hand he tried to imitate nana forgetting himself in the force of his desire to convince the two other men Fouchery watched him in amazement he understood and his anger vanished the count who felt his glance upon him in which there was derision and pity combined blushed slightly and stopped well it may be so murmured the author obligingly she would perhaps do it very well only the part is already given we cannot take it away from rose oh if that's all said baldenave i will undertake to manage that but then seeing them both against him understanding that baldenave had some hidden motive for acting as he did the young man not wishing to give way declined again but with increased energy and in a manner not to admit of any further discussion no i say and no and always no even if the part was not filled up i would never give it to her there is that clear enough for you and now let me be i don't want to damn my own peace after this there was an embarrassed silence bourdeneuve thinking himself in the way withdrew some distance off the count stood with his head bowed down he raised it with an effort and said in a broken voice my dear fellow if i ask you to do it as a special favour to myself i cannot i cannot repeated fauchery struggling mifa's voice became harsher i beg of you i wish it and he looked him straight in the eyes beneath that black look in which he read a menace the young man suddenly gave way stammering confusedly well after all do as you wish i don't care ah you are unfair you will see you will see the embarrassment then became greater fauchery had leant up against some shelves and was nervously stamping on the floor with his foot Mufa appeared to be examining the egg-cup very attentively as he continued to turn it round between his fingers it's an egg-cup bourdonnave obligingly came and said why yes it's an egg-cup repeated the count excuse me you're all covered with dust continued the manager as he replaced the article on a shelf you see it would be impossible to be dusting here every day one would always be at it the consequence is it's not very clean what a mixture isn't it well believe me if you like it represents a lot of money look here and here he led me find the greenish light that came from the courtyard in front of all the shelves naming the different articles wishing to interest him in his rag merchant's inventory as he called it then when they had worked their way round to where fauchery stood he said in an easy tone of voice listen as we are now agreed we'll settle this matter at once ah there is mignon for a little while past mignon had been hanging about in the passage at the first words bourdonnave uttered suggesting an alteration in their agreement he flew into a passion it was disgraceful they wanted to ruin his wife's prospects he would go to law about it bourdonnave however remained very calm and reasoned with him he did not think the part worthy of rose he preferred to reserve her for an operetta which would come on after the little duchess but as the husband still complained he abruptly offered to annul the agreement and spoke of the proposals which the management of the folie dramatique theatre had made the singer then mignon for a moment worsted affected a great disdain for money without however denying the existence of the offers in question they had engaged his wife to play the part of the duchess hélène and she would play it even though it cost him his fortune it was a question of dignity of honour once engaged on this ground the discussion became interminable the manager always reverted to this argument as the folie dramatique people offered rose three hundred francs a night one hundred performances guaranteed whilst she only received one hundred and fifty from him his letting her go meant a profit of fifteen thousand francs for her the husband on his side did not depart from his standpoint that of art what would be said if the part was taken away from his wife that she was not equal to it and had been replaced that would do her a great injury and would lower her artistic standard considerably no no never glory before wealth then all of a sudden he hinted at a compromise according to the agreement if rose threw up her engagement she forfeited ten thousand francs well if they gave her that sum she would go to the folie dramatique theatre bourdonnave could scarcely believe his ears whilst mignon who had not taken his eyes off the count quietly waited then that settles everything 
murmured Mifa with relief. We are all agreed. Ah, no, by Jove, it would be too idiotic, exclaimed Bordenave, carried away by his business instincts. Ten thousand francs to get rid of Rose. You must think me a fool. But the Count kept signalling to him to agree to the proposal. He, however, still hesitated. At length, grumbling, regretting the ten thousand francs, though they were not to come out of his pocket, he curtly resumed. After all, I am willing. I shall at least be rid of you. For a quarter of an hour past, Fontan had been listening in the courtyard. Very curious to know what was going on, he had gone and posted himself there. When he had heard all there was to learn, he returned indoors and gave himself the treat of informing Rose. Ah, well, they were having a fine talk about her. She was done for. Rose rushed to the property room. They all remained silent. She looked at the four men. Mufa bowed his head. Fauchery answered her inquiring gaze with a despairing shrug of his shoulders. As for Mignon, he was discussing the terms of the agreement with Bordenave. "'What's up?' asked she in a sharp tone of voice. "'Nothing,' said her husband. "'It's only Bordenave who's going to give ten thousand francs for the return of your part.' She was very pale and trembling as she stood there with clenched fists. For a moment she looked him straight in the eyes in a revolt of her whole being. She, who ordinarily quietly submitted to him in all business matters, the making of agreements with her managers and her lovers. She only found these few words to say which struck him full in the face like the lash of a whip. Ah, really, you are too much a coward. And then she left them. Mignon, greatly alarmed, hastened after her. What was the matter? Was she mad? He explained to her in a whisper that ten thousand francs from one side and fifteen thousand francs from the other made twenty-five thousand francs. A magnificent stroke of business. Anyhow, it was certain that Mifa was going to leave her. Therefore, it was quite evident they ought to congratulate themselves on having succeeded in plucking that last feather from his wing. But Rose was so enraged she would not answer. Then Mignon left her with disdain to her woman's vexation. He said to Bordenave, who was returning to the stage with Faucherie and Mifa, We will sign the agreement tomorrow morning. Have the money ready. Nana, informed by La Bordette of what had taken place, arrived triumphant. She affected the style of a respectable woman with most distinguished ways, just to astonish everyone and to prove to those idiots that, when she liked, not one of them could come up to her. But she almost forgot herself. Rose, as soon as she saw her, flew at her, stammering in a choking voice, "'Ah, I shall see you again. We must have it out, do you hear?' Taken off her guard by this sudden attack, Nana was on the point of putting her fist on her hips and abusing the other roundly. She restrained herself, however, and exaggerating the fluty tone of her voice, making the gesture of a marchioness on the point of treading on a piece of orange peel, she said, "'Eh, what? You must be crazy, my dear.' and she continued her airs whilst Rose went off followed by Mignon, who scarcely knew her. Clarisse, to her great delight, had just had the part of Géraldine given to her by Bordenave. Faucherie moodily stamped about without being able to make up his mind to leave the theatre. His peace would be damned. He was wondering how he could save it. But Nana went and seized hold of him by the wrist and asked him if he thought her so very dreadful. She would not damn his peace and she made him laugh and let him understand that she might be of assistance to him with Mufa. If her memory failed her, she would make use of the prompter. They would pack the house. Besides, he was mistaken in her. He would see how she would carry all before her. Then it was settled that the author should slightly alter the part of the Duchess so as to give more to Prullière. The latter was delighted. In the general joy that Nana seemed naturally to bring with her, Fontan alone remained indifferent. Standing up, Full in the yellow glare of the gas jets, he showed himself off, displaying his sharp goat like profile and affecting an easy posture. Nana coolly went up to him and, holding out her hand, said, Are you quite well? Yes, pretty well. And you? I'm very well, thanks. That was all. It seemed as though they had left each other only the night before at the door of the theatre. The actors during all this time had been waiting, but Bordenave at length said they would not rehearse the third act that day. Punctual for a wonder, old Busk went off grumbling. They were always keeping them without any necessity. They made them waste entire afternoons. Everyone went away. 
below arrived on the pavement they blinked their eyes blinded by the bright daylight with the bewilderment of people who have spent three hours quarrelling in the depths of a cellar with a constant strain upon their nerves the count feeling dizzy and overwrought got into a cab with nana whilst la bordette went off consoling faucherie a month later the first performance of the little duchess was a great disaster for nana she was atrociously bad in it she made pretensions to high-class comedy which filled the audience with merriment no one hissed they were all too much amused seated in one of the stage boxes rose mignon greeted each appearance of her rival with a shrill burst of laughter thus setting off the whole house it was a first revenge and when at night-time nana found herself alone with the count who was very much cut up she said to him furiously what a dead set they made against me it's all jealousy ah if they knew how little i care for it i can do without them all now i'll bet a hundred louis that i'll make all those who laughed lick the ground at my feet yes i'll teach your paris what it is to be a grand lady End of chapter nine chapter ten part one of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ten Part One. Then Nana became a woman of fashion, a marchioness of the streets frequented by the upper ten, living on the stupidity and the depravity of the male sex. It was a sudden and definitive start in a new career, a rapid rise in the celebrity of gallantry, in the full light of the follies of wealth and of the wasteful effronteries of beauty. She reigned at once among all that was most costly her photographs were in all the windows her name was mentioned in the newspapers when she passed along the boulevards in her carriage the crowd turned to look at her and uttered her name with the emotion of a people saluting its sovereign whilst she quite at her ease reclined in her wavy costumes and smiled gaily beneath the shower of little golden curls which half hid the blue circle round her eyes and the carmine on her lips and the marvel was that this big girl who was so awkward on the stage so ludicrous the moment she tried to act the respectable woman charmed every one about town without an effort adorned with a déshabille as artful and exquisitely elegant as it was ostensibly unintentional she combined the suppleness of the adder with the nervous distinction of a thoroughbred cat like an aristocracy of vice superb and rebellious treading paris underfoot in the manner of an all-powerful mistress she set the fashion and great ladies followed it nana's mansion was in the avenue de villiers at the corner of the rue cardinet in that quarter of luxury which had sprung up in the midst of the empty expanse formerly the plain of monceau erected by a young painter intoxicated by a first success and who had been forced to sell it when the plaster was scarcely dry it was built in the renaissance style with the air of a palace a certain fantastical internal arrangement and modern conveniences within a space rather restricted for such a display of originality count mifa had purchased the place furnished full of a host of knick-knacks of beautiful eastern hangings of old credences and big armchairs at the time of louis the thirteenth and nana had thus fallen into a stock of the choicest artistic furniture selected from the productions of centuries but as the studio which occupied the centre of the building could be of no use to her she had pulled the different floors to pieces leaving on the ground floor a conservatory a drawing-room and a dining-room and arranging a parlour on the first floor close to her bedroom and dressing-room she surprised the architect by the ideas she gave him showing herself at once at home in all the refinements of luxury like the paris street girl who has the instinct of elegance in short she did not spoil the mansion overmuch she even added to the richness of its furniture with the exception of a few traces of tender stupidity and gaudy splendour typical of the former artificial flower-maker who had dreamily gazed into the shop-windows of the passages a carpet was laid up the steps in the courtyard beneath the grand veranda and from the vestibule there came an odour of violets a warm atmosphere confined by heavy hangings a yellow and rose-coloured glass window of the paleness of flesh lighted the wide staircase at the foot of which stood the figure of a negro in sculptured wood holding a silver salver full of visiting cards four women in white marble with bare breasts supported some elegant lamps whilst bronzes and chinese vases filled with flowers 
sofas covered with the products of ancient persian looms and easy chairs with old tapestries furnished the vestibule adorned the landings turning the one on the first floor into a kind of ante-room in which men's coats and hats were always to be seen lying about the carpets deadened all sound and such a peacefulness hung about that one might have imagined oneself entering a chapel traversed by some pious tremor and the silence of which hid a mystery behind the closed doors nana only opened the drawing-room which was in the louis the sixteenth style and rather overdone on gala nights when she entertained persons from the tuileries or distinguished foreigners usually she was only downstairs at meal-times feeling moreover rather lost on the days when she lunched alone in the lofty dining-room which was decorated with gobelin tapestry and a monumental credence and enlivened with old china and marvellous specimens of ancient silverware she would return upstairs as soon as the meal was over for she lived so to say in the three rooms on the first floor the bedroom the dressing-room and the parlour she had twice changed the decorations of the bedroom the first time she had hung it in mauve satin the second in white lace on blue silk but she was not satisfied she thought it looked dull and tried to think of some improvement but without success over the well-padded bedstead which was as low as a sofa there was twenty thousand francs worth of venetian lace the furniture was in blue and white lacquer inlaid with fillets of silver whilst white bearskins were everywhere spread in such profusion that they covered the carpet this was one of nana's caprices she having been unable to get rid of the habit of sitting down on the floor to take her stockings off next to the bedroom the parlour offered an amusing medley and a most artistic one against the pale rose-coloured silk hangings a faded turkey rose stitched with gold stood out a multitude of objects of all countries and of all styles italian cabinets spanish and portuguese coffers chinese pagodas a japanese screen of the most precious workmanship then china and bronzes embroidered silks and the finest tapestries whilst easy chairs as big as beds and sofas as deep as alcoves gave to the whole the lazy drowsy appearance of a seraglio the room preserved a tone of old gold blended with green and red without anything indicating too much the abode of a gay woman excepting perhaps the voluptuousness of the seats two small porcelain figures a woman in her chemise catching fleas and another perfectly naked walking on her hands with her legs in the air alone sufficed to sully the apartment with a stain of eccentric stupidity and by a door almost always open one caught sight of the dressing-room all in marble and mirrors with the white basin of its bath its silver bowls and ewers its furnishings of crystal and ivory a closed curtain maintained a faint light and gave the room a sleepy look as though oppressed with an odour of violets that exciting perfume of nanas with which the whole house and even the courtyard was penetrated the great matter was to secure servants for the establishment nana still had zoe that girl who was so devoted to her fortune and who for months past confident in her instinct had been quietly awaiting this new start in life now zoe triumphed mistress of the household and feathering her own nest yet looking after madame's interests as honestly as possible but a lady's maid was not sufficient a butler a coachman a concierge a cook were required besides which it was necessary to furnish the stables then la bordette made himself very useful in undertaking any commissions that bothered the count he bargained for the horses went to the coach-builders and assisted the young woman who was continually met with on his arm at the different dealers in her selections la bordette even engaged the servants charles a tall coachman who had been in the service of the duc de cambreuse julien a little butler with curly hair and always smiling and a married couple of whom the woman victorine was cook while the man francois acted as concierge and footman the latter with powdered hair and knee breeches and wearing nana's livery light blue and silver lace received the visitors in the vestibule everything was done in princely style by the second month all was in working order the expenses were at the rate of three hundred thousand francs a year there were eight horses in the stables and five carriages in the coach-houses there was one especially a landau with silver ornaments which for a time occupied all paris and nana in the midst of this fortune gradually settled down she had left the theatre after the second performance of the little duchess leaving bordeneuve to struggle as best he could against threatened bankruptcy in spite of the count's money all the same she bitterly felt her failure it added to the lesson fontan had given her 
a dirty trick for which she held all the men responsible she now considered herself proof against all fads and infatuations but her thoughts of vengeance did not remain for long in her flighty brain what did remain there however outside her moments of anger was an ever keen appetite for squandering money a natural disdain for the man who paid a perpetual caprice for devouring and destroying a pride in the ruin of her lovers nana commenced by putting the count on a satisfactory footing she settled clearly the programme of their relations he gave twelve thousand francs a month without counting presents and only asked in return an absolute fidelity she swore to be faithful but she insisted on being treated with deference on enjoying entire liberty as mistress of the household and on having all her wishes respected for instance she would receive her friends every day he himself should only come at stated hours in short he should trust her implicitly in everything and when he hesitated seized by a jealous anxiety she became very dignified threatening to return him everything or else swearing fidelity on the head of her little louis that ought to be sufficient there could be no love where there was no esteem at the end of the first month Mufa respected her but she desired and she obtained more she soon influenced him in a good-natured sort of way when he arrived in a moody state of mind she enlivened him then advised him after confessing him little by little she busied herself with his family cares his wife his daughter all matters connected with his heart and his money and she did so in a very reasonable manner full of justice and honesty once only did she let herself be carried away by passion the day when he told her that he thought dagonet was about to ask him for his daughter's hand ever since the count had been openly protecting nana dagonet had thought it a clever move to break off all connection with her to treat her as a hussy and to swear to deliver his future father-in-law from the creature's clutches so she abused her old friend mimi in a fine way he was a dissipated rascal who had squandered his fortune with the most abominable women now he had no decency about him he did not exactly make them give him money but he profited by what others gave them merely going himself to the expense of an occasional bouquet or dinner and as the count seemed to excuse these weaknesses she told him coarsely that she had been dagonet's mistress and furnished him with some salacious details Mufa became very pale and did not again speak of the young man it would teach the latter to be ungrateful the mansion however was scarcely furnished when nana one night that she had been most energetically swearing everlasting fidelity to mifa retained count xavier de vandeuvre who for a fortnight past had been paying court to her most assiduously by means of visits and flowers she gave way not through any infatuation but rather to prove to herself that she was at liberty to do as she pleased the interested motive came afterwards when vandeuvre on the morrow helped her to settle an account that she would rather not mention to the other one she would be able to get out of him about eight or ten thousand francs a month which would be very useful by way of pocket money he was just then finishing up his fortune in a violent fit of fever his horses and lucy had cost him three farms and nana was about to devour his last chateau near amiens in a single mouthful he seemed in a hurry to sweep off everything even to the remains of the old castle built by a vendeuvre in the reign of philip augustus with a maddening appetite for ruins and thinking it a fine thing to leave the last gold bezants of his coat of arms in the hands of that girl whom all paris desired he also accepted nana's conditions entire liberty and love at fixed times without even being so passionately simple as to exact oaths Mifa suspected nothing as for vandeuvre he knew perfectly all that was going on but he never made the slightest allusion he affected ignorance with the cunning smile of a sceptical man about town who does not expect impossibilities so long as he has his own particular time and that paris knows it then nana's establishment was indeed complete nothing was wanting either in the stables the kitchen or the bedroom zoe who had the general management found means of escape out of the most difficult entanglements there was a kind of machinery in everything as at a theatre all was regulated as in a government office and it worked with such precision that for some months there was no hitch nothing got out of gear only madame gave zoe an immense deal of trouble through her imprudence her fads and her foolish bravados so the maid ended by being less careful seeing that she made a far larger profit when anything had gone wrong 
whenever madame had committed some new piece of stupidity that needed being set right then it rained presents and she hooked louis in the troubled waters one morning when mifa was still in the bedroom zoe ushered a gentleman all in a tremble into the dressing-room where nana was changing her undergarments why zizi said the young woman in amazement it was indeed georges but seeing her in her chemise with her golden hair hanging over her naked shoulders he seized hold of her put his arms round her neck and smothered her with kisses she struggled greatly frightened saying in a suppressed voice leave off do he's in there it's stupid of you and you zoe are you mad take him away keep him downstairs i'll try and come there zoe had to push him before her downstairs in the dining-room when nana was able to rejoin them she scolded them both zoe bit her lips and went off looking very vexed saying that she thought to have gratified madame in doing what she did georges looked at nana with so much pleasure at seeing her again that his beautiful eyes filled with tears now the evil days had gone by his mother thought he had got over his infatuation and had allowed him to leave les fondettes but on reaching the paris terminus he had hastened in a cab to kiss his darling sweetheart as quickly as possible he talked of living by her side for the future the same as in the country when he used to wait with bare feet in the bedroom at la mignotte and as he told his story he thrust out his fingers through a longing to touch her after that year of cruel separation he seized hold of her hands felt up the wide sleeves of her dressing-gown even as high as her shoulders you still love your baby he asked in his childlike voice of course i do replied nana who abruptly disengaged herself but you arrive here without a word of warning you know my little boy i'm not free you must be good georges who alighted from his cab dazzled by a long desire on the point of being satisfied had not bestowed a glance on the place he entered but now he was conscious of a great change around him he examined the rich dining-room with its lofty gilded ceiling its gobelin tapestry and its sideboard shining with silver plate ah yes said he sadly and she gave him to understand that he must never call in the morning the afternoon if he liked between four and six o'clock which was the time when she received company then as he gazed at her with a supplicating look of interrogation but without asking for anything she kissed him on the forehead in a very kind good-natured way be very good and i will do my best she murmured but the truth was she no longer felt as she did in regard to him she thought georges very nice she would have liked to have had him for a companion but nothing more however when he came every day at four o'clock he seemed so sad that she often again yielded permitted him to hide in her cupboards and continually to pick up the crumbs of her beauty in time he scarcely ever left the house where he was as much at home as the little dog bijou both of them among the mistress's skirts having a little of her even when she was with another and catching windfalls of sugar and caresses in the hours of weary solitude no doubt madame hugon heard of her boy's new fall into the power of that bad woman for she hurried to paris and sought the assistance of her other son lieutenant philippe who was then in garrison at vincennes georges who had been hiding from the elder brother was seized with despair fearing the employment of force and as he could keep nothing to himself in the nervous expansion of his tender-heartedness he soon talked to nana continually of his big brother a strong fellow who would dare anything you see he explained mamma will not come here herself but she can very well send my brother i'm sure she will send philippe to fetch me the first time he mentioned this nana was greatly offended she said sharply i should just like to see him do it in spite of his being a lieutenant francois will very quickly send him to the right about then the youngster constantly alluding to his brother she ended by thinking a little of philippe when a week had gone by she knew him from the hair of his head to the tips of his toes very tall very strong lively and rather rough and with all that some more minute details certain hairs on his arm a mole on his shoulder so that one day full of the image of this man whom she was to send off a little quicker than he came she exclaimed i say zizi it doesn't seem as if your brother was coming he must be a coward on the morrow as georges was alone with nana francois came and asked if madame would receive lieutenant philippe hugon the youngster turned quite pale and murmured i was expecting it mamma spoke to me this morning 
and he implored the young woman to send word that she was engaged but she had already risen and said greatly incensed why pray he'll think i'm afraid ah well we'll have a good laugh francois let the gentleman wait a quarter of an hour in the drawing-room and then bring him to me she did not sit down again but walked feverishly about going from the looking-glass over the mantelpiece to a venetian mirror hanging above a little italian casket and each time she gave a glance or essayed a smile whilst georges lying on a sofa without an atom of strength left in him trembled at the idea of the scene which was preparing as she walked about she kept uttering short phrases it will calm the fellow to keep him waiting a quarter of an hour and then if he thinks he's come to a nobody's the drawing-room will astonish him yes yes take a good look at everything my friend it's all genuine i'll teach you to respect the mistress it's the only thing men can understand respect is the quarter of an hour gone yet no scarcely ten minutes oh we've plenty of time she could not keep still when the quarter was up she sent georges away after making him swear not to listen at the doors for it would look very bad if the servants were to see him as he went into the bedroom zizi ventured to say in a choking voice you know it's my brother don't be afraid said she with dignity if he's polite i'll be polite francois ushered in philippe hugon who was attired in an overcoat at first georges moved across the bedroom on the tips of his toes so as not to listen as the young woman had told him but hearing the voices he stopped hesitating and so full of anguish that his legs yielded beneath him he was fancying all manner of things catastrophes slaps something abominable that would sever him for ever from nana so much so that he could not resist retracing his footsteps and putting his ear to the keyhole he heard very indistinctly as the thickness of the hangings deadened the sound yet he was able to catch a few words uttered by philippe harsh phrases in which occurred such expressions as child family honour in his anxiety to hear what his darling would reply his heart beat wildly almost stunning him with its confused hum no doubt she would retaliate with a stupid fool or a go to the deuce i'm in my own house but nothing came from her not even the sound of breathing it seemed as though nana was dead in there soon too his brother's voice became softer he could no longer understand anything when suddenly a strange noise completed his amazement it was nana sobbing for an instant contrary feelings struggled within him he felt impelled to run away to rush in at philippe but just at that moment zoe entered the bedroom and he withdrew from the door ashamed at having been caught she quietly put some linen away in a cupboard whilst he dumb and immovable and a prey to uncertainty pressed his forehead against a window-pane after a short silence she asked is it your brother who's with madame yes replied he in a choking voice and are you uneasy about it monsieur georges she inquired after another silence yes he repeated with the same painful difficulty zoe did not hurry herself she folded up some lace and then said slowly you should not be madame will settle everything all right and that was all they did not speak again but she did not leave the room for another quarter of an hour she moved about without noticing the exasperation of the youth who grew pale with constraint and doubt he gave side glances in the direction of the drawing-room what could they be doing all that while perhaps nana was still crying the ruffian must have slapped her so when zoe at length went off he ran back to the door and again held his ear to the keyhole and he was quite bewildered his brain in a whirl for he heard a sudden burst of gaiety tender voices whispering and the smothered laughter of a woman being tickled but almost immediately nana conducted philippe to the staircase with an interchange of cordial and familiar expressions when georges at length ventured into the parlour the young woman was standing in front of the mirror looking at herself well he asked scarcely able to say a word well what said she without turning round then she negligently added what were you saying he's a very nice fellow your brother then it's all settled of course it's settled really what's the matter with you did you think we were going to fight but still georges did not understand i thought i heard he stammered out have you not been crying 
crying i she exclaimed looking him straight in the face you were dreaming whatever did you think i had to cry about and the youngster got still more confused when she scolded him for having been disobedient and listened at the keyhole spying upon her as she continued cross with him he resumed very submissively and coaxingly wishing to know then my brother your brother saw at once where he was you see i might have been some low common girl and then he would have been right to interfere on account of your age and the family honour oh i understand those feelings but a glance was sufficient for him he behaved like a man of the world so don't be uneasy it's all over he will ease your mother's mind and she continued with a laugh besides you'll see your brother here i've invited him and he'll come ah he's coming again said the youngster turning pale he said nothing more and they no longer talked of philippe she was dressing to go out and he watched her with his big sad eyes no doubt he was pleased that matter had been arranged for he would have preferred death to not seeing nana again but in his heart there was a silent anguish a deep pain which he had never felt before and which he did not dare to mention he never knew how philippe had quieted their mother's anxiety three days later she returned to la fondette seeming quite satisfied that same night at nana's he started when francois announced the lieutenant the latter gaily chaffed him treated him as a boy whose escapade he had winked at as it was of no consequence georges feeling sick at heart not daring to move blushed like a girl at the least word he had lived but little with philippe who was ten years older than he he feared him as a father from whom one hides one little's adventures with women and he felt an uneasy shame on seeing him so free with nana laughing very loud full of health and thoroughly enjoying himself however as his brother soon called every day georges began to get used to his presence nana was radiant with joy it was a last change of residence in the full fling of a courtesan's life a housewarming insolently given in a mansion overflowing with men and furniture one afternoon when the two hugons were there count mifa called outside his regular hours but zoe having told him that madame was with some friends he went away again without seeing her in the discreet style of a gallant gentleman when he came back in the evening nana received him in the cold angry way of an insulted woman sir said she i have given you no reason for insulting me understand that when i am at home you are to enter like every one else the count stood with his mouth wide open but my dear he attempted to explain because i had visitors perhaps yes there were some men here and what pray do you think i do with them it causes a woman to be talked about affecting those airs of a discreet lover and i do not wish to be talked about he had great difficulty in obtaining forgiveness at heart he was delighted it was by similar scenes to this that she kept him obedient and convinced of her fidelity for some time past she had made him submit to georges presence a youngster who amused her so she said she got him to dine with philippe and the count was very amiable on leaving the table he took the young man on one side and asked him for news of his mother from that time the hugons vandeuvre and mifa openly belonged to the establishment where they met together as intimate friends it was more convenient mifa alone still discreetly timed his visits so as not to call too often and invariably affected the ceremonious air of a stranger at night-time when nana seated on the floor on her bearskins pulled off her stockings he talked in a friendly way of the other gentlemen of philippe especially who was loyalty itself that's true they're all very nice said nana still seated on the ground and changing her chemise only you know they see who i am should they for a moment forget themselves i would have them turned out of the house at once yet in the midst of her luxury in the midst of that court nana was bored to death she had men with her every minute of the night and money everywhere even in the drawers of her dressing-table amongst her combs and brushes but that no longer satisfied her she felt a void somewhere a vacancy that made her yawn her life rolled on unoccupied bringing every day the same monotonous hours the morrow did not exist for her she lived like a bird sure of eating ready to sleep on the first branch she came across this certainty of being fed left her stretched out the whole day without an effort asleep in the midst of that idleness and that convent-like submission as though quite hemmed in in her profession of courtesan 
Going out only in a carriage, she began to lose the use of her legs. She returned to the amusements of her childhood, kissing Bijou from morning to night, killing time with the silliest pleasures in her unique expectation of the man whom she put up with in a complacent and weary sort of way. And in the midst of this abandonment of herself, the only anxiety she had was for her beauty. She was continually examining, washing, and perfuming herself all over, with the pride of being able to appear naked before any one and at any moment without feeling ashamed. Nana rose every morning at ten o'clock. Bijou, the Scotch terrier, woke her by licking her face, and then she would play with him for five minutes as he jumped about over her arms and legs and even on to the count. Bijou was the first of whom he was jealous. It was not proper that an animal should thrust his nose under the bedclothes in that way. Towards eleven o'clock, Francis came to do up her hair, preparatory to the complicated headdress of the evening. At lunch, as she detested eating alone, she generally had Madame Maloire, who arrived in the morning from no one knew where, with her extraordinary bonnets, and returned at night to the mystery of her life without anybody troubling themselves about it. But the worst time was the two or three hours between luncheon and the evening toilette. Ordinarily she proposed a game at Bézique to her old friend. Sometimes she read the Figaro, the theatrical and fashionable news in which interested her. She even occasionally opened a book, for she prided herself on her taste for literature. Her toilette occupied her until nearly five o'clock. Then only she seemed to awake from her long somnolence, going out in her carriage or receiving a host of men at home, often dining out, going to bed very late, and rising the next morning with the same fatigue, and beginning a fresh day to pass it in a similar manner. Her great diversion was to go to Batignolles to see her little Louis at her aunt's. For fifteen days together she would forget him entirely. Then she would be seized with a rage to see him, and hurry there on foot, full of the modesty and tenderness of a good mother, bringing all sorts of presents as though for an invalid. Snuff for the aunt, oranges and sweeties for the child or else she would call in her landau on her return from the bois attired in such loud dresses that they would upset the whole street ever since her niece had become such a grand lady madame lerat had been puffed up with vanity she called but rarely at the avenue de villiers pretending that it was not her place but she triumphed in her own street happy when the young woman arrived in dresses costing four or five thousand francs and occupied all the morrow in showing her presence and quoting figures which amazed her neighbors generally nana reserved sunday for her family and on that day if mifa asked her to go anywhere she refused smiling like a young housewife it was not possible she was going to dine with her aunt she was going to see her baby with all that poor little louis was always ill he was nearly three years old and was getting quite a big fellow but he had had an attack of eczema on the back of his neck and now he had deposits in his ears which made them fear a caries of the bones of the cranium when she saw him looking so pale with his poor blood and his soft flesh spotted with yellow she became very serious and above all she was greatly surprised what could be the matter with the love for him to sicken like that she his mother was always so well the days when her child did not engage her attention nana relapsed into the noisy monotony of her existence drives in the bois first nights at theatres dinners and suppers at the maison dore or the cafe anglais then all the public resorts all the sites where the crowds flocked mabille reviews races but she still retained that empty feeling of stupid idleness which gave her pains in her inside in spite of the constant infatuations in which her heart indulged she would stretch her arms the moment she was alone with a gesture of immense fatigue solitude made her sad at once for she found herself again with the empty feeling and the tedium of her own society very gay by profession and by nature she would then become lugubrious and would constantly sum up her life in this cry between two yawns oh how men bore me one afternoon as she was returning home from a concert nana noticed a woman passing along the rue montmartre with boots trodden down at heel dirty skirts and a bonnet that had evidently been frequently soaked with rain all of a sudden she recognized her stop charles cried she to the coachman and then called satin satin the passers-by turned their heads the whole street looked on satin drew near and dirtied herself still more against the wheels of the carriage jump in my girl said nana coolly not caring a straw for what the world would say 
and thus she picked her up and took her off disgustingly filthy as she was in the light blue landau and by the side of her pearl-gray silk dress trimmed with chantilly lace whilst every one smiled at the highly dignified air of the coachman from that time nana had a passion which occupied her satin became her vice installed in the mansion of the avenue de villiers cleaned and clothed for three days she gave her experiences of saint lazare all the trouble she had had with the nuns and those dirty policemen who had put her on their list nana became very indignant consoled her and swore to get her out of the mess even though she had to see the minister of police herself for the moment however there was no hurry they would certainly not come and seek her there and afternoons full of tenderness commenced between the two women caressing words were heard and kisses broken with suppressed laughter it was the little game interrupted by the arrival of the policeman at the rue de laval which had started again in the way of a joke then one night it became serious nana who was so disgusted at laws now began to understand she was quite upset and greatly enraged the more so as on the morning of the fourth day satin disappeared no one had seen her go out she had bolted with her new dress seized with a longing for the open air with a nostalgia for her favorite pavements that day there was such a storm in the house that all the servants hung down their heads without daring to say a word nana had almost beaten francois for not having stood in front of the door she tried however to restrain herself and referred to satin as a dirty strumpet it would teach her not to pick such filth out of the gutter another time that afternoon madame shut herself in and zoe heard her sobbing then in the evening she suddenly ordered her carriage and drove to laws the idea had occurred to her that she might find satin at the dining-place of the rue des martyrs it was not to get her back again but merely to slap her face and it happened that satin was dining at one of the little tables with madame robert seeing nana she laughed the latter struck to the heart did not create a disturbance but on the contrary kept very quiet and amiable she stood champagne and made a number of women tipsy and then carried off satin while madame robert had left the room for a moment but when she had got her in the carriage she bit her and threatened to kill her if she ran away again and then the same thing kept continually occurring twenty times nana tragical in her fury of a deceived woman hastened after the hussy who flew off simply for a fad bored with the comfort of the grand establishment she talked of smacking madame robert's face one day she even had the idea of a duel there was one too many now whenever she went to dine at laws she put on her diamonds and was sometimes accompanied by louise violin maria blonde or tatanine all looking very gorgeous and beneath the yellow gaslight in the smell of eatables which pervaded the three rooms these ladies displayed their luxury in very questionable company delighted at astonishing the girls of the neighborhood whom they carried off with them when the meal was over on those days law laced up and shining kissed all her customers with a more maternal air than ever satin however in the midst of all this preserved her calmness with her blue eyes and her pure virgin-like face bitten beaten pulled about by the two women she merely said that it was funny and that they would have done far better to have come to some understanding with each other it was no use slapping her she could not cut herself in two in spite of her wish to please every one at last nana carried the day having bestowed on satin the most love and presents and by way of revenge madame robert wrote some most abominable anonymous letters to her rival's lovers End of chapter ten part one chapter ten part two of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain ten part two for some little time past count mifa had seemed uneasy one morning in a very agitated state he placed under nana's eyes an anonymous letter in which she saw in the first lines that she was accused of being unfaithful to the count with vandeuvre and the two hugons it's false it's false she exclaimed energetically with an extraordinary accent of truthfulness you swear it asked mifa already relieved oh on what you like on my child's head but the letter was long afterwards it went on to recount her connection with satin in the most ignoble terms when she reached the end she smiled now i know where it comes from said she simply 
and as Mifal wished for a denial of the latter part, she resumed coolly, "'That, my dear, is a thing which does not concern you. What can it matter to you?' She did not deny it. His words showed his disgust. Then she shrugged her shoulders. "'Where did he spring from? That sort of thing happened everywhere, and she named her friends. She even swore that ladies in the best positions were no strangers to it. In short, to hear her, there was nothing more common or more natural.' What was not true was not true. He had seen just before how indignant she was about Vendeuvre and the two Higons. Ah, had that been true, he would have done right in strangling her. But what was the use of telling him a lie about a matter of no consequence? And she kept repeating, Come now, what can it matter to you? Then, as he continued to complain, she silenced him, saying in a rough voice, Well, my friend, if it doesn't please you, you have a very simple remedy. The doors are all open. You must either take me as I am or leave me alone. He bowed his head. In his heart he was pleased with the young woman's protestations. She, seeing her power, no longer hesitated employing it, and from that time Satin was openly installed as part of the establishment, on the same footing as the gentleman. Vendeuvre had not required the anonymous letter to understand what was going on. He joked about it and had little quarrels of jealousy with Satin whilst philippe and georges treated her as a comrade shaking hands with her and saying some very equivocal things nana had an adventure one night having been abandoned by the hussy she had gone to dine in the rue des Mertiers without being able to come across her while she was eating alone dagonet made his appearance though he had settled down he came there occasionally his old vices getting the better of him trusting not to meet any of his friends in those dark corners of parisian abomination Consequently, Nana's presence seemed rather to put him out at first, but he was not the man to beat a retreat. He advanced, smiling. He asked if Madame would permit him to dine at her table. Seeing him inclined to joke, Nana put on her grand cold air and sharply replied, "'Seat yourself wherever you please, sir. We are in a public place.' Commenced in this style, the conversation became very funny. But when the dessert was served, Nana, feeling bored and burning to triumph, put her elbows on the table, and then resumed her old familiar way. "'Well, and your marriage, my boy, how is it getting on?' "'Not very well,' admitted Dagonet. As a matter of fact, when about to venture to ask for the young lady's hand, he had encountered such a coldness on the Count's part that he had prudently abstained from doing so. It seemed to him that it was all up. Nana looked him straight in the face with her bright eyes, her chin in her hand, an ironic smile on her lips. "'Ah, so I'm a hussy,' she resumed slowly. "'Ah, so you must deliver the future father-in-law from my clutches. "'Well, really, for an intelligent fellow, you're a damned fool. "'What, you go and say a lot of nasty things to a man who adores me and who tells me everything? "'Listen, your marriage will come off if I choose, my boy.' "'For a few minutes he had been of the same opinion. "'A project of complete submission was forming in his mind.' However, he continued to joke, not wishing to let the matter become a serious one, and, after putting on his gloves, he asked her, in the most correct manner, for the hand of Mademoiselle Estelle de Beuville. She ended by laughing as though being tickled. Oh, that Mimi! It was impossible to be angry with him. Dagonet's great success with the ladies were due to the softness of his voice, a voice of a musical purity and suppleness, which had caused him to be nicknamed among the gay women Velvet Mouth, all yielded beneath the sonorous caress with which he enveloped them he knew his power so he lulled her with an endless string of words telling her all sorts of stupid stories when they quitted the table she was quite rosy trembling on his arm reconquered as the day was very fine she dismissed her carriage and accompanied him on foot as far as his lodging then naturally she went in with him two hours later she said as she was putting on her things again so mimi you want this marriage to come off? Well, he murmured, it's the best thing I can do. You know I'm quite stumped. After a short silence, she resumed. All right, I'm willing. I'll help you. You know she's as dry as a faggot. But never mind, as you're all agreeable. Oh, I'm obliging. I'll settle it for you. Then bursting out laughing, her bosom still uncovered, she added, Only what will you give me? He had seized hold of her and was kissing her shoulders in a transport of gratitude. She, very gay, quivering, struggled and threw herself back. Ah, I know, 
she exclaimed, excited by this play. Listen, this is what I must have for my commission. On your wedding day you must bring me the Hansel of your innocence, you understand? That's it, that's it, said he, laughing even more than she did. The bargain amused them. They thought it very funny. It so happened that on the morrow there was a dinner party at Nana's, that is, the usual Thursday gathering. Mifa, Vendeuvre, the two Hugon and Satin. The Count arrived early. He was in want of eighty thousand francs to rid the young woman of two or three debts, and to present her with a set of sapphires for which she had a great longing. As he had already eaten considerably into his fortune, he wished to meet with a money-lender not yet daring to sell a portion of his estates. So, by Nana's advice, he had applied to La Bordette, but the latter, considering it too big a matter for himself, had desired to speak of it to the hairdresser Francis, who was always willing to be useful to his customers. The Count placed himself in the hands of these gentlemen, merely requesting that his name should not be mentioned. They both agreed to keep his acceptance for one hundred thousand francs in their possession, and they excused themselves for the twenty thousand francs of interest by railing against the swindling usurers to whom, as they said, they had been forced to apply. When Mifa was ushered in, Francis was just finishing Nana's headdress. La Bordette was also in the dressing room, in his familiar fashion of a friend of no consequence. On seeing the count, he discreetly placed a heavy bundle of banknotes among the powders and the pomades, and the bill was accepted on a corner of the marble dressing table. Nana wished La Bordette to remain to dinner, but he declined, as he was showing a rich foreigner about Paris. However, Mifa having taken him on one side to beg him to go to Beggars, the jeweller, and bring him back the set of sapphires which he wished to have as a surprise for the young woman that very night, La Bordette willingly undertook the commission. Half an hour later, Julien privately handed the Count the case of jewels. During dinner, Nana was very nervous. The sight of the eighty thousand francs had upset her. To think that all that money was going to be paid away to tradespeople. It annoyed her immensely. As soon as the soup was served in that superb dining-room illuminated with the reflection of the silver plate and the crystal ware, she became sentimental and began to praise the joys of poverty. The men were in evening dress. She herself wore a dress of embroidered white satin, whilst satin, more modest and in black silk, had merely a golden heart, a present from her darling friend, at her throat. And behind the guests, Julien and François waited, assisted by Zoe, all three looking very dignified. I certainly amused myself a great deal more when I was without a sou, Nana kept repeating. She had Mifa on her right and Vendeuvre on her left, but she scarcely looked at them, being entirely occupied with satin enthroned in front of her between Philippe and Georges. Eh, hey, my love, she said at each phrase, didn't we used to laugh at that time, when we went to old Mother Josse's school in the Rue Polonceau? They were then serving the roast. The two women launched forth into recollections of their young days. They every now and then had a longing for gossip, a sudden desire to stir up all the mud of their youth, and it was invariably when men were present, as though yielding to a mania for making them acquainted with the dung-heap whence they sprouted. The gentleman turned pale and glanced about in an embarrassed manner. The two Hugon tried to laugh, whilst Vendeuvre nervously twirled his beard, and Mufa looked more solemn than ever. "'Do you remember Victor?' asked Nana. "'He was a depraved youngster. He used to take little girls into the cellars.' "'I remember,' replied Satin. And I remember, too, the big courtyard at your place. There was a doorkeeper with a broom. Mother Bush, she is dead. And I can still see your shop. Your mother was awfully stout. One night when we were playing, your father came home drunk. Oh, so drunk! At this moment, Vendeuvre essayed a diversion by interrupting the ladies in the midst of their reminiscences. I say, my dear, I should like some more truffles. They are excellent. I had some yesterday at the Duc de Corbreuse, which were not to be compared to these. Julien, hand the truffles, said Nana roughly. Then she resumed. Ah, oh, yes, Papa was very foolish. What a tumble-down! Ah, if you had only seen it! A regular plunge! Such misery! I can well say that I have tasted of all sorts, and it's a miracle I didn't leave my carcass there, the same as Papa and Mama. This time Mifa, who had been nervously playing with a knife, ventured to interfere. It is not a very amusing subject you are talking about. Eh, hey, what, not amusing? 
exclaimed she, crushing him with a look. I don't suppose it is amusing. You should have sent us some bread, my dear. Oh, as you know, I'm a true-hearted girl. I say what I think. Mamma was a washerwoman. Papa used to get drunk, and he died from it. There. If that doesn't suit you, if you're ashamed of my family. They all protested. What was she thinking of? They respected her family. But she continued. If you're ashamed of my family, well, leave me, for I'm not one of those women who disown their father and mother. You must take me with them. Do you hear? They took her. They accepted the father and the mother, the past, everything she wished. With their eyes fixed on the tablecloth, they all four now made themselves small, whilst she kept them beneath her muddy old shoes of the Rue de la Goutte d'Or with the passion of her all-powerful will. And she was slow to lay down her arms. They might bring her no end of fortunes, build her innumerable palaces, still she would ever regret the time when she used to chew apples with the peel on. It was a fraud, that idiotic money. It was only invented for tradespeople. Then her outburst ended in a sentimental longing for a simple way of living, with one's heart in one's hand, in the midst of an universal benevolence. But at that moment she caught sight of Julien standing with his arms hanging by his sides and doing nothing. Well, what? Pour out the champagne, said she. Why are you looking at me like a silly gander? During the row the servants had not even smiled. They seemed not to hear, becoming more majestic the more Madame forgot herself. Julien poured out the champagne without flinching. Unfortunately, François, who was handing round the fruit, held the dish too much on one side, and the apples, the pears, the grapes rolled all over the table. "'Stupid fool!' cried Nana. The footman made the mistake of trying to explain that the fruit was not placed securely on the dish. Zoe had disturbed it in removing some oranges." Then, said Nana, Zoe's a fool. But, madame, murmured the maid, very much hurt. At this, madame rose, and with a gesture of royal authority said curtly, That's enough, I think. Leave the room, all of you. We no longer require you. This execution calmed her. She at once became very quiet and very amiable. The dessert passed off most pleasantly, and gentlemen were greatly amused at having to help themselves. But Satin, who had peeled a pear, went to eat it standing up behind her darling, leaning against her shoulders, and whispering things in her ear which made them both laugh very much. Then she wished to share her last piece of pear, and held it out to Nana between her teeth, and their lips touched as they finished the fruit in a kiss. This produced a comical protest from the gentlemen. Philippe called to them not to stand on ceremony. Vendeuvre asked if they would like him to leave the room. Georges went and took hold of Satin round the waist and led her back to her seat. "'How silly you are,' said Nana. "'You make the little darling blush. "'Never mind, my love. "'Don't take any notice of them. "'That's our business.' And turning towards Mifa, who was looking on in his solemn way, she added, "'Isn't it, dear?' "'Yes, certainly,' murmured he, slowly nodding his head. There were no more protests. In the midst of these gentlemen, of these great names, these ancient integrities, the two women seated in front of each other, exchanging tender glances, imposed themselves, and reigned with the cool abuse of their sex and their avowed contempt for man. They applauded. The coffee was served upstairs in the parlour. Two lamps lighted up with their feeble light the rose-colour hangings, the lacquer and old gold knick-knacks. There was at this hour of the night, in the midst of the caskets, the bronzes, the china, a discreet glimmer which illumined the gold and ivory incrustations, shone on the gloss of some carved wand and watered a panel with a silky reflex. The afternoon fire had burnt low, it was very warm, a debilitating heat was confined by the heavy curtains and hangings. And in this room, all full of Nana's private life, where her gloves, a handkerchief, an open book lay scattered about, one met her free from all ceremony, with her odour of violets, her jolly girl kind of disorder, creating a charming effect amongst all that wealth. Whilst the easy chairs as big as beds and the sofas as deep as alcoves seemed to invite to somnolence, forgetful of the flight of time, to sweet words whispered in the shadows of their corners. Satin went and stretched herself out on a sofa near the fireplace. She lit a cigarette. But Vendeuvre amused himself with pretending to be awfully jealous of her, and threatened to challenge her if she again turned Nana from her duties. Philippe and Georges joined in, teased her, and pinched her so hard that she ended by crying out, "'Darling, darling, do make them leave off!' 
they're annoying me again come leave her alone said nana seriously you know i won't have her teased and you my dearie why do you always go with them when you know they are so foolish satin very red in the face and putting out her tongue went into the dressing-room the open door of which showed the pale marble lighted up by the subdued flame of a gas jet enclosed in a ground glass globe then nana conversed with the four men with the charm pertaining to the mistress of a household she had been reading during the day a novel that had created a great sensation the history of a courtesan and she was disgusted she said it was all false showing besides an indignant repugnance for such filthy literature which had the pretension of being true to nature as though one could describe everything as though a novel ought not to be written just to while away a pleasant hour regarding books and plays nana had very fixed opinions she wished for noble and tender works things to set her thinking and to elevate her soul then the conversation having turned on the troubles that were agitating paris on the incendiary newspaper articles the attempts at riot following the call to arms enunciated every night at public meetings she vented her wrath on the republicans whatever did they want those dirty fellows who never washed themselves wasn't every one happy hadn't the emperor done everything for the people a lot of swine these people she knew them she could speak of them and forgetting the respect she had just exacted at the dinner-table for her little world of the rue de la goutte d'or she assailed her relations and friends of bygone days with all the disgust and the horror of a woman arrived at the top of the tree it so happened that very afternoon she had read in the figaro the report of a public meeting written in a most comical style and the recollection of which still made her laugh on account of the slang words used and the description of a disgusting drunkard who had been turned out oh those drunkards said she with an air of repugnance no really now their republic would be a great misfortune for every one ah may god preserve the emperor as long as possible god will hear you my dear solemnly replied mifa but never fear the emperor is strong he liked to see that she had such good feelings they were both of the same opinion in politics vandeuvre and lieutenant hugon were also full of jokes about the roughs braying asses who bolted at the sight of a bayonet georges that night remained pale and gloomy what's the matter with the baby asked nana noticing how quiet he was nothing i'm listening murmured he but he was suffering on leaving the dining-room he had overheard philippe joking with the young woman and now it was philippe and not he who was seated beside her his chest heaved and seemed ready to burst without his knowing why he could not bear them to be together he had such wicked thoughts that a lump rose in his throat and he felt ashamed in spite of his anguish he who laughed about satin who had endured steiner then mifa then all the others revolted and became enraged at the idea that philippe might one day become that woman's lover here take bijou said she to console him passing him the little dog which was sleeping on her lap and georges became quite lively again holding something belonging to her that animal full of the warmth of her knees the conversation had fallen on a run of bad luck vandeuvre had had the night before at the cercle impérial mifa who was no player expressed his surprise but vandeuvre smiling alluded to his approaching ruin of which paris already had begun to talk it did not matter much how the end came the thing was to end well for some time past nana had noticed he was nervous with wrinkles at the corners of his mouth and a vacillating look in his bright eyes he retained his aristocratic haughtiness the refined elegance of his impoverished race and as yet it was only a slight vertigo at times beneath that cranium emptied by women and play one night that he passed with her he had frightened her with some atrocious idea he was thinking of shutting himself up in his stable with his horses and setting fire to the place when he had reached the end of his tether at this time his only hope was in a horse named lusignan which was in training for the grand prize of paris he lived on this horse which sustained his damaged credit every time nana wanted money he put her off till the month of june if lusignan won bah said she jokingly he can afford to lose as he is going to clear out every one at the races he merely replied with a mysterious little smile then added lightly by the way i have taken the liberty of naming a filly of mine only an outsider after you 
Nana, Nana, it sounds very well. You are not annoyed. Annoyed? Why? said she, in reality greatly delighted. The conversation continued. They were talking of an execution shortly to take place, and which the young woman wanted to see, when Satin appeared at the dressing-room door and called Nana in a supplicating voice. The latter rose at once and left the gentlemen who were taking their ease, puffing their cigars, and discussing a very grave question, as to how far a murderer in a chronic state of alcoholism is responsible for his actions. In the dressing-room, Zoe was seated on a chair, crying bitterly, whilst Satin was vainly endeavouring to console her. "'What's the matter?' asked Nana in surprise. "'Oh, darling, speak to her,' said Satin. "'For the last twenty minutes I've been trying to reason with her. She's crying because you called her a fool.' "'Yes, madame. It's very hard. It's very hard,' stuttered Zoe, almost choked by a fresh fit of sobbing. This sight moved the young woman. She said some kind words and as the other did not become calmer, she sat down before her and put her arm round her waist with a gesture of affectionate familiarity. "'But, you silly girl, I said fool just the same as I should have said something else. I didn't mean it. I was in a passion. There, I was wrong. Now do leave off crying.' "'I love Madame so much,' stammered Zoe. "'After all that I have done for Madame.' Then Nana kissed the maid after which wishing to show that she was not angry she gave her a dress that she had worn only three times their quarrels always ended in presence zoe wiped her eyes with her handkerchief and before carrying the dress off on her arm she said that they were all very sad down in the kitchen that julien and francois had not been able to eat any dinner as madame's anger had taken away all their appetite and madame sent them a louis as a pledge of reconciliation she could not bear to see any one unhappy Nana returned to the drawing-room, happy at having put an end to the tiff which was causing her some anxiety for the morrow, when Satin whispered quickly in her ear. She complained, she threatened to go away, if those men teased her again, and she insisted on her darling sending them all off that night. It would be a lesson for them, and then it would be so nice to be alone together. Nana, again becoming anxious, swore that it was not possible. Then the other spoke harshly to her, like a passionate child insisting on having her own way. "'I insist on it, do you hear? Send them away, or else I'll go.' And she returned into the drawing-room and lay down on a sofa, away from the others and near a window, where she remained quite silent and as though dead, waiting with her large eyes fixed on Nana. The gentlemen were drawing their conclusions against the new theories of the writers on criminal law with that wonderful proposition as to irresponsibility in certain pathological cases there threatened to be no more criminals but only invalids the young woman who kept nodding her approval was trying to think of a means of getting rid of the count the others would soon be going but he would be sure to remain behind and so it happened when philippe rose to leave georges followed him at once his only anxiety was not to leave his brother behind him vandeuvre remained a few minutes longer he sounded the ground. He waited to see if by chance some matter did not oblige Mifa to leave him in possession, but when he saw him evidently making himself comfortable for the rest of the evening, he did not persist, but took his leave like a man of tact. But as he moved towards the door, he noticed Satin with her fixed look, and understanding no doubt and rather amused, he went and shook her hand. "'Well, we're not angry, are we?' murmured he. "'Forgive me. On my word, you're the best of us after all.' satin disdained to reply she did not take her eyes off nana and the count who were now left to themselves being no longer under any restraint miva had gone and seated himself beside the young woman and had taken hold of her fingers which he was kissing then she to create a diversion asked him if his daughter estelle was better the night before he had complained that the child seemed very melancholy he could never spend a happy day in his own home with his wife always out and his daughter wrapped up in an icy silence Nana was always full of good advice respecting these family matters. And as Mufa, his mind and his body upset, began again giving way to his lamentations, "'Why don't you get her married?' asked she, recollecting her promise. And she at once ventured to speak of Dagonet. But at the mention of the name the Count showed his disgust. Never, after what she had told him. She pretended to be greatly surprised, then burst out laughing and putting her arms round his neck said, oh how can you be so jealous do be reasonable 
he had been talking to you against me and i was furious to-day i am really sorry but over mifa's shoulder she encountered satin's fixed gaze feeling uneasy she let go of him and continued in a serious tone my friend this marriage must take place i don't wish to prevent your daughter's happiness he's really a very nice young man you couldn't find a better one and she launched forth into unbounded praise of dagonet the count had taken hold of her hands again he no longer said no he would see they could talk of it another time then as he spoke of going to bed she lowered her voice and made objections it was impossible she was not well if he loved her a little he would not insist however he was obstinate he would not leave and she was already giving in when she again encountered satin's fixed look then she became inflexible no it could not be the count much affected and looking far from well had risen and was seeking his hat but at the door he recollected the set of sapphires the case containing which he felt in his pocket he had intended hiding it at the bottom of the bed so that her legs might come in contact with it when she first got in it was a big child's surprise which he had been planning ever since dinner and in his confusion in his anguish at being thus dismissed he abruptly handed her the jewels what is it asked she why sapphires ah yes that set we saw how kind of you but i say darling do you think it's the same one it looked better in the window those were all the thanks he had she let him go he had just caught sight of satin waiting in silence on the sofa then he looked at the two women and no longer persisting he submissively went off the house door was scarcely closed when satin seized hold of nana round the waist and danced and sang then running to the window she exclaimed let's see what a fool he looks outside in the shadow of the curtains the two women leant on the iron rail one o'clock struck the avenue de villiers now deserted stretched far in the distance with its double row of gas lamps in the midst of that damp darkness of march swept by great gusts of wind full of rain patches of unoccupied ground appeared as masses of shadow houses in course of construction displayed their tall scaffoldings beneath the black sky and a mad fit of laughter seized the two girls as they caught sight of mifa's round back moving along the wet pavement with the mournful reflection of his shadow across that icy empty plain of a new paris but nana made satin leave off take care the police then they smothered their laughter watching with a dumb fear two black figures walking in step on the other side of the avenue nana in all her luxury in her royalty of a woman whom every one obeyed had preserved a dread of the police not liking to hear them spoken of any more than she did death she felt uneasy whenever she saw a policeman look up at her house one never knew what to expect from such people they might very well take them for some low gay women if they heard them laughing at that time of the night satin tremblingly pressed close up against nana yet they remained there interested by the approach of a light dancing in the midst of the puddles on the pavement it was the lantern of an old female rag-picker who was searching the gutters satin recognized her why said she it's queen pomare with her wicker cashmere and whilst the wind beat the fine rain in their faces she told her darling queen pomare's history oh she was a superb woman once and drove all paris mad with her beauty she had such go such cheek used the men like animals and often had grand personages weeping on her stairs now she had taken to drink the women of the neighbourhood amused themselves by giving her absinthe and in the streets the urchins followed her throwing stones in short a regular smash-up a queen fallen into the mire nana listened feeling very cold you'll just see added satin she whistled like a man the rag-picker who was under the window raised her head and showed herself in the yellow light of her lantern there appeared in that bundle of rags beneath a big handkerchief in tatters a scarred bluish face with the toothless aperture of the mouth and the flaming loopholes of the eyes and nana in front of this frightful old age of a courtesan drowned in alcohol beheld in the darkness the vision of chamon that irma d'anglars the retired prostitute loaded with years and with honours ascending the steps of her chateau surrounded by a prostrate crowd of villagers then as satin whistled again amused at the old hag who could not see her she murmured in an altered tone of voice leave off 
the police again let's go away quick my darling the sound of footsteps returned they closed the window on turning round nana shivering with her hair all wet on beholding the room remained as it were struck with astonishment as though she had never seen it before and had entered some unknown place she found the atmosphere so warm so perfumed that she experienced a pleasant surprise the wealth piled up around the ancient furniture the gold and silk stuffs the ivory the bronzes all seemed reposing in the rosy light of the lamps whilst from the now hushed house there arose the sensation of a great luxury the solemnity of the grand drawing-room the comfortable amplitude of the dining-room the peacefulness of the vast staircase with the softness of the seats and carpets it was like an abrupt expansion of herself of her requirements of domination and enjoyment of her wish to possess everything merely to destroy it never before had she felt so strongly the power of her sex she glanced slowly around her and then said with an air of grave philosophy well all the same one is right in availing oneself of every opportunity when one is young but satin was already rolling about on the bearskins of the bedroom and calling her come quick come quick nana undressed herself in the dressing-room to be ready quicker she took her thick light hair in both hands and shook it over the silver basin whilst a shower of long hairpins fell from it ringing a chime on the shining metal End of chapter ten chapter eleven part one of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven part one on that sunday beneath the cloudy sky of one of the first warm days of june the race for the grand prize of paris was to be run in the bois de boulogne in the morning the sun had risen enveloped in a reddish mist but towards eleven o'clock at the moment when the first vehicles reached the longchamp racecourse a wind from the south swept the clouds before it long flakes of greyish vapour passed slowly away whilst patches of dark blue sky gradually showed larger and larger from one end of the horizon to the other and in the bursts of sunshine which kept appearing through the breaks in the clouds everything sparkled abruptly the green turf which was little by little being covered by a crowd of vehicles and of persons on horseback and on foot the course still free with the judges stand the winning post and the starting place then opposite in the middle of the enclosure the five symmetrical stands with their stories of brick and wood bathed in the midday light the vast plain extended beyond bordered by little trees and confined in the west by the wooded hills of st cloud and Suresnes, which were crowned by the sharp outline of mont valerien nana as excited as if the race for the grand prize was to decide her own fortune wished to have a place as near as possible to the winning post she arrived very early one of the first in her silver-mounted landau to which were harnessed four magnificent white horses a present from count Mifa when she appeared with two postilions on the near-side horses and two grooms seated immovably behind the carriage there was quite a rush on the part of the crowd the same as at the passage of a queen she wore the colours of the vendeuvre stable blue and white intermingled in a most extraordinary costume the little body and the tunic in blue silk were very tight-fitting and raised behind in an enormous puff which gave all the more prominence to the tightness in front the skirt and sleeves were in white satin as well as a sash that passed over the shoulder and the whole was trimmed with silver braid which sparkled in the sunshine whilst the more to resemble a jockey she had placed a flat blue cap ornamented with a feather on the top of her chignon from which a long switch of her golden hair hung down the middle of her back like an enormous yellow tail twelve o'clock struck there were still three hours to wait for the race for the grand prize as soon as the landau had taken up its position nana put herself at ease as though at home she had amused herself by bringing bijou and little louis the dog asleep amongst her skirts was shivering in spite of the heat whilst the child dressed up in ribbons and lace remained as though dumb and had become so pale from the force of the wind that he looked like a wax figure the young woman without troubling herself about her neighbours talked very loud with philippe and jean jugon seated opposite to her amid such a pile of bouquets white roses and blue forget-me-nots that they were invisible below the shoulders so she was saying as he was becoming quite unbearable i showed him the door and for the last two days he hasn't been near me she was speaking of mifa only she did not tell the two young men the real cause of the quarrel 
one night he had found a man's hat in her room it had merely been a stupid fancy of hers a mere nobody she had picked up just to enliven her you don't know how peculiar he's becoming she continued amused at the details she was giving he's a regular bigot for instance he says his prayers every night oh it's quite true he thinks i don't notice it as i go to bed first so as not to be in his way but i have my eye on him he mutters he makes the sign of the cross as he turns round to step over me to get to the inside of the bed how artful murmured philippe does he do it before and after them she laughed aloud yes that's it before and after when i doze off i can hear him muttering again but what annoys me is that we can't have the least dispute without his immediately talking of the priests now i've always been religious oh laugh as much as you like it won't prevent me believing what i believe only he's too bad he sobs he talks of his remorse for instance the day before yesterday after our row he had quite an attack i began to feel very anxious but she interrupted herself to say look there are the mignons why they've brought the children aren't they dressed up those youngsters the mignons were in a very quiet coloured landau with the substantial air of people who had made their fortune rose in a grey silk dress trimmed with little cerise puffs and bows was smiling pleased at the evident delight of henri and charles sitting on the front seat in their rather too ample collegian uniforms but when the landau had taken up its position and she caught sight of nana triumphing in the midst of her bouquets with her four horses her postilions and her grooms in livery she bit her lips and sitting bolt upright turned away her head mignot on the contrary looking very well and lively waved his hand it was one of his principles always to keep out of women's quarrels by the way resumed nana do you know a little old fellow very tidy in his appearance and with very bad teeth a monsieur venot he called on me this morning monsieur venot echoed georges in amazement it can't be he's a jesuit precisely i soon found that out oh you've no idea what we talked about it was so funny he spoke of the count and of his disunited family the happiness of which he implored me to restore he was very polite too and smiling all the time then i told him i should be only too pleased to do as he wished and in the end i promised to make the count return to his wife you know it's not a joke for i shall be delighted to see the whole lot of them happy besides it will give me a rest for there are days when he is really too tiresome her weariness of the last few months escaped her in that cry from her heart with all that too the count appeared to be in great straits for money he was careworn the bill he had given to la bordette was coming due and he did not see his way to meet it why there is the countess over there said georges who had been glancing along the stands where exclaimed nana what eyes he has that baby hold my parasol philippe but georges with a quick movement forestalled his brother and was quite delighted at holding the blue silk parasol with silver fringe nana looked through an enormous field-glass ah yes i see her said she at length in the stand to the right close to a pillar is she not she is in mauve with her daughter in white beside her why there's dagonet going up to them then philippe talked of dagonet's approaching marriage with that stick estelle it was a settled thing they were publishing the bands the countess objected at first but the count so it was said had insisted nana smiled i know i know murmured she so much the better paul he's a nice fellow he deserves it and leaning towards little louis she added well are you amusing yourself how serious the child looks the child without a smile watched the crowd about him looking very old and as though full of sad reflections on what he saw bijou driven from the skirts of the young woman who was always moving about had gone to shiver against the little one the space around was rapidly filling up vehicles of all sorts continuously arrived in a compact interminable line there were enormous omnibuses like the pauline which had started from the boulevard des italiens with its fifty passengers and which took up a position near the stands then there were dog-carts victorias and most elegant landaus which mingled with old tumble-down cabs dragged by the most wretched horses and foreign hands and stage-coaches with their owners seated on the top and the servants inside taking care of the hampers of champagne and light-traps of every description 
some driven tandem fashion and accompanied by a jingling of bells now and again a gentleman on horseback passed or a crowd of persons on foot rushed in amongst the vehicles the rumbling noise which accompanied the latter all along the winding turnings of the bois de boulogne ceased as they drove on to the grass nothing was heard but the murmur of the ever-increasing crowd shouts and calls and cracking of whips which resounded in the open air and each time the sun appeared from out the clouds scattered by the wind a blaze of golden light lit up the mounted harnesses and the varnished panels and brought out the brilliant colours of the costumes whilst in that flood of sunshine the coachmen on their high seats were conspicuous with their long whips la bordette was alighting from an open carriage in which gaga clarisse and blanche de sivry had reserved him a place as he was hastening to cross the course and enter the enclosure nana got georges to call him then when he came up what's my price she asked with a laugh she was speaking of nana the filly that nana which had been ignominiously defeated in the race for the diana prize and which even in the months just past april and may had not even placed in the races for the Descartes prize and the grande poule des produits both of which had fallen to lusignan the other thoroughbred of the vendeuvre stable lusignan had at once become chief favourite and had latterly been freely taken at two to one still at fifty replied la bordette the devil then i'm not worth much resumed nana who was amused at the joke then i shan't back myself no i'll be hanged if i do i won't put a single louis on myself la bordette who was in a great hurry was starting off again but she called him back she wanted a piece of advice he knew a number of trainers and jockeys had the best information respecting the different stables twenty times already his tips had come off he was nicknamed the king of the sporting prophets come now which horses ought i to back asked the young woman at what price is the english one spirit at three to one valerio too also at three to one then the others cosinus at twenty-five hazard at forty boom at thirty pichonette at thirty-five frangipan at ten no i won't back the english horse i'm patriotic well what do you say shall it be valerio too the duc de corbreuse looked quite beaming just now well no i'd rather not fifty louis on lusignan what do you say la bordette looked at her in a peculiar manner she leant forward and questioned him in a low voice for she knew that vendeuvre instructed him to bet for him with the bookmakers so as to be more free in his own betting if he had learnt anything he might as well tell her but la bordette without explaining why advised her to trust to his instinct he would lay out her fifty louis as he thought best and she should not regret it all the horses you like she cried gaily as he went off but not nana she's a jade they all laughed madly in the carriage the young men thought it very funny whilst little louis not understanding raised his pale eyes to his mother the loud accents of whose voice surprised him la bordette however was still unable to get off rose mignon had beckoned him and she gave him some instructions which he wrote down in his notebook then clarisse and gaga called him back as they wished to modify their bets they had heard different things in the crowd and would no longer back valerio too but went in for lusignan he quite impassable made notes of what they required at length he got away and was seen to disappear between two of the stands on the other side of the course carriages still continued to arrive they now comprised five rows along the barrier bordering the course and formed quite a dense mass streaked here and there by the light hue of the white horses then beyond there were numerous other isolated vehicles looking as though they had stuck in the grass a medley of wheels and of teams in every possible position side by side slantwise crosswise and head to head and horsemen trotted across the plots of grass that were still comparatively free whilst foot passengers appeared in black groups continually on the move overtopping this kind of fair ground amidst the strangely mixed crowd rose the grey refreshment tents to which the sunshine imparted a white appearance but the greatest crush an ever-moving sea of hats was around the bookmakers who were standing up in open vehicles gesticulating like quack dentists with their betting lists stuck up on boards beside them all the same it's awfully stupid not to know what horse wants backing nana was saying i must venture a few louis myself she stood up to select a bookmaker whose face should take her fancy but she forgot her intention as she caught sight of a crowd of acquaintances around her 
besides the mignons and gaga and clarisse and blanche there were on the right and the left and behind in the midst of the mass of vehicles which had now quite shut in her landau tetan Nene with maria blonde in a victoria caroline Equet with her mother and two gentlemen in a calash louise violaine all alone and driving a little basket chaise bedecked with orange and green ribbons the colour of the Méchain stable lea de horn on the box seat of a stage-coach with a crowd of young men who were making a great noise farther off lucy stewart in a very simple black silk dress was looking most distinguished beside a young man wearing the uniform of a midshipman in a carriage of most aristocratic appearance but what really astounded nana was to see simone arrive in a trap that steiner was driving tandem fashion with a tiger sitting bolt upright behind his arms folded and quite immovable she was resplendent all in white satin striped with yellow and sparkling with diamonds from her waist to her bonnet whilst the banker with a long whip urged on the two horses the first a little chestnut which trotted like a mouse and the other a tall bay a stepper which raised its legs very high by jove said nana that old thief steiner must have made another haul at the bourse doesn't simon look smart it's too much he'll get copped one of these days but all the same she exchanged a bow with them from a distance she kept waving her hand smiling and turning about forgetting no one so as to be seen by all and she continued talking but it's her son that lucy is dragging about with her he looks very nice in his uniform that's why she's trying to be so grand you know that she's afraid of him and pretend she's an actress poor young man all the same he doesn't seem to have an idea of the truth Pooh murmured philippe laughing whenever she chooses she will find him a country heiress nana left off talking she had just caught sight of old tricon in the thick of the vehicles having come in a cab from which she could see nothing the old lady had quietly mounted the driver's seat and there standing up to the full height of her tall figure with her noble-looking face and long curls she commanded a full view of the crowd and seemed to be reigning over her women people they all discreetly smiled to her she as a superior being pretended not to know them she was not there to work she came to see the races for pleasure for she was an inveterate gambler and was mad about horses look there's that idiot la Faloise, said georges suddenly it was a surprise to all of them nana no longer recognized her la Faloise. since he had inherited his uncle's fortune he had become an extraordinarily fashionable young man with his collar slightly turned down in front dressed in a light-coloured suit which fitted tightly to his bony shoulders and with his hair curled he affected a jog-trot of weariness a feeble tone of voice slang words and phrases which he never took the trouble to finish but he looks very well declared nana fascinated gaga and clarisse called la Faloise, throwing themselves at his head so to say trying to hook him again but he left them at once with an air of pity mingled with disdain nana attracted him and hastening to her he stood on the step of the carriage and as she chaffed him about gaga he murmured oh no no more of the old guard it's no use their trying besides you know you're now my juliet he placed his hand on his heart nana laughed immensely at that abrupt declaration before every one but she resumed there that'll do you're making me forget that i want to bet Georges, you see that bookmaker over there the fat red one with curly hair he has the head of a dirty rascal which takes my fancy you go and bet with him well what shall i back i'm no patriot oh no stuttered la Faloise. all my money is on the english horse what a lark if he wins all the french will go mad nana thought his language disgraceful then they discussed the merits of the different horses la Faloise, to make every one think that he was a judge of horse-flesh pretended they were all sorry animals baron verdier's frangipane was by truth out of lenore it was a big bay and might have had a chance if it had not been lamed during training as for valerio too from the corbreuse stable it was not in condition it had had the gripes in april oh they were keeping that dark but he was sure of it on his word of honour and he ended by recommending azar a horse belonging to the Michin stable the worst beast of the lot and which no one would look at the deuce as ah showed superb form and such a style there was an animal that would surprise every one no said nana 
I shall bet ten louis on Lusignan and five on Boom. On hearing this, La Faloise burst out again. But, my dear, Boom is simply awful. Don't back him. Even Gask, the owner, won't. And Lusignan, he's not in it. All rubbish. By Lamb out of Princess. Just think of it. Not the ghost of a chance for anything by Lamb out of Princess. All too short in the legs. He was almost choking. Philippe observed that notwithstanding all that, Lusignan had carried off the Décor prize and the Grande Poule des Produits. But the other was ready for him. What did that prove? Nothing at all. On the contrary, they should beware. And besides, Gresham was to ride Lusignan, so what was the use of arguing? Gresham had no luck. He never won. And the discussion, which started from Nana's Landau, seemed to spread from one end of the race ground to the other. Screeching voices were heard. The passion for gambling passed over all, giving a flush to the faces and putting confusion into the gestures, whilst the bookmakers were furiously calling out the prices and inscribing the bets made. Only the small fry of the betting fraternity were there. The big bets were being made inside the enclosure. It was the greediness of the smaller gamblers risking their five francs, displaying their eagerness for a possible gain of a few louis. In short, the big battle was expected to be between Spirit and Lusignan. Some Englishmen, easily recognizable by their appearance, were walking about amongst the different groups as though at home with flushed faces and already triumphing. Brahma, a horse of Lord Redding, had won the grand prize the previous year, a defeat for which all French hearts were still bleeding. This year it would be a regular disaster if France was beaten again, so that all the women were dreadfully excited on account of national pride. The Vendeuvre stable became the rampart of the honor of France. They all backed to Lusignan, they upheld him, they cheered him to the echo. Gaga, Blanche, Caroline, and the others all put their money on him. Lucy did not do so because her son was with her, but it was said that Rose Mignon had commissioned La Bordette to back him to the extent of two hundred louis. Only old Tricon, seated beside her driver, awaited the last moment, very cool in the midst of the wrangling predominating over the increasing uproar in which the names of the different horses were continually repeated in the sprightly remarks of the parisians and the guttural exclamations of the englishmen she listened and took notes in a majestic manner and nana said georges is no one backing her no no one was backing her she was not even mentioned the outsider of the vendeuvre stable was eclipsed by lusignan's popularity but la faloise raised his arms in the air and exclaimed an inspiration i shall put a louis on nana bravo i'll put two said georges and i three added philippe and they kept increasing their amount pleasantly paying their court quoting figures as though they were bidding for nana at an auction la faloise talked of covering her with gold besides every one ought to back her for something they would go and canvass among those willing to bet but as the three young men hastened off to carry out their design nana called to them remember i'll have nothing to do with her not on any account georges ten louis on lusignan and five on valerio too they rushed away she greatly amused watched them glide amongst the wheels stoop beneath the horses heads and beat all about the place as soon as they recognized any one in a carriage they hurried to them and lauded the filly to the skies and great bursts of laughter passed over the crowd as now and again they looked back and triumphantly held up their fingers to show the number of louis that had been bet whilst the young woman standing up in her carriage waved her parasol however they did not meet with much success a few men allowed themselves to be persuaded steiner for instance who felt strangely moved at the sight of nana risked three louis but the women almost emphatically refused. Thank you, they did not want a certain loss. Besides, they were not in a hurry to add to the success of a beast of a girl who put them all in the shade with her four white horses, her postilions, and her air of devouring every one. Gaga and Clarisse stiffly asked La Faloise if he thought them a couple of fools. When Georges boldly presented himself at the Mignon's carriage, Rose, highly incensed, turned away her head without answering. One must be a dirty baggage to allow one's name to be given to a horse. Mignot, on the contrary, followed the young man, looking greatly amused, and saying that women always brought luck. Well, asked Nana when the young men returned after a long visit to the bookmakers, you're at forty, 
said La Faloise. How at forty? cried she in amazement. I was at fifty. What has happened? La Bourdette just then returned. They were clearing the course, and the ringing of a bell announced the first race. And in the uproar that this occasioned, she questioned him respecting the sudden rise in price, but he answered evasively. No doubt there had been a few inquiries about the filly. She was obliged to be contented with that explanation. Besides, La Bordette, who appeared to have something on his mind, told her that Vendeuvre intended coming if he could possibly get away for a time. The race ended almost unnoticed in the waiting for the big event, when a cloud burst over the course. For some little while the sun had disappeared, and a dull light darkened the crowd. The wind rose, and the rain came down, first in big drops and then in torrents. There was a momentary confusion. Shouts and jokes and oaths were heard on all sides, whilst the people on foot scrambled under cover in the refreshment tents. In the carriages the women tried to shelter themselves, holding their parasols with both hands, and the bewildered footmen hastened to raise the hoods. But the shower ceased almost immediately. The sun reappeared with dazzling splendor, shining amidst the last fine drops of rain. A long strip of blue appeared in the place of the cloud as the wind carried it over the bois and the sky became quite bright, raising the laughter of the women who no longer feared for their elegant costumes, whilst the flood of golden sunshine in the midst of the snorting of the horses and the helter-skelter and agitation of the soaked crowd shaking off the wet lit up the ground all sparkling with drops of crystal. "'Oh, poor little Louis,' said Nana. "'Are you very wet, my cherub?' The child, without a word, let her wipe his hands with her pocket-handkerchief. She then wiped Bijou, who was trembling more than ever. It was nothing, only a few spots on the white satin of her dress, but she didn't care. The bouquets, freshened up, glittered like snow. And she, feeling so happy, smelt one of them, wetting her lips as though in dew. The shower, however, had had the effect of suddenly filling the stands. Nana looked at them through her field-glass. At that distance one could only distinguish a compact and mixed mass piled up on the different tiers, a dark background broken by the pale faces. The sun filtered in through the corners of the roof, curtailing the seated crowd with angles of light and giving a washed-out appearance to the costumes of the women. But Nana was most amused by the ladies whom the shower had driven from the rows of chairs placed on the gravel at the foot of the stands. As admission to the enclosure was rigorously denied to all gay women, Nana made the most spiteful remarks about the respectable members of her sex, who she considered were shockingly badly dressed and looked highly ridiculous. A murmur ran through the crowd. The empress was entering the little stand in the centre, a pavilion in the form of a Swiss cottage, the large balcony of which was furnished with red armchairs. "'Why, there he is,' said Georges. "'I did not think he was on duty this week.' Count Mifa's stiff, solemn figure had appeared behind the empress. Then the young men began to joke, regretting Satin was not there to go and give him a knock in the stomach. But Nana, looking through her field-glass, caught sight of the head of the Prince of Scotland in the imperial stand. "'Look, there's Charles!' she cried. She thought he was fatter. In eighteen months he seemed to have become broader, and she gave some details. Oh, he was a devilish strong fellow! Round about her, the other women in their carriages were whispering that the Count had given her up. It was quite a story. The Tuileries had become scandalized at the Chamberlain's behavior since he had been going about with her openly, so to preserve his place, he had put an end to his connection with her. La Faloise impudently repeated the story to the young woman, again offering himself and calling her his Juliet. But she had a hearty laugh and said, It's absurd. You don't know him. I've only to whistle to him, and he'll throw everything up for me. For a few minutes she had been watching Countess Sabine and Estelle. Degenet was still with them. Faucherie, who had just arrived, disturbed everyone in order to get to them, and he also remained there smiling. Then she continued, disdainfully pointing to the stands. Besides, you know all those people no longer amaze me. I know them too well. You should see them with the gloss off. No more respect. Respect is done with. Filth below, filth up above. It's always filth and company. That's why I won't put up with any nonsense. And she made an extended gesture which included all, from the grooms leading the horses on to the course to the sovereign herself, who was conversing with Charles, a prince but a dirty fellow all the same. 
bravo nana she's capital nana exclaimed la valoise enthusiastically the sounds of the bell were lost in the wind the races continued the race for the Isparon prize had just been won by berlingot a horse belonging to the michin stable nana called to la bordette to ask him for news of her fifty louis he laughed and refused to tell her which horses he had backed so as not to change the luck he said her money was well invested as she would see by and by and as she told him of her two bets ten louis on lusignan and five on valerio too he shrugged his shoulders with an air of saying that women would make fools of themselves in spite of everything this surprised her a great deal she could no longer understand anything at this moment the animation increased around luncheons were spread in the open air to help to pass the time until the race for the grand prize was run every one ate and drank still more anywhere on the grass on the high seats of the stage-coaches and the drags in the victorias the broughams and the landaus there was a general spread of cold meats and unpacking of hampers of champagne which the footmen brought from under box seats the corks flew out with feeble detonations which were carried away by the wind jokes were bandied about the sound of breaking glasses introduced cracked notes into the nervous gaiety Gaga and clarisse were making quite a meal with blanche devouring sandwiches on a cloth which they had spread over their knees louise violaine had alighted from her basket chaise and joined caroline Quay and on the grass at their feet some gentlemen had set up an imitation bar where tatan maria simone and the others came to drink whilst close by up aloft there was quite a band on a stage-coach with lea de horn all emptying bottles as fast as they could and getting quite tipsy in the sunshine shouting and gesticulating above the crowd but soon every one pressed round nana's landau she was standing up filling glasses of champagne for the men who came to shake hands with her one of the footmen francois handed up the bottle whilst la Faloise, imitating the voice of a mountebank called out walk up gentlemen it's all for nothing there's some for every one do be quiet my dear fellow nana ended by saying we look like a lot of buffoons she thought him very funny however and was immensely amused one moment she had the idea of sending georges with a glass of champagne to rose mignon who pretended she did not drink henri and charles looked bored to death the youngsters would have liked some champagne but georges being afraid of a row drank the wine himself then nana recollected little louis whom she had forgotten behind her perhaps he was thirsty and she got him to take a few drops of wine which made him cough frightfully walk up walk up gentlemen repeated la valoise it doesn't cost two sous it doesn't cost one sou we give it for nothing but nana interrupted him exclaiming look there's bordenave over there call him oh please run and fetch him it was indeed bordenave who was walking about with his hands behind his back and a hat that looked rusty in the sunshine and a greasy frock-coat all whitened at the seams a bordenave disfigured by bankruptcy but still as furious as ever displaying his misery amongst the world of fashion with the cheek of a man ever ready to violate fortune the devil what style said he when nana like the good-natured girl she was held out her hand to him then after tossing off a glass of champagne he uttered this remark full of deep regret ah uh, if i was only a woman but damn it all it doesn't matter will you return to the stage i've an idea i'll take the gaiety theatre and between us we will carry paris by storm what do you say you at least owe me that and he remained standing grumbling to himself though happy at seeing her again for as he said that confounded nana was balm to his heart merely by living before him she was his daughter his very blood the circle increased now la faloise was pouring out whilst philippe and georges went in search of more friends slowly but surely every one was attracted to the spot nana had a laugh and a witty remark for every one the different bands of drinkers drew nearer all the champagne scattered about came towards her there was soon but one crowd but one uproar around her landau and she reigned among the glasses held towards her with her yellow hair flying in the breeze and her snow-white face bathed with sunshine then to crown all and to finally settle the other women who were enraged at her triumph she filled her glass and raised it on high in her old posture of venus victorious 
but someone was touching her on the back and on turning round she was surprised to see mignon on the seat she disappeared for a moment and seated herself beside him for he had something important to say to her mignon was in the habit of saying everywhere that his wife was ridiculous to have a grudge against nana he considered it stupid and useless this is what's the matter my dear murmured he be careful not to make rose too wild you understand i prefer to put you on your guard yes she has a weapon and as she has never forgiven you the little duchess affair a weapon interrupted nana what the deuce do i care listen it's a letter that she must have found in faucherie's pocket a letter written to that wretch faucherie by countess sabine and on my word it's all there in black and white so rose intends to send the letter to the count to be avenged on you and him what the deuce do i care repeated nana it's awfully funny though ah it's so true about faucherie well so much the better she annoyed me immensely what a joke it'll be but no i don't want it to be done hastily resumed mignon it would make such a scandal besides it would be of no use to us he stopped afraid of saying too much she exclaimed that she was certainly not going to pull a respectable woman out of the mire but as he persisted she looked him full in the face no doubt he was afraid of seeing faucherie back in his family circle if the countess were exposed that was just what rose wished at the same time desiring vengeance for she still entertained a tender feeling for the journalist and nana became thoughtful she was thinking of Monsieur Venot's visit and was forming a plan whilst Mignon was trying to convince her. Well, suppose Rose sends the letter. There'll be a great scandal, won't there? You will be mixed up in it. Everyone will say it's your fault. Then the Count will at once separate from his wife. Why so? asked she. On the contrary. But in her turn she interrupted herself. There was no need for her to think out aloud. At last she pretended to enter into Mignon's views so as to get rid of him, and as he advised her to give in a bit to Rose, to pay her a little visit, for instance, there before everyone, she replied that she would see, that she would think about it. A sudden uproar caused her to stand up again. On the course some horses passed like a flash of lightning. It was the race for the City of Paris prize which fell to Cornemuse. Now the race for the grand prize was about to be run the fever increased anxiety seized on the crowd which stamped and swayed in an endeavour to make the time pass more quickly and at that last moment a surprise bewildered the betting men the continual rise in the price of nana the outsider of the vendeuvre stable gentlemen returned every minute with a fresh quotation nana was at thirty nana was at twenty-five then at twenty then at fifteen no one understood what it meant a filly beaten on every race course a filly which that very morning could not find a backer at fifty what could be the meaning of that sudden craze some laughed and talked of the clean sweep made of all those idiots who were allowing themselves to be taken in others serious and anxious were sure there was something up all sorts of stories were recalled of the robberies countenanced on the race course but this time the great name of vendeuvre silenced all accusations and the sceptics found most believers when they prophesied that nana would come in a good last who rides nana asked la Faloise. just then the real nana reappeared then the gentleman bursting into exaggerated laughter gave an indecent meaning to the question nana bowed its price she replied and the discussion recommenced price was an english celebrity unknown in france why had vendeuvre engaged this jockey when gresham generally rode nana besides every one was surprised to see him trust lusignan to that gresham who as la Faloise said never came in first but all these remarks were lost in the jokes and the contradictions and the extraordinary hubbub of various opinions to pass the time every one returned to the bottles of champagne then a whisper passed round the groups made way and vendeuvre appeared nana pretended to be cross well you're nice not to come till this time i who've been longing to see the enclosure come then said he there is still time you can have a look round i just happen to have a lady's ticket 
and he led her off on his arm she delighted at seeing the jealous looks with which lucy caroline and the other women watched her the two hugon and la faloise remaining in the landau continued to do the honours of her champagne she called to them that she would be back directly but vendeuvre having caught sight of la bordette beckoned to him and a few brief words passed between them have you picked up everything yes for how much fifteen hundred louis a little everywhere as nana full of curiosity was listening they said no more vendeuvre was very nervous and his clear eyes seemed lighted up with little flames of fire the same as on the night when he frightened her by talking of burning himself in his stable with his horses as they crossed the course she lowered her voice and said i say just tell me this why has the price of your filly gone up it's creating quite a sensation he started and exclaimed ah so everyone's talking of it what a set they are those betting men when i have a favourite they all jump at it and there's nothing left for me then when an outsider's inquired after they clamour and cry out as though they were being fleeced well you know you must put me on my guard for i've been betting she resumed has she a chance a sudden rage overpowered him without any apparent reason eh hey, have the goodness not to badger me any more every horse has a chance the price has gone up of course because some people have been backing her who i don't know i'd rather leave you if you're going to continue your idiotic questions this way of speaking was neither in accordance with his usual temper or habits she felt more surprised than hurt he too felt ashamed of himself and as she stiffly requested him to be more polite he apologized for some little time past he had been subject to these sudden fits of temper no one belonging to the gallant world of paris ignored that on that day he was playing his last cards if his horses did not win if they lost him the considerable sums for which he had backed them it would be not only a disaster but a regular collapse the scaffolding of his credit the grand appearances which his undermined existence destroyed by disorder and debts preserved would tumble and noise his ruin abroad and nana as every one also knew was the man destroyer who had finished him who had been the last to attack that already damaged fortune and had cleared off all that remained the maddest caprices imaginable were related gold thrown to the winds an excursion to baden where she had not even left him the money to pay the hotel bill a handful of diamonds flung into the fire one night of intoxication to see if they would burn like coal little by little with her big limbs and her noisy vulgar laughter she had taken complete possession of that air so impoverished and so cunning of an ancient race at that hour he was risking his all overpowered by a taste for what was vile and idiotic that he had even lost the strength of his scepticism eight days before she had made him promise her a chateau on the normandy coast between havre and trouville and he made it a point of honour to keep his word only she preyed on his nerves he thought her so stupid that he could have beaten her end of chapter eleven part one chapter eleven part two of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven part two the gatekeeper had permitted them to enter the enclosure not daring to stop the woman on the count's arm nana full of pride on at length placing her foot on that forbidden spot studied her poses and walked slowly along in front of the ladies seated at the foot of the stands on ten rows of chairs there was a deep mass of elegant costumes blending their gay colours in the open air chairs were turned round friends had formed into groups just as they chanced to meet the same as in some public garden with children playing around and higher up the tiers of the stands were filled to overflowing whilst the delicate framework cast its shadows over the light-coloured garments nana stared at the ladies she made a point of looking fixedly at countess sabine then as she passed in front of the imperial pavilion the sight of mufa standing up near the empress in all his official dignity amused her immensely oh how stupid he looks said she out loud to vendeuvre she wished to see everything this bit of a park with its lawns and its groups of trees did not strike her as very interesting a refreshment contractor had set up a large bar near the railings beneath an immense circular thatched roof a crowd of men were shouting and gesticulating this was the betting ring 
close by were some empty horse boxes and to her disappointment she merely beheld the horse of a gendarme then there was the paddock a little more than a hundred yards round where a stable lad was walking valerio too well covered up and that was all with the exception of a number of men on the gravel paths wearing their orange-coloured tickets in their buttonholes and a continual promenade of people in the open galleries of the stands which interested her for a moment but really it wasn't worth while being upset because one was kept out of there Degonet and faucherie who were passing bowed to her she beckoned to them so they were obliged to draw near and she launched into abuse of the enclosure then interrupting herself she exclaimed hallo there's the marquis de choix how old he's looking he's doing for himself the old rogue is he still as unruly as ever then degonet related the old fellow's last prank the story of the day before which had not then got about after hovering around for months he had just given gaga it was said thirty thousand francs for her daughter amelie well it's abominable exclaimed nana indignantly it's a fine thing to have daughters but now i think of it it must have been lily that i saw over there in the brougham with a lady i thought i knew the face the old fellow must have brought her out vandeuvre was not listening but stood by impatiently and anxious to get rid of her however faucherie having said that if she had not seen the bookmaker she had not seen anything the count was obliged to take her to these in spite of his visible reluctance this time she was satisfied it was really very curious in an open space composed of a series of grass plots bordered by young chestnut trees and shaded by tender green leaves a compact line of bookmakers forming a vast circle as though at a fair awaited those desirous of betting in order to overlook the crowd they were standing on wooden benches they had posted up their betting list against the trees whilst with an eye ever on the watch they at the least sign made notes of bets so rapidly that some of the spectators gazed at them with open mouths and without comprehending all was confusion odds were shouted out and exclamations greeted the unexpected changes in the prices and now and again increasing the hubbub scouts running at full speed would arrive and call out at the top of their voices the news of a start or a finish which would raise a long murmur midst all that fever for gambling beneath the shining sun how funny they are murmured nana highly amused their faces all look as though they were turned inside out you see that big one there well i shouldn't care to meet him by myself in the middle of a wood but vandeuvre pointed out to her a bookmaker an assistant in a draper's shop who had made three millions in two years slim delicate-looking and fair he was treated by every one with the greatest respect he was spoken to smilingly and people stood by to look at him they were at last about to leave when vandeuvre nodded to another bookmaker who thereupon ventured to call to him he was one of his old coachmen an enormous fellow with shoulders like an ox and a very red face now that he was tempting fortune on the race-course with a capital of doubtful origin the count gave him a helping hand commissioning him with a secret betting and always treating him as a servant from whom one has nothing to hide in spite of this protection the fellow had lost some very heavy sums one after another and he also was playing his last card on that day his eyes all bloodshot and himself on the verge of a fit of apoplexy well marichal asked vandeuvre in a low voice how much have you against five thousand louis sir replied the bookmaker also speaking low that's good isn't it i must admit that i've lowered the price i've laid the odds at three to one vandeuvre looked greatly annoyed no no i won't have it put it back at two to one at once i will never tell you anything again marichal oh but what can that matter to you now sir resumed the other with a humble smile of a confederate i had to attract the people so as to place your two thousand louis then vandeuvre made him give over but as he went away marichal recollecting something regretted that he had not questioned him respecting his filly's rise in price he was in a pretty mess if the filly had a chance for he had taken two hundred louis about her laying fifty to one against nana could not make anything out of the words whispered by the count but she did not dare question him again he seemed more nervous than ever and abruptly placed her under the care of la bordette whom they found waiting at the entrance to the weighing-place you must take her back said he i have something to attend to good-bye and he went inside 
it was a narrow apartment with a low ceiling and almost filled with a big weighing machine it was like the room where luggage is weighed at a small suburban station nana was again greatly disappointed she had figured to herself a very vast affair a monumental apparatus for weighing the horses what they only weighed the jockeys then there was no need to make such a fuss about it seated in the scales a jockey looking an awful fool with his saddle and harness on his knees was waiting till a stout man in an overcoat had taken his weight whilst a stable lad at the door held the horse cousinus around which the crowd gathered silent and wrapped in thought they were clearing the course la bordette hurried nana but he returned a few steps to show her a little fellow talking to vendeuvre apart from the others look there's price said he ah oh, yes he rides me she murmured with a laugh she thought him very ugly to her all the jockeys looked like fools no doubt said she because they were not allowed to grow that one a man of forty had the appearance of an old dried-up child with a long thin face looking hard and death-like and full of wrinkles his body was so naughty so reduced that the blue jacket with white sleeves seemed to cover a piece of wood no she resumed as they moved away you know he isn't my fancy a mob still crowded the course the wet trodden grass of which looked almost black the crowd pressed in front of the boards placed very high up on iron posts which exhibited the numbers of the starters and with raised heads greeted uproariously each number that an electric wire communicating with the weighing place made appear some gentlemen were ticking their racing cards pichenette having been scratched by his owner caused a slight commotion nana however simply passed by on la Baudette's arm the bell was ringing persistently for the course to be cleared ah my friends said she as she re-entered her landau it's all humbug their enclosure every one about applauded her return bravo nana nana is restored to us how stupid they were did they think her one to give them the slip she returned at the right time attention it was going to begin and the champagne was forgotten every one left off drinking but nana was surprised to find gaga in her carriage with bijou and little louis on her knees gaga had come there for the sake of being near la faloise though she pretended that she had done so because she so longed to kiss the baby she adored children ah by the way and lily asked nana it's she is it not in that old fellow's brougham over there i've just been told something that isn't very creditable gaga assumed a most grieved expression of countenance my dear it has made me quite ill said she woefully i cried so much yesterday i was obliged to keep my bed all day and even this morning i was afraid i should not be able to come well you know what my notion was i did not wish her to do as she has done i had her brought up in a convent and intended getting her well married and she always had the best advice and was constantly looked after well my dear she would have her own way oh we had such a scene bitter tears unpleasant words until it ended by my slapping her face she felt so dull she would try the change then when she took it into her head to say it's not you anyhow who have the right to prevent me i said to her you're a wretch you dishonour us be off and so off she went but i consented to make the best arrangement i could for her however there's my last hope gone and i had been planning ah such grand things the sounds of a quarrel caused them to stand up it was georges who was defending vendeuvre against several vague rumours that were passing from group to group how absurd to say that he no longer believes in his horse exclaimed the young man only yesterday at the club he backed lusignan to the extent of a thousand louis yes i was there added philippe and he didn't back nana for a single louis if nana's got to ten to one it's not owing to him it's ridiculous to give people credit for so much calculation besides what interest could he have in behaving so la bordette listened in a quiet sort of way and shrugging his shoulders observed let them say what they like they must talk of something the count has just laid another five hundred louis at least on lusignan 
and if he's backed nana for a hundred it's merely because an owner must show some faith in his horses what the devil can it matter to us yelled la faloise waving his arms spirit will win france is nowhere bravo england a tremor passed slowly through the crowd whilst a fresh peal of the bell announced the arrival of the horses at the starting-place then nana to obtain a better view stood up on one of the seats of her landau treading on the bouquets of forget-me-nots and roses with a glance round she took in the vast horizon at this last moment when the excitement was at fever heat she beheld first of all the empty course enclosed by its grey barriers along which policemen were stationed at intervals and the broad band of muddy grass before her became greener and greener in the distance until it merged into a soft velvety carpet then as she lowered her eyes and gazed around in her immediate vicinity she saw an ever-moving crowd standing on tiptoe or clambering on to the vehicles excited and animated by the same passion with the horses neighing the refreshment tents shaking in the wind and riders on their steeds in the midst of the foot passengers hastening to the barriers whilst when she looked at the stands on the other side of the course the people seemed smaller the mass of heads appeared merely a medley of colours filling the paths the benches and the terraces beneath the dull sky and she could see the plain beyond behind the ivy-covered windmill to the right there was a background of meadows intersected with plantations in front as far as the seine which flowed at the foot of the hill park-like avenues along which interminable rows of immovable vehicles were waiting crossed each other then on the left towards boulogne the country spreading out again opened into a view of the bluey heights of meudon intercepted only by a row of palonias the rosy tufts of which without a single leaf formed a sheet of vivid crimson people still continued to arrive numbers were hastening from over there like so many ants as they wended their way along a narrow path which crossed the fields whilst far off in the direction of paris the spectators who did not pay a host who camped out in the wood formed a long black moving line under the trees on the outskirts of the bois but suddenly a feeling of gaiety excited the hundred thousand souls who covered that bit of a field with a commotion of insects disporting themselves beneath the vast sky the sun which had been hidden for the last quarter of an hour reappeared and shone in a flood of light and everything sparkled once more the women's parasols looked like innumerable shields of gold above the crowd every one applauded the sun gay laughter saluted it and arms were thrust out to draw aside the clouds at this moment a police officer appeared walking alone along the centre of the now deserted course higher up towards the left a man could be seen holding a red flag in his hand that's the starter the baron de mauriac replied la bordette to a question of nana's among the men surrounding the young woman and who pressed even on to the steps of her landau there arose a hubbub of exclamations of sentences left unfinished in the flush of first impressions philippe and georges bordenave la Faloise could not keep quiet don't push let me see ah the judge is entering his box did you say it was monsieur de souvigny i say he must have good eyes to decide a close contest from such a place do be quiet they're hoisting the flag here they come look out the first one is Cousinus. a red and yellow flag waved in the air from the top of the starting post the horses arrived one by one led by stable lads the jockeys in the saddle their arms hanging down and looking mere bright specks in the sunshine after Cousinus, azar and boom appeared then a murmur greeted spirit a tall handsome bay whose harsh colours lemon and black had a britannic sadness valerio too met with a grand reception he was a lively little animal and the colours were pale green edged with pink vendeuvre's two horses were a long time making their appearance at length the blue and white colours were seen following frangipane but lusignan a very dark bay of irreproachable form was almost forgotten in the surprise created by nana's appearance no one had ever before seen her thus the sunshine gave the chestnut filly the golden hue of a fair-haired girl she glittered in the light like a new louis with her deep chest her graceful head and neck and shoulders and her long nervous delicate back why she has hair the colour of mine exclaimed nana delighted i feel quite proud of her they all climbed on to the landau bordenave almost trod on little louis whom his mother had forgotten he caught hold of him 
grumbling in a paternal manner and lifting him on to his shoulder he murmured poor young un he must see too wait a minute and i'll show you your mamma there over there look at the gee-gee and as bijou was scratching his legs he lifted him up also whilst nana delighted with the animal that bore her name glanced at the other women to see how they took it they were all madly jealous at this moment old tricot on her cab immovable until then waved her hands and shouted some instructions to a bookmaker over the crowd her instinct prompted her she backed nana la faloise was making an unbearable row however he was quite smitten with frangipane i've an inspiration he cried just look at frangipane see what go there is in him i take frangipane at eight to one who'll bet do be quiet la bordette ended by saying you'll only regret it all by and by frangipane's a jade declared philippe he is already wet with perspiration look they're going to canter the horses had turned to the right and they started on their preliminary canter passing in front of the grandstand in a disordered crowd then the excited remarks broke out again everyone spoke at the same time lusignan is in good condition but he is too long in the back you know not a farthing on valerio too he is nervous he holds his head too high it's a bad sign hallo it's burn who is riding spirit i tell you he has no shoulder a good shoulder means everything no spirit is decidedly too quiet listen i saw nana after the race for the grande poule des produits she was soaking her coat as though dead and breathing fit to burst twenty louis she isn't placed enough enough what a confounded nuisance he is with his frangipane it's too late they're going to start la faloise almost crying was struggling to get to a bookmaker the others had to reason with him all the necks were stretched out but the first start was not a good one the starter who in the distance looked like a thin black stick had not lowered his red flag the horses returned to the post after a short gallop there were two other false starts at length the starter getting the horses all well together sent them off with a skill that won admiration on all sides magnificent start no it is chance never mind they're off the noise died away in the anxiety which filled every breast now the betting ceased the game was being played on the immense course complete silence reigned at last as though all breathing was suspended faces were raised white and trembling at the start hazard and cousineus had made the running leading all the others valerio too followed close behind them the rest came on in a confused mass when they passed in front of the stands shaking the earth and with the sudden gust of wind caused by their immense speed the group had stretched out to fully forty lengths frangipane was last nana was a little behind lusignan in spirit the deuce murmured la bordette the english one is picking his way well through them every one in the landau had something to say some exclamation to utter all stood upon tiptoe and watched intently the bright colours of the jockeys borne along in the sunshine as they ascended the incline valerio too took the lead cousinus and hazard were losing ground whilst lusignan and spirit neck and neck were still followed closely by nana damn it the english horse has won that's quite plain said bordenave lusignan is tiring and valerio too can't stay well it is disgusting if the english horse wins exclaimed philippe in a burst of patriotic grief a feeling of anguish gradually overwhelmed that mob of people another defeat and a wish of extraordinary ardour amounted almost to a prayer for lusignan's success was inwardly expressed by all whilst the abused spirit and his funereal looking jockey the crowd scattered over the grass broke up into bands who were running with all their might horsemen galloped swiftly over the ground and nana turning slowly round beheld at her feet that surging mob of men and animals that sea of heads looking as though dashed about and carried along the course by the vortex of the race streaking the bright horizon of the jockeys she watched the fast stepping legs which as the distance increased assumed the slenderness of hairs now at the farthest limit of the circle she saw them sideways looking so small and slight against the green background of the bois 
then suddenly they disappeared behind a large cluster of trees close to the course don't despair cried georges still full of hope it's not over yet the english horse is caught but la faloise again overcome by his disdain for the national cause became quite scandalous in his applause of spirit bravo it served them right france was in need of the lesson spirit first and frangipane second it would aggravate his fatherland la bordette whom he thoroughly exasperated seriously threatened to throw him out of the carriage we'll see how long they take quietly observed bordenave who with little louis on his shoulder had pulled out his watch one by one the horses reappeared from behind the clump of trees then the crowd uttered a long murmur of amazement valerio too still had the lead but spirit was gaining on him and lusignan who was next had given way whilst another horse was taking his place the spectators could not understand it at first they mixed up the colours exclamations arose on all sides but it is nana nana absurd i tell you lusignan still keeps his place yes it is though it is nana it is easy to recognize her by her golden colour there look at her now she seems all on fire bravo nana there's an artful minx for you bah it's nothing she's only making the running for lusignan for some seconds that was the general opinion but the filly slowly continued to gain ground in a continued effort then an immense emotion seized upon all the horses in the rear no longer excited the smallest interest a last struggle began between spirit nana lusignan and valerio too their names were on the lips of every one their progress or their falling off was proclaimed in short disconnected sentences and nana who had climbed on to the coachman's seat as though lifted up by some invisible power was all pale and trembling and so deeply moved that she could not say a word la bordette close beside her was once more smiling well the english horse is in difficulties said philippe joyfully he is not going so well anyhow lusignan is done for cried la faloise valerio too leads the way look there they are the whole four of them close together the same words came from every throat what a rate they're going at oh what a frightful rate nana now beheld the group coming towards her like a flash of lightning you could feel their approach and almost their breathing a distant roar which grew louder and louder every second the whole crowd impetuously rushed to the barriers and preceding the horses a heavy clamour escaped from every chest coming nearer and nearer with a sound like the ocean breaking on the shore it was the final outburst of brutal passion aroused by a colossal venture a hundred thousand spectators with one fixed idea burning with the same hankering for luck following with their eyes those animals whose gallop carried off millions they shoved and trampled on one another with clenched fists and open mouths each one for himself and urging on his favourite with his voice and gestures and the cry of this vast multitude which was like the roar of some savage beast became more and more distinct here they come here they come here they come but nana continued to gain ground now valerio too was distanced and she led with spirit by two or three necks the rumbling noise resembling thunder increased as they came on a tempest of oaths greeted them from the landau gee up lusignan you big coward you sorry beast look at the english one isn't he grand go it old fellow go it and that valerio it's disgusting ah the carrion my ten louis are nowhere now there's only nana in it bravo nana bravo little slut and nana on the coachman's box was swinging her hips and thighs without knowing she did so as though she herself was running she kept protruding her body under the notion that it helped the filly along and each time she did so she sighed wearily and said in a low painful tone of voice go it go it go it a grand sight was then beheld price erect in the stirrups his whip raised flogged nana with an iron arm that old dried-up child that long figure usually looking so hard and dead seemed shooting sparks of fire and in a burst of furious audacity of triumphant will he instilled some of his own spirit into the filly he kept her up he carried her along covered with foam and with eyes all bloody 
the cluster of horses passed like a flash of lightning sweeping the air taking away the breath of all who saw them whilst the judge on the lookout calmly awaited then there arose an immense cheer with a final effort price had lifted nana to the post beating spirit by a head the clamour that burst forth was like the roar of the rising tide nana 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 the cry rolled and grew with the violence of a tempest gradually filling the air from the innermost recesses of the bois to mount valerien from the meadows of longchamp to the plain of boulogne around nana's landau a mad enthusiasm was displayed long live nana long live france down with england the women waved their parasols some men sprung into the air and turned round vociferously others laughing nervously flung up their hats and on the other side of the course the crowd in the enclosure responded an agitation passed through the stands without one being able to discern anything distinctly beyond a commotion of the air like the invisible flame of a brazier above that living heap of little chaotic figures twisting their arms about with black specks indicating their eyes and open mouths the cry continued unceasingly growing in intensity caught up in the distance by the people camping beneath the trees to spread again and increase itself with the emotion of the imperial stand where the empress joined in the applause nana 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 the shout rose beneath the glorious sun which stimulated the delirium of the crowd with a shower of gold then nana standing on the box seat of her landau stretched to her full height thought it was she that they were applauding for an instant she stood immovable in the astonishment of her triumph watching the course invaded by a host so compact by such a sea of black hats that the grass could no longer be seen then when all that mob had taken up its position leaving a narrow passage to the entrance of the course acclaiming nana again as she retired with price broken in appearance lifeless and as though empty the young woman violently slapped her thighs forgetting everything as she gave vent to her triumph in the coarsest language ah damn it all it's me though ah damn it all what luck and not knowing how to show the joy that was overwhelming her she seized hold of and kissed little louis whom she had just caught sight of on baudenave's shoulders three minutes and fourteen seconds said the latter putting his watch back into his pocket nana still listened to her name with which the whole plain resounded it was her people who applauded her whilst in a straight line with the sun she throned over them with her hair shining like a star and her blue and white dress of the colour of the heavens la bordette before hastening away told her that she had won two thousand louis for he had placed her fifty louis on nana at forty to one but the money affected her less than that unexpected victory the splendour of which made her queen of paris the other women had all lost rose mignon in a fit of passion had broken her parasol and caroline Equet and clarisse and simone and even lucy stuart in spite of her son's presence all swore in an undertone exasperated by that big girl's luck whilst old tricon who had crossed herself both at the start and the finish of the race towered above them to the full height of her tall body delighted at her discernment and like an experienced matron canonizing nana around the landau however the rush of men increased the band had uttered the most ferocious yells georges almost choked continued to shout by himself in a broken voice as the champagne ran short philippe taking the two grooms with him hastened off to the refreshment tents and nana's court grew larger and larger her triumph determined the laggards the movement which had made her landau the central object ended in an apotheosis queen venus surrounded by her delirious subjects behind her baudenave was muttering oaths with the tender feelings of a father steiner himself reconquered had left simone and was hanging on to one of the carriage steps when the champagne arrived when she raised her glass full of wine the applause was so deafening the cries of nana 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 were so loud that the amazed multitude looked around expecting to see the filly and one no longer knew whether it was the animal or the woman who most filled the men's hearts mignon hastened to her in spite of rose's black looks the confounded girl put him quite beside himself he must embrace her then after he had kissed her on both cheeks he said paternally what bothers me is that rose will now for certain send the letter she is in such a rage so much the better that's just what i want 
said Nana, forgetting herself. But seeing him lost in astonishment at her words, she hastened to add, No, no, whatever am I saying? Really, I no longer know what I say. I'm tipsy. And indeed she was intoxicated with joy and with the sunshine, as with her glass raised on high she applauded herself. To Nana! To Nana! cried she, in the midst of a still greater increase of uproar, laughter, and cheers which little by little gained the entire race-course. The races were drawing to a close. They were now running for the Vaublanc prize. Vehicles were departing one by one. Vendeuvre's name was frequently uttered in the midst of squabbles. Now it was clear. For two years past, Vendeuvre had been preparing for this exploit by always instructing Gresham to pull Nana and he had only produced Lusignan to make the running for the filly. The losers lost their tempers whilst the winners shrugged their shoulders. What next? It was all right. An owner could manage his stable as he chose. There had been much queerer things done than that. The greater number of people considered Vendeuvre very smart to have secured through his friends all he could possibly get on Nana, which had explained the sudden rise in her price. They talked of two thousand louis at an average of thirty to one, which meant a gain of twelve hundred thousand francs, a sum so large that it commanded respect and excused everything. But other rumors, very grave ones, which were whispered about, came from the enclosure. The men who returned from there brought details. Voices were raised as they related the particulars of a frightful scandal. That poor Vendeuvre was done for. He had spoiled his superb hit by a piece of errant stupidity, an idiotic robbery in commissioning Maréchal, a bookmaker whose affairs were in a very queer state, to place on his account two thousand louis against Lusignan, just for the sake of getting back his thousand and odd louis which he had openly bet on the horse, a mere nothing. And that was the fatal crack in the midst of his already tottering fortunes. The bookmaker warned that the favorite would not win had made about sixty thousand francs by the horse, only La Bordette, not having received exact and detailed instructions, had gone and placed with him two hundred louis on Nana, which he, in his ignorance of what was going to be done, continued to lay at fifty to one against. Done out of one hundred thousand francs by the filly, with a clear loss of forty thousand, Marichal, who felt everything giving way beneath him, had suddenly understood all on seeing La Bordette and the Count conversing together after the race in front of the weighing-place and with the fury of an old coachman and the rough manner of a man who has been robbed he had just created a frightful disturbance before every one telling the story in most atrocious language and gathering a mob around him it was added that the stewards were about to inquire into the matter nana whom philippe and georges were quietly informing of what had happened kept making reflections without however ceasing to laugh and to drink it was after all very likely she recollected certain things and then that marechal was a horrid fellow yet she still doubted when la bordette appeared he was very pale well queried she in a low voice it's all up with him he replied simply and he shrugged his shoulders he had acted like a child this vendeuvre she made a gesture of being bored that night at Mabi, Nana met with a colossal success. When she arrived towards ten o'clock, the uproar was already formidable. This classic night of folly gathered together all the gallant youth of the capital, an aristocratic company indulging in horseplay and a stupidity worthy of lackeys. There was quite a crush beneath the garlands of flaring gas jets, a mass of dress suits, of extravagant costumes women with bare shoulders in old dresses only fit for soiling walked round and yelled stimulated by drinking on a gigantic scale at thirty paces one could no longer hear the brass instruments of the orchestra no one danced idiotic remarks repeated no one knew why circulated among the groups they all exerted themselves but without succeeding in being funny seven women shut up in the cloak-room cried to be delivered a shallot picked up and sold by auction fetched two louis just then nana arrived still dressed in the blue and white costume that she wore at the races the shallot was presented to her in the midst of a thunder of applause they seized hold of her in spite of her struggles and three gentlemen carried her in triumph into the garden across the ruined lawns and the damaged beds of flowers and shrubs and as the orchestra was in the way they took it by assault and smashed the chairs and desks a paternal police organized the riot it was not till the Tuesday that Nana felt quite recovered from the emotions of her victory. 
she was talking that morning with madame lerat come to give her news of little louis who had been unwell ever since his outing she was highly interested in an event which at that moment was occupying paris vandeuvre warned off all the race-courses his name withdrawn the same night from the list of members of the cercle imperial had on the morrow set fire to his stable and had been burned with his horses he told me he would the young woman was saying ah the young fellow was a regular madman it gave me such a fright last night when i heard of it you see he might very well have murdered me one night and besides oughtn't he to have told me about his horse i should at least have made my fortune he said to la bordette that if i was let into the secret i would at once tell my hairdresser and a host of other men how very polite ah no really i can't regret him much after thinking the matter over she had become furious at that moment la bordette entered the room he had been collecting her winnings for her and brought her about forty thousand francs that only added to her ill-humour for she ought to have won a million la bordette who pretended to be very innocent in the matter boldly forsook vendeuvre altogether those ancient families were all done for they always came to grief in a ridiculous manner oh no said nana it is not ridiculous to set oneself a fire like that in a stable i think he ended grandly oh you know i'm not defending his affair with marechal now that was ridiculous when i think that blanche had the idiocy to pretend that i was the cause of it all i said to her did i tell him to steal i suppose one may ask a man for money without driving him to commit a crime if he had said to me i've nothing more i should have rejoined very well we'd better part and that would have been the end of it no doubt observed the aunt gravely when men become obstinate it is so much the worse for them but as for the closing scene oh it was indeed grand resumed nana it seems that it was terrible the thought of it makes my flesh creep he got everybody out of the way and shut himself inside with some petroleum and it blazed away ah it must have been a sight just fancy a big place like that nearly all of wood and full of hay and straw the flames they say rose nearly as high as steeples the best part was the horses who didn't want to be roasted they were heard kicking and flinging themselves against the doors and uttering cries like human beings some of the people there nearly died from fright la bordette gave a low whistle of incredulity he did not believe in vandeuvre's death one person swore that he had seen him get out through a window he had set fire to his stable in a fit of madness only as soon as it began to get warm it probably brought him to his senses again a man who behaved so stupidly with women so empty-headed was not capable of dying in such a grand style nana's illusions were dispelled as she listened to him and she merely made this remark oh the wretch it was such a grand ending End of chapter 11「12. It was nearly one o'clock in the morning, and Nana and the Count and the big bed hung with Venetian lace were not yet asleep. He had returned that evening after sulking for three days. The room, which was only feebly lighted by a lamp, was wrapped in silence and felt warm and moist with an odour of love whilst the white lacquer furniture inlaid with silver was only vaguely visible a drawn curtain half hid the bed in a flood of shadow there was a sigh and then the sound of a kiss broke the silence and nana gliding from under the clothes remained seated for an instant on the edge of the bed with her legs bare the count his head fallen back on the pillow continued in the shadow darling do you believe in god she asked after a moment of reflection with a grave look on her face and filled with a religious terror on leaving her lover's arms ever since the morning she had complained of an uneasiness and all her stupid ideas as she called them ideas of death and hell had been secretly tormenting her on some nights childish frights and the most horrible fancies seized upon her with her eyes open she resumed do you think i shall go to heaven and she shivered whilst the count surprised at these singular questions at such a time felt all his religious remorse awakened within him 
but with her night-dress slipped from her shoulders her hair hanging loose about her she fell upon his chest sobbing and clinging to him i'm afraid to die i'm afraid to die he had all the difficulty in the world to get free from her he himself was afraid of succumbing to the attack of madness from which that woman pressed to his body in the contagious fear of the invisible was suffering and he reasoned with her she was in very good health all she had to do was to conduct herself well to merit pardon hereafter but she shook her head no doubt she never did harm to any one she even always wore a medal of the virgin which she showed him hanging to a red ribbon between her breasts only it was settled beforehand all women who without being married had anything to do with men went to hell fragments of her catechism were returning to her ah if one only knew for certain but there one knew nothing no one ever returned with news and really it would be stupid to put oneself out if the priests were only talking nonsense yet she devoutly kissed her medal which was all warm from its contact with her body as a conjuration against death the thought of which filled her with an icy terror mifa had to go with her into the dressing-room she trembled at being alone for a minute even with the door open when he had got into bed again she wandered about the room looking into all the corners and starting at the least sound as she came to a mirror she stopped before it as in the old days lost in the contemplation of her nudity but the sight only increased her fear she ended by leisurely feeling the bones of her face with both her hands how ugly one looks when one's dead said she slowly and she drew in her cheeks opened wide her eyes and dropped her jaw to see how she would look then with her features thus distorted she turned to the count and said just look my head will be so small then he grew angry you are mad come to bed he could picture her in a grave with the emaciation of a century and joining his hands he muttered a prayer for some time past religion had regained possession of him his attacks of faith every day had the violence of apoplectic fits and left him without the least strength his fingers snapped and he continually repeated these words my god my god my god it was the cry of his impotence the cry of his sin against which he was powerless to resist in spite of the certainty of his damnation when nana returned to the bed she found him lying under the clothes with a haggard look on his face his nails digging into his chest and his eyes gazing upwards as though seeking for heaven and she burst out crying again they embraced each other their teeth chattering without their knowing it both being oppressed by the same absurd nightmare they had once before passed a similar night only this time they were utterly idiotic as nana herself declared when she had got over her fright a suspicion caused her to skilfully question the count perhaps rose mignot had sent the famous letter but it wasn't that it was merely his nerves nothing more for he was still without proofs of his cuckoldom two days later after a fresh disappearance mifa called one morning at a time which he had never come before he was livid his eyes were red with weeping and his whole frame was still shaking from a great internal struggle but zoe herself utterly scared did not notice his agitation she ran to meet him and cried oh sir be quick madame very nearly died last night and as he asked for particulars she added oh something incredible sir a miscarriage nana was three months enceinte for a long time she had thought she was merely unwell dr bouterel himself had doubts then when he was able to say for certain she was so vexed that she did everything she could to hide her condition it seemed to her a most ridiculous mishap something which lowered her in her own estimation and about which every one would have chaffed her what a wretched joke she had no luck really it was just her misfortune to be caught when she thought she was quite safe and she experienced a constant surprise as though disturbed in her sex what one got children even when one did not want them and had another object in view nature exasperated her that grave maternity which rose in the midst of her pleasures that new life quickening when she was sowing so many deaths around her ought not one to be able to dispose of oneself as one liked without all that fuss now who did the brat spring from she could not for the soul of her tell no one had asked for it it was in everybody's way and it would not meet with much happiness in life that was quite certain zoe gave the story of the catastrophe 
Madame was seized with colics towards four o'clock. When I went into the dressing-room, not having seen her for some time, I found her lying on the ground in a swoon. Yes, sir, on the ground, in a pool of blood, as though she had been murdered. Then, you know, I understood what had happened. I was furious. Madame ought to have told me of her mishap. Monsieur Georges happened to be here. He helped me to raise her, but when I told him she had had a miscarriage, he became unwell also. Really, I've been in an awful stew ever since yesterday. And indeed the house seemed topsy-turvy. All the servants were continually running about the rooms and up and down the stairs. Georges had passed the night on a chair in the drawing-room. It was he who had told the news to Madame's friends who had called in the evening at the time when Madame usually received. He was very pale, and he related this story full of astonishment and emotion. Steiner, La Faloise, Philippe, and several others had called. At his first words they uttered exclamations. It could not be. It must be a joke. Then they became very serious. They glanced at the bedroom door, looking very much put out, shaking their heads, no longer thinking it a funny matter. Up to midnight a dozen gentlemen had conversed in undertones in front of the fireplace, all of them friends, and each one wondering if he were the father. They seemed to be apologizing to one another with the confused looks of awkward people. Then they assumed their airs again. It was nothing to do with them. It was her fault entirely. She was a scorcher, that nana. One would never have expected such a joke from her. And they went off one by one on tiptoe, the same as in the chamber of death, where one must never laugh. But you had better go up all the same, sir, said Zoe to Mufa. Madame is much better. She will see you. We are expecting the doctor, who promised to call again this morning. The maid had persuaded Georges to go home to obtain some sleep. Upstairs in the drawing-room there was only Satin reclining on a sofa, smoking a cigarette, and gazing at the ceiling. Since the accident, in the midst of the distraction of the household, she had displayed a cold rage, shrugging her shoulders and saying most ferocious things. So, as Zoe passed before her, telling Mifa that her mistress's sufferings had been very great, "'It serves her right. It will be a lesson for her,' she sharply exclaimed. They turned around in surprise. Satin had not moved. Her eyes were still fixed on the ceiling. Her cigarette was held nervously between her lips. "'Well, you haven't much feeling, you haven't,' said Zoe. But Satin, sitting up on the couch, looked furiously at the Count and flung her former words in his face. "'It serves her right. It will be a lesson for her.' And she laid herself down again, slowly puffing the smoke from her mouth, as though uninterested and determined not to mix herself up in anything. "'No, it was too absurd.' Zoe ushered the Count into the bedroom. A smell of ether hung about in the midst of a lukewarm silence which the rare vehicles of the Avenue de Villiers scarcely broke with a dull rumbling sound. Nana, looking very white on the pillow, was not asleep. Her eyes were wide open and thoughtful. She smiled, without moving, on catching sight of the Count. "'Ah, ducky,' murmured she slowly. "'I thought I should never see you again.' Then, when he bent forward to kiss her on her hair, she was moved, and spoke to him of the child in good faith, as though he had been the father. I did not dare to tell you. I felt so happy. Oh, I had all sorts of dreams. I wanted it to be worthy of you. And now it's all over. Well, perhaps it's best so. I don't want to saddle you with any encumbrance. He, surprised at that paternity, stammered out a few sentences. He had taken a chair and seated himself beside the bed, one arm lying on the clothes. Then the young woman noticed his agitated countenance, his bloodshot eyes, the feverish trembling of his lips. "'What's the matter with you?' asked she. "'Are you ill also?' "'No,' he answered painfully. She gave him a penetrating look. Then with a sign she sent off Zoe, who was arranging the bottles of medicine as an excuse for remaining in the room and when they were alone she drew him towards her, saying, "'What's the matter, darling? Your eyes are full of tears. I can see them. Come, speak. You have called to tell me something.' "'No, no, I swear to you,' he stammered. But, choking with suffering, affected all the more by that sick-room in which he so unexpectedly found himself, he burst into sobs. 
he buried his face in the sheets to stifle the explosion of his anguish nana understood rose had no doubt ended by sending the letter she let him cry a while the convulsions that had seized him were so violent that they shook her in the bed at length with an accent of maternal compassion she asked you have some worry at home he nodded his head she paused again then added very low so you know all he nodded his head a second time and silence again reigned an oppressive silence in that room of pain it was the night before on returning from a party at the empress's that he had received the letter written by sabine to her lover after a frightful night passed in dreaming of vengeance he had gone out early in the morning to withstand a temptation to kill his wife outside in the open air struck by the mildness of the beautiful june morning he had been unable to collect his scattered ideas and had come to nana's as he always came when in trouble there only would he abandon himself to his misery with the cowardly joy of being consoled come be calm resumed the young woman affectionately i have known it for a long while but i would never have opened your eyes you recollect last year you had suspicions then thanks to my prudence things got all right again in short you had no proofs well to-day if you have any it's certainly hard as i can understand yet you must be reasonable one's not dishonoured because of that he no longer wept shame had possession of him though he had for a long time past talked with her about the most intimate details of his married life she had to encourage him come she was a woman she could hear everything but he muttered in a hollow voice you're ill i mustn't tire you it was stupid of me to come i am going but no said she quickly stay i may be able to give you some good advice only don't make me talk too much the doctor has forbidden me to do so he had left his seat and was walking about the room then she questioned him what will you do now i will thrash the man of course she pouted disapprovingly that's not a very smart thing to do and your wife i shall sue for a separation i have a proof my dear fellow that's not smart at all it's even absurd you know i'll never let you do anything of the kind and sedately in her feeble voice she pointed out to him the useless scandal of a duel and a lawsuit for a week he would be the chief topic in all the papers he would be playing with his entire existence his peace of mind his high position at court the honour of his name and why to be laughed at what does it matter cried he i shall be avenged ducky said she when a man doesn't avenge himself at once in such matters he doesn't avenge himself at all the words he was about to utter died away on his lips he was certainly no coward but he felt that she was right an uneasiness increased within him something like a feeling of impoverishment and shamefulness had unmanned him in the outburst of his wrath besides she hit him another blow with a frankness that decided on telling all and would you like to know what it is that bothers you darling it is that you yourself deceive your wife eh hey, you don't stop out all night to say your prayers your wife must know the true reason then with what can you reproach her she will say that you gave her the example and that will shut you up there darling that's why you're here stamping about instead of being there murdering them both mifa had fallen into a chair overwhelmed by that brutality of language she remained silent a while regaining breath then she faltered in a very low voice oh i'm sore all over help me to raise myself a little i keep slipping down my head is too low when he had assisted her she sighed and felt better and she returned to the grand site of a trial for judicial separation could he not conceive the countess's counsel amusing all paris and talking of nana everything would be related her fiasco at the variety theatre her mansion her life ah no she did not care for such an advertisement some dirty woman might have urged him to be so foolish so as to gain notoriety at his expense but she desired his happiness before everything she had drawn him towards her 
She held him now with his head on the pillow beside her own and her arm around his neck, and she whispered gently, Listen, Ducky, you must make it up with your wife. He was indignant. Never. His heart was breaking. The shame was too great. She, however, tenderly insisted. You must make it up with your wife. Come, you don't want to hear everyone say that I estranged you from your family. It would give me too bad a reputation. What would everyone think of me? Only swear that you'll always love me. For now that you're going to be another's... Her sobs were choking her. He interrupted her with kisses, saying, You are mad. It is impossible. Yes, yes, resumed she. You must do it. It's only right. And, after all, she's your wife. It's not as though you were unfaithful to me with the first woman you came across. And she continued thus giving him the best advice. She even talked of God. He seemed to be listening to Monsieur Venot when the old man used to sermonize him to save him from sin. She, however, did not talk of breaking off. She preached complacency, the sharing of him by his wife and his mistress, a quiet life without any bother for anyone, something like a happy dozing through the inevitable nastiness of life. It would change nothing in their existence. He would still be her best-loved ducky, only he would not come quite so frequently, and would devote to the countess the days he did not spend with her. Her strength was failing her. She concluded in a whisper, That way I shall know that I have performed a good action. You will love me all the more. Then there was silence. She closed her eyes, looking paler still on the pillow. He had listened to her under the pretext of not wishing to tire her. At the end of a few minutes she reopened her eyes and murmured, And money, too. Where will you get money if you quarrel? La Bordette came yesterday about the bill. I'm in want of everything. I've not a thing left to put on. Then, closing her eyes again, she appeared as though dead. A shade of intense anguish overspread Mifa's face. In the blow that had come upon him he had forgotten, ever since the night before, the monetary difficulties from which he no longer knew how to extricate himself. In spite of the most distinct promises, his note for a hundred thousand francs, already renewed once, had been put into circulation, and La Bordette, affecting to be greatly vexed, made out it was all Francis's fault, and said that he would never again compromise himself in an affair with an uneducated man. It would have to be paid. The Count would never let his note be protested. Then, besides Nana's innumerable claims, there was a most wasteful expenditure going on in his own home. On their return from Les Fondettes, the Countess had suddenly developed a taste for luxury, an appetite for worldly enjoyments which were rapidly devouring their fortune. People were beginning to talk of her ruinous caprices, a complete change of her household, Five hundred thousand francs frittered away in transforming the old house in the Rue Miromenil, and extravagant costumes, and large sums of money that had disappeared, melted, or been given away, perhaps, without her troubling herself to render the least account. Twice Mifa had ventured to make some observations, being desirous of knowing. But she had looked at him so peculiarly, smiling the while, that he did not dare to ask any questions for fear of receiving too plain an answer. If he accepted Dagonet as a son-in-law from Nana, it was especially with the idea of being able to reduce Estelle's dowry to two hundred thousand francs, and of making arrangements respecting the balance with the young man, who would be only too delighted at such an unexpectedly good marriage. However, during the last week, in view of the necessity of immediately finding the hundred thousand francs for the bill, Mufa had only been able to think of one expedient from which he recoiled. It was to sell a magnificent estate called Les Bordes, estimated at half a million, and which the countess had recently inherited from an uncle. Only he needed her assent, and she also, by her marriage contract, could not dispose of it without his. The night before he had made up his mind to ask his wife for her consent. But now his plans were all upset. He could never accept such a compromise knowing what he did. This thought made the blow he had received all the harder. He understood what it was that Nana wished, for in the increasing constraint that prompted him to confide in her regarding everything, he had complained about the difficulty he was in, he had told her how anxious he was to get the countess's consent. However, Nana did not appear to insist. She did not reopen her eyes. Seeing her so pale, he was frightened and induced her to take a little ether. 
Then she sighed and questioned him, but without naming Dagonet. When is the marriage coming off? The contract is to be signed on Tuesday in five days from now, he replied. Then, with her eyes still closed, as though she was speaking in the night of her thoughts, she added, Well, Ducky, think what you had better do. For myself, I want everyone to be pleased. He pacified her by taking her hand. Yes, he would think about it. The main thing was for her to rest. And his indignation left him. That sick room, so warm and so still, smelling strongly of ether, had ended by lulling him in a blessed peacefulness. All his manliness aroused by the injury had disappeared on his contact with the warmth of that bed, beside that suffering woman whom he nursed, under the excitement of his fever, and with the recollection of their voluptuous pleasures. He leant over her, he held her in his embrace. Though her face did not move, on her lips hovered the keen smile of victory. At that moment, Dr. Bouterel entered the room. "'Well, and how is this dear child?' said he familiarly to Mufa, whom he treated as the husband. The deuce, she has been talking. The doctor was a handsome man, still young, and had a superb connection in the world of gallantry. Very gay, always laughing like a comrade with the ladies, but never departing from his professional position, he charged monstrous fees, which invariably had to be paid with great punctuality. He would trouble himself to call for the least thing, Nana often sent for him two or three times a week, always trembling at the thought of death, and anxiously telling him of every little ache and pain which he cured whilst amusing her with gossip and funny stories. All the women adored him. But this time the complaint was serious. Mufa withdrew, deeply affected. He had no other feeling but that of compassion at seeing his poor Nana so weak. As he was leaving the room she beckoned him back and offered her forehead to be kissed. Then, in a low voice, with a playfully menacing air, she whispered, "'You know what I told you you might do. Make it up with your wife, or I shall be angry.' Countess Sabine had wished her daughter's marriage contract to be signed on a Tuesday to inaugurate the restoration of her townhouse, the paintings of which were scarcely dry, by a grand party. Five hundred invitations had been sent out, a few in all the different sets. On the morning itself, the upholsterers were still putting up some of the hangings, and at the time of lighting the chandeliers towards nine o'clock, the architect, accompanied by the countess who was enraptured, was giving his final instructions. It was one of those charming spring parties. The warm June evening had enabled the two doors of the drawing-room to be thrown wide open, and the ball to be carried even on the gravel paths of the garden. When the first guests arrived, they were fairly dazzled as the Count and Countess greeted them at the door. It was difficult to recall the room of bygone days in which lingered the icy recollection of old Countess Mifa, that antique apartment full of devout severity, with its solid mahogany furniture in the style of the empire, its yellow velvet hangings, its greenish ceiling saturated with dampness. Now, in the entrance vestibule, mosaic set off with gold shone beneath the tall candelabra whilst the marble staircase unrolled its finely chiselled balustrade. Then the drawing-room was resplendent with Genoa velvet hangings, and a ceiling embellished with a vast painting by Boucher, which the architect had purchased for one hundred thousand francs at the sale of the Chateau of Dampierre. The crystal chandeliers and the candelabra illuminated a profusion of mirrors and costly furniture. One could have said that Sabine's easy-chair, that solitary seat covered with crimson silk, and the softness of which used to seem so much out of place, had extended and multiplied until it filled the entire house with a voluptuous indolence, a keen enjoyment which burned with all the intensity of latent fires. The dancing had commenced. The orchestra, placed in the garden in front of one of the open windows, was playing a waltz, the sprightly rhythm of which arrived softened and subdued from the open air and the garden spread itself out in a transparent shadow lighted up by venetian lanterns with a purple tent for refreshments erected at the edge of the lawn this waltz the saucy waltz of the blonde venus which resembled the laugh raised by some over-free piece of buffoonery penetrated the old house with a sonorous swell warming the walls with its tremor it seemed like some breath of the flesh coming from the street, sweeping before it the whole of a defunct age in the haughty abode, carrying away the past of the Mifas, centuries of honour and of faith slumbering beneath the ceilings. 
close to the fireplace however the old friends of the count's mother had taken refuge in their accustomed seats feeling dazed and out of their element they formed a little group in the midst of the gradually increasing crowd madame du jonquois no longer recognizing the place had at first gone into the dining-room madame chantereau looked with amazement at the garden which seemed to her immense soon all sorts of bitter reflections were whispered in this corner End of chapter 12 part 1chapter twelve part two of nana by emile zola translated by burton rasco this librivox recording is in the public domain twelve part two i say murmured madame chantereau supposing the old countess were only to return just fancy her looking on beholding all these people and all this gold and this hubbub it is scandalous sabine is mad replied madame du jonquois did you notice her at the door look you can see her from here she has all her diamonds on they stood up for a moment to look at the count and countess in the distance sabine in a white costume trimmed with some magnificent english lace was triumphant with beauty young lively and with a touch of intoxication in her continual smile mifa beside her looking aged and rather pale smiled also in his calm dignified manner and to think that he was the master resumed madame chantereau that not the smallest seat would have been admitted here without his permission ah well she has changed all that he obeys her now do you recollect the time when she would not alter a thing in the drawing-room the whole house is altered now but they ceased talking as madame de chazel entered followed by a troop of young men all of them enraptured and giving vent to their admiration in faint exclamations oh delicious exquisite so full of taste and she called back to them it's just as i said there's nothing like these old buildings when one knows how to arrange them they look so grand is it not quite worthy of louis the fourteenth's time now at least she can receive the two old ladies had sat down again and lowering their voices they talked of the marriage which surprised many people estelle had just passed in a pink silk dress still flat and thin with her expressionless virgin face she had accepted dagonet quietly she showed neither joy nor sadness but remained as cold and pale as on those winter nights when she used to put the logs of wood on the fire all this entertainment given for her these illuminations these flowers this music left her cold an adventurer madame du jonquois was saying i have never seen him take care here he comes murmured madame chantereau dagonet who had caught sight of madame hugon with her sons had hastened to offer her his arm and he laughed he showed her an amount of affectionate attention as though she had had something to do with his stroke of fortune thank you said she seating herself by the fireplace this is my old corner do you know him asked madame du jonquois when dagonet had gone off certainly he is a charming young man georges likes him immensely oh he comes of a most honourable family and the good lady defended him against a covert hostility which she felt existed his father who was greatly esteemed by louis philippe had occupied a prefect's post until his death the young man had perhaps been rather dissipated it was said that he was ruined at any rate one of his uncles a rich landed proprietor was going to bequeath his fortune to him but the other ladies shook their heads whilst madame hugon feeling rather embarrassed kept laying great stress on the honourable position of the family she felt very tired and complained of her legs for a month past she had been stopping at her house in the rue richelieu for a host of business matters so she said a shade of sadness veiled her maternal smile all the same concluded madame chantereau estelle might have made a far better match there was a flourish of music it was the commencement of a quadrille the crowd moved to the sides of the room to leave an open space light dresses passed mixed with the dark dress suits whilst the blaze of light shone on the sea of heads illuminating the sparkling jewels the waving white plumes and the bloom of lilac and roses it was already very warm a penetrating perfume rose from the light tools the satins and the silks among which the bare shoulders paled beneath the lively notes of the orchestra 
through the open doors one could see rows of women seated in the adjacent rooms with a discreet brightness in their smile a sparkle in their eyes a pout on their lips gently fanning themselves and guests still continued to arrive a footman announced their names whilst amidst the various groups gentlemen slowly tried to find places for the ladies on their arms standing on tiptoe in search of a vacant chair but the house was filling the skirts were packing closer together with a slight noise there were places where a mass of lace bows and flounces barred the way the wearers politely resigned retaining all their grace accustomed as they were to such brilliant crushes however out in the garden in the roseate light of the venetian lanterns couples were wandering about having escaped from the stifling atmosphere of the great drawing-room the shadows of dresses passed over the lawn as though keeping time to the music of the quadrille which sounded softer in the distance behind the trees steiner who was there had just come across boucarmont and la valoise partaking of champagne in the refreshment tent it's awfully swell la valoise was saying while examining the purple tent and the gilded lances which supported it one could almost think oneself at the gingerbread fair yes that's it the gingerbread fair he now affected to continually poke fun at everything posing as a young man who was sick of the world and who could find nothing worthy of being looked at in a serious light wouldn't poor vendeuvre be surprised if he returned here murmured foucarmont don't you recollect when he used to be bored to death over there opposite the fireplace by jove no one laughed then vendeuvre don't mention him he's extinguished resumed la Faloise disdainfully he was greatly mistaken if he thought he was going to astonish us with his roasting not a soul talks of it now he's out of it done for scratched vendeuvre talk of another then as steiner shook hands with them he continued you know nana's just arrived oh such an entry my boy something prodigious first of all she embraced the countess then when the children drew near she blessed them saying to dagonet listen paul if you deceive her you'll have me after you what didn't you see it oh she was grand such a success the other two listened to him with their mouths open at length they burst out laughing he delighted thought himself very wonderful hey you believed it all well why not it's nana who arranged the marriage besides she's one of the family the two hugons passed just then and philippe made him desist then as men they talked of the marriage georges became very incensed with la Faloise, who related the story of it nana had indeed saddled mifa with one of her former lovers for a son-in-law only it was untrue that she had had dagonet to see her the night before foucarmont incredulously shrugged his shoulders did any one ever know whom nana had to see her of a night but georges angrily replied with a sir i know which made them all laugh anyhow as steiner said it was a very peculiar state of affairs little by little the refreshment tent was becoming crowded they moved away from the bar without separating la Faloise stared impudently at the woman as though he thought himself at mabille at the end of a path they were greatly surprised on beholding m venot engaged in a long conversation with dagonet and some very poor jokes amused them immensely he was confessing him he was giving him some advice for the first night then they went and stood in front of one of the open doors of the drawing-room where some couples dancing a polka were steering their way amidst the men who remained standing the candles were guttering from the breeze coming from outside when a couple passed keeping time to the music it refreshed the heated atmosphere like a gentle puff of wind by jove they can't be very cold in there murmured la Faloise their eyes blinked on coming from out of the mysterious shadows of the garden and they drew each other's attention to the marquis de choix who standing all alone and stretched to the full height of his tall figure overlooked the bare shoulders around him his pale face appeared very severe and bore an expression of haughty dignity beneath his crown of scanty white locks scandalized by count mifa's conduct he had publicly broken off all connection with him and affected not to visit at the house if he had consented to appear on this occasion it was on account of the earnest entreaties of his granddaughter whose marriage however he disapproved of in indignant language against the disorganization of the upper classes by the shameful compromises of modern debauchery ah the end is at hand 
Madame du Jonquois beside the fireplace was whispering to Madame Chantereau. That hussy has so bewitched the unhappy fellow. We who used to know him so staunch a believer, so noble. It appears that he's ruining himself, continued Madame Chantereau. My husband has had a note of his. He lives now altogether in that mansion of the Avenue de Villiers. All Paris is talking about him. Really, I cannot excuse Sabine either, though we must admit that he gives her a great many causes for complaint. And, well, if she also throws the money out of the window... She does not only throw money, interrupted the other. Well, as they are both at work, they will reach the end all the sooner. A regular drowning in the mire, my dear. But a gentle voice interrupted them. It was Monsieur Venot. He had come and seated himself behind them as though desirous of being out of the way, and leaning towards them he murmured, Why despair? God manifests himself when all seems lost. He was peacefully assisting at the downfall of that house which once upon a time he had governed. Ever since his sojourn at Les Fondettes he had quietly allowed the undermining to go on, fully aware of how powerless he was to cope with it. He had accepted everything. The Count's mad infatuation for Nana, Faucherie's close attendance on the Countess, even Dagonet's marriage with Estelle. What mattered those things? and he showed himself more supple, more mysterious, entertaining the idea of influencing the young couple, the same as he had the now disunited one, knowing that great disorders lead to great devotions. Providence would have its hour. Our friend, continued he in a low voice, is still animated with the best religious sentiments. He has given me the sweetest proofs. Well, then, said Madame de Jonquois, he should first of all make it up with his wife, no doubt just now i happen to have the hope that their reconciliation will not be long in coming about then the two old ladies questioned him but he became very humble again they must let heaven accomplish it in its own way his sole desire in bringing the count and countess closer together was to avoid a public scandal religion tolerated many failings when appearances were kept up at any rate resumed madame de Jonquois, you ought to have prevented this marriage with this adventurer. You are mistaken. Monsieur Dagonet is a very worthy young man. I am acquainted with his ideas. He wishes to cause his youthful errors to be forgotten. Estelle will bring him into the right path, you may be sure. Oh, Estelle, disdainfully murmured Madame Chantereau, I think the dear child is quite without any will whatever. She is altogether so insignificant. This expression of opinion caused M. Venot to smile. However, he did not explain himself respecting the young bride. Closing his eyes, as though to withdraw from the conversation, he again hid himself in his corner behind the skirts. Madame Hugon, in the midst of her absent-minded weariness, had overheard a few words. She joined in, and as she addressed herself to the Marquis de Choix, who had come to greet her, thus concluded with her tolerating air. You ladies are too severe. Existence is already so bad for every one. Eh, my friend? We ought to forgive a great deal in others, when we wish to be ourselves worthy of pardon. The Marquis remained embarrassed for a few moments, fearing an allusion to himself. But the good lady had so sad a smile that he soon regained his composure and said, No, certain faults deserve no pardon. It is by such complacences that society totters on its foundations. The ball had become more animated than ever. Another quadrille gave a kind of gentle swing to the floor of the drawing-room, as though the old house had staggered beneath the commotion of the merry-making. Now and again, in the mixed paleness of the faces, there stood out a woman's countenance, carried away by the dance, with sparkling eyes and parted lips and the full light of a chandelier shining on her white skin. Madame de Jonquois declared that the Count and Countess must have been out of their senses. It was madness to squeeze five hundred people into a room that could scarcely hold two hundred. Why not have the contract signed on the Place du Carousel at once? It was the result of new manners, Madame Chantereau said. In her younger days such solemnities took place in the bosom of one's family. Now one must have a mob, the whole street being freely allowed to enter. Unless one had such a crush, the entertainment would be considered quiet and uneventful. One advertised one's luxury, 
one introduced into one's abode the very scum of paris and there was nothing more natural if such promiscuousness ended by corrupting the home the two ladies complained that they did not know more than fifty of the persons present how was it so young girls in low neck dresses displayed their bare shoulders a woman wore a golden dagger stuck in her chignon whilst the body of her dress embroidered with jet black beads looked like a coat of mail another was being smilingly followed about her skirts so tight-fitting that they gave her a most singular appearance all the luxury of the close of the winter season was there the world of pleasure with its tolerations all that which the mistress of a house picks from her acquaintances of a day a society where great names and great infamies elbowed each other in the same appetite for pleasure the heat was increasing the quadrille unrolled the cadenced symmetry of its figures amidst the overcrowded rooms the countess is stunning resumed la valoise at the garden door she looks ten years younger than her daughter by the way foucarmont you can give us some information vandeuvre used to bet that she had no thighs worth speaking of this affectation of cynicism bored the other gentlemen foucarmont contented himself with replying consult your cousin my boy he's just coming this way yes that's an idea cried la Faloise. i'll bet ten louis that her thighs are good faucheri was indeed just arriving as an intimate friend of the house he had passed through the dining-room so as to avoid the crush at the doors taken up again by rose at the beginning of the winter he now divided himself between the singer and the countess feeling very wearied not knowing how to break off with one of the two sabine flattered his vanity but rose amused him more the latter too entertained a genuine affection for him a tenderness of really conjugal fidelity which grieved mignon immensely listen we want some information said la Faloise, squeezing his cousin's arm you see that lady in white silk ever since his inheritance had given him an insolent assurance he affected to poke fun at faucheri having an old spite to gratify wishing to be revenged for the banterings of the time when he first arrived from the country yes that lady who has a lot of lace about her the journalist stood on tiptoe not yet understanding the countess he ended by saying just so my boy i've bet ten louis are her thighs good and he burst out laughing delighted at having succeeded in taking down a peg that fellow who had once amazed him so much when he asked him if the countess had a lover but faucheri without showing the least surprise looked him straight in the face you idiot said he at last shrugging his shoulders then he shook hands with the other gentlemen whilst la Faloise, quite put out of countenance was no longer very sure of having said something funny they stood conversing together ever since the races the banker and foucarmont had joined the set at the avenue de villiers nana was much better the count called every evening to see how she was progressing however faucheri who merely listened seemed preoccupied that morning during a quarrel rose had deliberately told him that she had sent the letter yes he might go and call on his grand lady he would be well received after hesitating for a long time he had courageously made up his mind to come but la Faloise's stupid joke had upset him in spite of his apparent serenity what's the matter with you asked philippe you don't seem well i oh i'm all right i've been working that's why i'm so late then coolly with one of those unknown heroisms which unravel the common tragedies of life he added with all that i've not paid my respects to our hosts one must be polite he even dared to joke and turning to la Faloise, said am i not right idiot and he made a passage for himself through the crowd the footman was no longer bawling out the names the count and countess however were still near the door conversing with some ladies who had just entered at length he reached the spot where they stood whilst the gentleman he had just left on the steps leading into the garden stood on tiptoe to have a good view of the scene nana must have been gossiping the count does not see him murmured georges attention he's turning around there now they're at it the orchestra was again playing the waltz of the blonde venus first of all faucheri bowed to the countess who continued to smile serenely delighted then he stood for a moment immovable calmly waiting behind the count's back the count that night maintained his haughty gravity the official bearing of a high dignitary 
when at length he lowered his eyes towards the journalist he exaggerated still more his majestic attitude for some seconds the two men looked at each other and it was faucherie who first held out his hand Mufa clasped it their hands were locked one in the other countess sabine smiled in front of them her eyes cast on the ground whilst the waltz continued to unroll its saucy rhythm but it's going splendidly said steiner are their hands glued together asked Poucarmont, amazed at the length of time they remained clasped an invincible recollection brought a rosy blush to faucherie's pale cheeks he again beheld the property room with its greenish light and its odd assortment of things smothered with dust and Mufa was there holding the egg cup and taking advantage of his suspicions now Mufa no longer had any doubts it was a last shred of dignity collapsing faucherie relieved of his fright seeing the countess's evident gaiety was seized with a desire to laugh it seemed to him so comic ah this time it is indeed she exclaimed la faloise who stuck to a joke when once he thought it a good one there's nana over there look she's entering the room shut up you idiot murmured philippe i tell you it is she they're playing her waltz she comes and besides she had a share in the reconciliation dash it all what you don't see her she's pressing them all to her heart my male cousin my female cousin and her spouse and calling them her little ducky darlings they always upset me these family scenes estelle had drawn near faucherie complimented her whilst she looking very stiff in her pink dress watched him with the surprised air of a silent child glancing also at her father and mother degonet too heartily shook hands with the journalist they formed a smiling group and m venot glided behind looking tenderly on them enveloping them all with his devout meekness happy at beholding these last defections which were preparing the ways of providence but the waltz still continued its voluptuous whirl it was an increase of the wave of pleasure overtaking the old mansion like a rising tide the orchestra swelled the trills of its little flutes the rapturous sighs of its violins beneath the genoa velvet hangings the gildings and the paintings the chandeliers gave out a lifelike warmth a light as bright as sunshine whilst the crowd of guests reflected in the mirror seemed to increase with the louder murmur of the voices around the drawing-room the couples which passed with arms encircling waist amidst the smiles of seated women accentuated the shaking of the flooring in the garden the ember-like glimmer of the venetian lanterns lighted up the dark shadows of the promenaders seeking a breath of air along the walks as though with the distant reflection of a fire and this trembling of the walls this ruddy cloud was like the blazing of the end in which the ancient family honour fell to pieces burning at the four corners of the home the timid gaieties then scarcely beginning which one april evening faucherie had heard ring with a sound of breaking glass had little by little become emboldened maddened to burst forth into the resplendency of that entertainment now the crack increased it attacked the house and gave warning of its approaching destruction amongst the drunkards of the slums it is by the blackest misery the cupboard without bread the craving for alcohol eating up the last sticks that corrupted families reach their end here over the downfall of these riches heaped together and set fire to at one fell swoop the waltz sounded the knell of an ancient race whilst nana invisible but hovering above the ball with her supple limbs polluted all those people penetrating them with the ferment of her odour floating in the warm air upon the wings of the saucy rhythm of the music it was on the night of the wedding at the church that count Mufa appeared in his wife's bedroom which he had not entered for two years past the countess greatly surprised drew back at first but she preserved her smile that smile of intoxication which now never left her he very much embarrassed could only stutter a few words then she gave him a little lecture but neither the one nor the other ventured on a complete explanation it was religion that required this mutual forgiveness and it was tacitly agreed between them that they should retain their liberty before going to bed as the countess still seemed to hesitate they discussed business matters he the first talked of selling les bordes she at once consented they both had great want of money they would share the proceeds 
that completed the reconciliation Mufa experienced a real relief in spite of his remorse that day too as nana was dozing towards two o'clock zoe ventured to knock at the door of her bedroom the curtains were drawn a warm breeze entered by one of the windows in the still freshness of the subdued light the young woman got up a little now though still rather weak she opened her eyes and asked who is it zoe was about to reply but dagonet forcing his way in announced himself on hearing him she leant upon the pillow and sending the maid away said what it's you on your wedding day whatever is the matter he not seeing clearly remained standing in the middle of the room however he soon got used to the obscurity and advanced forward in his dress clothes with a white tie and gloves and he kept saying well yes it's i don't you recollect no she remembered nothing so he had to crudely refresh her memory in his jocular way why your commission i've brought you the hansel of my innocence then as he was close to the bed she seized hold of him with her bare arms shaking with laughter and almost weeping for she thought it so nice of him ah my mimi how funny he is he has not forgotten it and i who no longer remembered so you've given them the slip you've just come from the church it's true you've an odour of incense about you but kiss me oh more than that my mimi it will perhaps be for the last time their tender laugh expired in the darkened room about which there still hung a vague smell of ether the close warmth swelled the window curtains children's voices sounded in the avenue then they made merry though pressed for time Degenet was to leave with his wife directly after the wedding breakfast. End of chapter 12「Thirteen, Part One of Nana by Emile Zola, translated by Burton Rasco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen, Part One. Towards the end of September, Count Mufa, who was to dine at Nana's that evening, came at dusk to inform her of a sudden order he had received to be at the Tuileries. The house was not yet lighted up. The servants were laughing very loudly in the kitchen he slowly ascended the staircase the windows of which shone in the prevailing warm shadow upstairs the parlour door made no noise as he opened it a rosy daylight was fading from the ceiling of the room the crimson hangings the capacious sofas the lacquer furniture all that medley of embroidered stuffs of bronzes and of china was already disappearing beneath a slowly deepening veil of gloom which penetrated the corners hiding alike the brilliancy of the ivory and the glitter of the gold and there in this obscurity by the aid alone of the light colour of her dress he beheld nana reclining in georges's arms all denial on their part was impossible he uttered a suppressed cry and stood as one lost nana sprang to her feet and pushed him into the bedroom to give the youngster time to get off come in here she murmured scarcely knowing what she said i will explain she was exasperated at being caught like that she had never before given way in such a manner at home in that parlour with the doors unfastened a number of things had tended to bring it about a quarrel with georges who was madly jealous of philippe he sobbed so bitterly on her neck that she could not resist scarcely knowing how to calm him and pitying him in her heart and on the one occasion when she was so foolish as to forget herself thus with a youngster who could not even bring her bunches of violets now as his mother guarded him so strictly the count must needs come and catch them really she had no luck that was all one got by being a good-natured girl however the obscurity in the bedroom where she had pushed the count was complete then feeling her way she went and rang furiously for a lamp after all it was that julien's fault if there had been a light in the parlour nothing of all this would have happened that stupid darkness which had come on had played the deuce with her heart i beg of you ducky be reasonable said she when zoe brought a light the count sitting down his hands on his knees looked on the ground overcome by what he had just seen he could not utter a word of anger he trembled as though seized with a horror which froze him this silent anguish deeply affected the young woman she tried to console him well yes i was wrong it was very naughty of me 
you see i am sorry for my fault i am very grieved as it annoys you so much come now you too be nice and forgive me she had sat down at his feet and was seeking his glance with a look of submissive tenderness to see if he was very angry with her then as heaving a deep sigh he recovered himself she became more wheedling the count yielded to her entreaties he merely insisted on georges being sent away but all illusion was gone he could no longer believe in nana's sworn fidelity on the morrow nana would deceive him again and he remained in the torment of possessing her simply through cowardice through his fright at the idea of living without her this was the epoch of her existence when nana brightened paris with an increase of splendor she became more imposing still on the horizon of vice she domineered over the city with the insolent display of her luxury with her contempt for money which caused her to publicly melt away fortunes in her mansion there was like the glare of a furnace her continual desires fed it the least breath from her lips would change the gold into fine ashes which the wind swept away at every hour never before had such a mania for expense been seen the house seemed built over an abyss into which men with their wealth their bodies even their names were precipitated without leaving the trace of a little dust behind this girl with the tastes of a parrot nibbling radishes and burnt almonds playing with her meat had bills to the extent of five thousand francs a month for her table in the servants hall there was an unbridled waste a ferocious leakage which emptied the casks of wine and ran up bills increased by three or four hands through which they passed victorine and francois reigned supreme in the kitchen where they invited their friends not to speak of a host of cousins whom they fed at their own homes with cold joints and meat soups julien exacted commissions from all the tradespeople a glazier did not put in a thirty-sous pane of glass but the butler had twenty added on for himself charles devoured the oats for the horses ordering double the necessary supply selling by a back door what came in by the front one whilst in the midst of this universal pillage of this sack of a town taken by assault zoe by great art succeeded in saving appearances covering the thefts of all the others the better to hide and secure her own but what was wasted was still worse the food of the previous day thrown in the gutter an encumbrance of victuals at which the servants turned up their noses the glasses all sticky with sugar gas jets blazing away turned on recklessly sufficient to blow up the place and negligences and spitefulness and accidents all that can hasten ruin in an establishment devoured by so many mouths then upstairs in madame's rooms the downfall was even greater still dresses costing ten thousand francs worn only twice and sold by zoe jewels which disappeared as though they had crumbled away at the bottoms of the drawers idiotic purchases novelties of the day forgotten in a corner on the morrow and swept into the street she could never see anything costing a great deal without desiring it she thus created around her a continual devastation of flowers and precious knick-knacks being all the more delighted in proportion to the price paid for them nothing remained perfect in her hands she broke everything or it faded or became soiled between her little white fingers a strewing of nameless remnants of crumpled rags of muddy tatters followed in her wake then the heavy settlements burst out in the midst of this waste of pocket money twenty thousand francs owing to the milliner thirty thousand to the linen draper twelve thousand to the bootmaker her stable had swallowed fifty thousand in six months her dressmaker's bill had run up to a hundred thousand francs without her having added to her household which la bordette had estimated would cost on an average four hundred thousand francs yearly she reached that year a million amazed herself at the sum and quite incapable of saying where all the money could possibly have gone to men piled up one upon the other gold emptied out in barrowfuls were unable to fill that chasm which was for ever opening deeper and deeper beneath the foundations of her house in the disruption of her luxury nana however still nursed a last caprice agitated once more with the idea of redecorating her bedroom she thought she had at last found something to suit her fancy a room hung in tea-rose velvet padded and reaching up to the ceiling in the shape of a tent ornamented with little silver buttons and with gold lace and cords it seemed to her that this would look both rich and tender a superb background to her fair skin but the room however was merely to serve as a framework to the bed a prodigy of dazzling brightness 
nana dreamed of a bed such as was never seen before a throne an altar to which all paris would come to adore her sovereign nudity it was to be entirely of gold and silver like an immense jewel golden roses scattered over a silver network at the head a band of cupids amongst the flowers would be glancing down with laughter on their faces watching the voluptuous pleasures in the shadow of the curtains she had consulted la bordette who had brought two goldsmiths to see her they were already preparing the drawings the bed was to cost fifty thousand francs and mifa was to present her with it as a new year gift what surprised the young woman was that in this ever-flowing river of gold she was constantly without money some days she scarcely knew what to do for want of the most ridiculous sums of a few louis she had to borrow of zoe or else raise funds any way she could but before resigning herself to extreme measures she would sound her friends getting out of the men whatever they had about them even sue in a jocular sort of way for three months past she had especially been emptying philippe's pockets in this manner he now never called whenever there was a crisis at hand without leaving his purse behind him on leaving soon becoming bolder nana had begun to ask him for loans two hundred francs three hundred francs never more for bills becoming due or debts that could not remain longer unpaid and philippe who in july had been made a captain and paymaster of his regiment would bring the money on the morrow with the excuse that he was not rich for good madame hugon now treated her sons with singular harshness at the end of three months these little loans often repeated amounted to some ten thousand francs the captain still laughed in his hearty sonorous way yet he was growing thin appearing absent-minded at times with a look of suffering on his face but a glance from nana transfigured him in a sort of sensual ecstasy she was very playful with him intoxicating him with kisses behind doors bewitching him with sudden abandonments of herself which tied him to her petticoats the whole time he was off duty one night nana having mentioned that her name was also therese and that her saint's day was on the fifteenth october the gentlemen all sent her presents captain philippe brought his an old saxon china comfit box mounted with gold he found her alone in her dressing-room having just come out of her bath clothed only in a loose scarlet and white flannel dressing-gown and very busy examining the presents spread out on a table she had already broken a scent bottle in rock crystal in trying to take the stopper out oh you are too nice said she whatever is it show me what a child you are to spend your money in things like this she scolded him because he was not rich although really very pleased to see him spend all he had on her the only proof of love which ever touched her however she handled the comfit box wishing to see how it was made opening and shutting it take care he murmured it's not very strong but she shrugged her shoulders did he think she had the hands of a railway porter and suddenly the hinge remained between her fingers whilst the lid fell to the ground and broke she stood lost in amazement with her eyes fixed on the pieces oh it's broken said she then she began to laugh the pieces on the floor looked funny to her it was a nervous gaiety she had the stupid and cruel laugh of a child who founds amusement in destruction philippe was seized for a moment with a feeling of indignation the wretched woman did not know what agony that trifle had cost him when she saw him looking so upset she endeavoured to restrain herself anyhow it wasn't my fault it was cracked those old things never keep together it was the lid did you see the stupid way in which it fell off and she burst out laughing again but as the young man's eyes filled with tears in spite of his efforts to restrain them she lovingly threw her arms round his neck how silly you are i love you all the same if nothing was ever broken the dealers would never sell anything it's all made to be broken look at this fan it isn't even stuck together she seized hold of a fan and roughly pulled it open the silk tore in two that seemed to excite her to show that she did not care anything for the other presents as she had spoiled his she regaled herself with a general massacre knocking the different things about proving as she destroyed them all there was not one of them that was solid a glimmer lighted up her vacant eyes a slight curl of her lips displayed her white teeth then when all the things were in pieces she struck the table with her open hands looking very red and laughing louder than ever and stammered forth in a childish voice all gone no more no more 
then philippe yielding to the intoxication cheered up and pressing against her kissed her on the neck and bosom she abandoned herself to him clinging to his shoulders feeling so happy that she could not recollect ever having enjoyed herself so much before and without leaving go of him she caressingly said i say darling you might manage to bring me ten louis to-morrow it's an awful nuisance a baker's bill which is worrying me he became very pale then kissing her for a last time on the forehead he merely said i will do my best a pause ensued she was dressing herself he was pressing his face against the window-pane at the end of a minute he returned to where she stood and said slowly nana you ought to marry me the idea seemed so ludicrous to the young woman that she could not finish fastening her petticoats but my poor fellow you must be ill is it because i've asked you for ten louis that you offer me your hand never i love you too much for that what a stupid idea to get into your head and as zoe entered the room to put madame's boots on they dropped the subject the maid had at once caught sight of the remnants of the presents scattered over the table she asked if they were to be put anywhere and madame having said that they could be thrown away she gathered them up in her apron down in the kitchen the servants quarrelled together as they shared madame's leavings that day georges in spite of having been forbidden by nana to do so had sneaked into the house francois had plainly enough seen him come in but now the servants merely laughed among themselves over their mistress's embarrassments he had crept into the parlour when the sound of his brother's voice arrested his advance and with his ear at the keyhole he had heard all that had taken place the kisses the offer of marriage a feeling of horror froze him he went off idiotic and with a sensation of emptiness in his head it was only when he reached the rue richelieu in his room over his mother's that his heart found relief in furious sobs this time doubt was impossible an abominable vision kept appearing before his eyes nana in philippe's arms and it seemed to him an incest when he thought himself calmed memory returned and in a fresh fit of jealous rage he threw himself on his bed biting the sheets and uttering horrible oaths which increased his passion the rest of the day passed thus he complained of a headache so as to be able to remain in his room but the night was more terrible still a murderous fever shook his frame in a continuous nightmare if his brother had lived in the house he would have gone and stabbed him with a knife when day returned he tried to reason with himself it was he who ought to die he would throw himself from the window as an omnibus passed however towards ten o'clock he went out he wandered about paris rambled over the bridges and then at last felt an invincible longing to see nana perhaps with a word she would save him and three o'clock was striking as he entered the house in the avenue de villiers towards midday some shocking news had quite overwhelmed madame hugon philippe had been in prison since the previous evening accused of having stolen twelve thousand francs from the regimental chest for three months past he had been embezzling small sums hoping to replace them and hiding the deficit by means of false accounts and this fraud had succeeded thanks to the negligence of the managing council the old lady crushed by her child's crime uttered at first a cry of rage against nana she knew of philippe's intimacy with the young woman her sadness came from this misfortune which was the cause of her remaining in paris through the fear of some catastrophe but never had she dreaded such shame and now she reproached herself for having refused him money as though she had been an accomplice having sunk into an armchair her legs so to say paralyzed she felt herself useless incapable of doing anything only fit to die but the sudden thought of georges consoled her georges was left her he might do something perhaps save them both then without asking help from any one desirous of hiding all this amongst themselves she dragged herself along and ascended the stairs fortified by the thought that she still had one love remaining but the room above was empty the doorkeeper told her that m georges had gone out early the signs of a second misfortune hovered about the room the bed with its torn and crumpled sheets told an unmistakable tale of anguish a chair knocked over on the ground amongst some clothes seemed to forebode death georges was probably at that woman's and madame hugon with dry eyes and a firm step descended the staircase she wanted her sons she was going to demand them 
ever since the morning nana had had nothing but worry first of all there was that baker who as early as nine o'clock had called with his bill a mere nothing a hundred and thirty-three francs worth of bread which she had been unable to settle for in the midst of her regal style of living he had called twenty times exasperated at having lost the custom on the day he had declined to give further credit and the servants espoused his cause francois said that madame would never pay him if he did not make a great fuss charles talked of going upstairs to get an old bill for straw settled whilst victorine advised them to wait till some gentleman called and to get the money by going to the drawing-room when he was there the servants hall was deeply interested all the tradespeople were kept informed of what was going on there were gossipings of three and four hours duration madame was disrobed pulled to pieces talked about with the rancour of idle menials bursting with good living julien the butler alone pretended to take madame's part she was all the same a fine woman and when the others accused him of having enjoyed some of her favours he laughed in a foppish sort of way which put the cook beside herself for she would have liked to have been a man to spit on such women they disgusted her so much francois had maliciously left the baker waiting in the hall without informing madame as she came downstairs at lunch-time she found herself face to face with him she took his bill and told him to call again about three o'clock then muttering a number of filthy expressions he went off swearing to be punctual and to pay himself some way or other nana made a very poor lunch being upset by this scene this time she would have to satisfy the man on ten different occasions at least she had put the money for him on one side but somehow or other it had always dribbled away one day for flowers or another day for a subscription for an old gendarme she was however counting on philippe and was even surprised that he had not already been with his two hundred francs it was awful ill luck two days before she had again rigged out satin a regular trousseau spending nearly twelve hundred francs in dresses and underclothing and she had not a louis left towards two o'clock as nana was beginning to be anxious la bordette called he brought the designs for the bedstead it was a diversion and produced a fit of joy which caused the young woman to forget everything else she clapped her hands she danced then brimful of curiosity leaning over a table in the parlour she examined the drawings which la bordette explained to her you see this is the boat in the centre a bunch of full-blown roses then a garland of flowers and buds the leaves will be in green gold and the roses in red gold and this is the great design for the head a troop of cupids dancing in a circle against a silver trellis but nana interrupted him carried away by rapture oh isn't he funny the little one the one in the corner turning a somersault and look at his saucy laugh they've all got such wicked eyes i say my boy i shall have to be careful of what i do before them she was in an extraordinary state of satisfied pride the goldsmiths had said that no queen ever slept on such a bedstead only there was a slight complication la bordette showed her two designs for the piece at the foot the one which reproduced the subject of the boat and cupids the other which was altogether a new design a female figure representing night enveloped in her veil which a fawn was drawing aside displaying her radiant nudity he added that if she selected this second design the goldsmiths intended to make the figure representing night like her this idea which was in questionable taste made her turn pale with pleasure she saw herself as a little silver statue the symbol of the tepid voluptuous pleasures of darkness of course you will only sit for the head and shoulders said la bordette why asked she coolly looking him in the face as it is a question of a work of art i shan't care a fig for the sculptor who copies me so it was settled she chose the second subject also but he stopped her wait it will cost six thousand francs more well that's all the same to me cried she bursting out laughing my little muff will pay it was thus she called count mufa now amongst her intimate acquaintances and the gentleman never asked after him otherwise than as did you see your little muff last night ah i thought i should have found the little muff here a simple familiarity which however she did not as yet allow herself to make use of in his presence la bordette rolled up the drawings as he gave her some final information the goldsmiths engaged to deliver the bedstead in two months time towards the twenty-fifth of december 
the very next week a sculptor would come to make the rough model for the figure of night as she walked with him to the stairs nana remembered the baker and said suddenly by the way do you happen to have ten louis about you one of la bordette's principles and which he found invaluable was never to lend money to women he always gave the same answer no my girl i'm quite stumped but would you like me to call on your little muff she refused it was useless two days before she had got five thousand francs out of the count following la bordette though it was scarcely half past two when he called the baker reappeared and he roughly seated himself on a bench in the hall swearing very loud the young woman was listening to him up on the first floor she turned pale she suffered especially at hearing up there the secret joy of the servants they were splitting their sides with laughing in the kitchen the coachman looked on from the yard francois passed across the hall without any necessity and then went and told the others how things were progressing after bestowing a chuckle of intelligence on the baker they did not care a straw for madame the walls seemed bursting with the sounds of their mirth she felt herself all alone despised by her servants who spied on her and bespattered her with their filthy jokes then as she had had an idea of borrowing the hundred and thirty-three francs from zoe she gave it up she already owed her some money she was too proud to risk a refusal so strong an emotion possessed her that she returned to her bedroom saying aloud never mind my girl only depend upon yourself your body's your own and it's best to make use of it rather than to submit to an insult and without even ringing for zoe she hastily dressed herself to go to old Tricon's. it was her supreme resource in the hours of great distress very much asked for always required by the old woman she refused or accepted according to her wants and the days which were becoming more and more frequent when she suffered from any embarrassment in her royal career she was always sure of finding twenty-five louis awaiting her there she would go to old tricon's in the easy style gained by habit the same as poor people go to the pawn-shop but on leaving her bedroom she ran up against georges standing in the middle of the parlour she did not notice his wax-like paleness the dull light in his wide-open eyes she uttered a sigh of relief ah you've come from your brother no said the youngster turning paler still then she made a gesture of despair what did he want why was he standing in front of her come she was in a hurry and she passed him then retracing her steps she asked have you any money with you no it's true how stupid of me never a thing not even the six sous for their omnibus mamma won't what men and she was hurrying off but he stopped her he wished to speak to her she excited kept saying that she had not time when with a word he made her leave off listen i know you are going to marry my brother well that was comic she dropped into a chair to laugh at her ease yes continued the youngster and i will not have it it is i whom you must marry that is why i have come eh hey, what you also she exclaimed is it then a family complaint but never what an idea did i ever ask you to do such a disgraceful thing neither the one nor the other never then georges face brightened up he might by chance have been mistaken he resumed then swear to me that you are not my brother's mistress ah you're becoming a confounded nuisance said nana rising to her feet impatient to be off it's funny for a minute but i tell you i'm in a hurry i'm your brother's mistress when i choose to be do you keep me do you pay here that you come and call me to account yes i'm your brother's mistress he had seized her arm and squeezed it almost enough to break it as he stammered out don't say that don't say that with a slap she freed herself he's whipping me now the young monkey my little fellow you must be off and at once too i've let you be here through kindness it's just so however wide you may open your eyes you didn't expect i suppose to have me for your mamma until the day of my death i've something better to do than to nurse brats he listened to her in an agony which stiffened his limbs and left him powerless each word stabbed him to the heart with a blow so hard that he felt it was killing him 
she, not even noticing his suffering, continued, happy at being able to vent herself on him for all her worries of the morning. "'It's just the same with your brother. He's a nice one, he is. He promised me two hundred francs. Ah, well, I may wait forever for him. It's not that I care about his money. Not enough to pay for my pomades. But he's left me in a fix. Now, would you like to know? Well, through your brother's fault, I'm going out to earn twenty-five louis from another man. Then, in a state of bewilderment, he stood before the door, and he cried and implored, clasping his hands together and muttering, Oh, no, oh, no. Well, I'm willing, said she. Have you the money? No, he had not got the money. He would have given his life to have had it. Never before had he felt so miserable, so useless, such a child. All his poor body, shaken with sobs, expressed a grief so great that she ended by seeing it and feeling for him. She pushed him gently on one side. Come, ducky, let me pass. You must. Be reasonable. You're a baby, and it was all very nice for a week. But today I must attend to my affairs. Think it over now. Your brother, too, is a man. I don't say with him. Ah, do me a kindness. Don't mention to him anything of all this. He has no need to know where I'm going. I always say too much when I'm angry. She laughed, then putting her arms round him and kissing him on the forehead, she added, Goodbye, baby. It's over. All over. You understand? Now I'm off. And she left him. He was standing in the center of the parlor. The last words sounded like a knell in his ears. It is over. All over and the ground seemed to open beneath his feet. In the vacuum of his brain the man who was awaiting Nana had disappeared. Philippe alone remained, continually in the woman's bare arms. She did not deny it. She certainly loved him, as she wished to spare him the grief of knowing her to be unfaithful. It was over. All over. He drew a long breath. He gazed round the room, choked by a weight that was crushing him. Recollections returned to him one by one. The merry nights at La Mignotte, hours of love during which he thought himself her child, then voluptuous pleasure snatched in that very room. And never, never more. He was too little, he had not grown quick enough. Philippe had taken his place because he had a beard. So, it was the end. He could no longer live. His vice had become full of an infinite tenderness, of a sensual adoration in which his whole being was centred. Then how could he forget when his brother would remain there, his brother who was of the same blood, another self whose pleasure drove him mad with jealousy? It was the end. He wished to die. All the doors were left open as the servants noisily scuttled about, they having seen Madame go out on foot. Downstairs, on the bench in the hall, the baker was laughing with Charles and Francois. As Zoe crossed the parlour at a run, she appeared surprised at seeing Georges and asked him if he was waiting for Madame. Yes, he was waiting for her. He had forgotten to tell her something. And, when he was again alone, he ferreted about. Finding nothing better, he took from the dressing-room a pair of sharply pointed scissors which Nana was continually using, cutting her hangnails and little hairs with them. Then, for an hour, he waited patiently, his hand in his pocket, his fingers nervously clutching the scissors. End of chapter 13, part 1
and simply, with one violent blow, he thrust them into his chest. Nana, however, had had a feeling that something terrible was going to happen. She turned round. When she saw him strike himself, she was seized with indignation. But he's cracked, he's cracked, and with my scissors, too. Will you leave off, you wicked child? Ah, good heavens, ah, good heavens! She was seized with fear. The youngster, fallen on his knees, had struck himself a second blow which had laid him flat on the carpet. He blocked the threshold of the bedroom. Then she became quite bewildered. She shouted with all her might, not daring to step over that body which shut her in and prevented her running for help. Zoe, Zoe, come quick, make him leave off. It's absurd, a child like that. He's killing himself now, and in my house too. Did anyone ever see such a thing? He frightened her. He was all white and his eyes were closed. The wound scarcely bled at all. There was only a little blood which trickled from under the waistcoat. She had nerved herself to pass over the body when an apparition caused her to draw back. Opposite to her, by the open door of the parlor, she beheld an old lady advancing, and she recognized Madame Hugon, terrified, unable to account for her presence. She continued to step back. She still wore her bonnet and gloves. Her terror became such that she attempted to defend herself in a hesitating voice. Madame, it was not I. I swear to you. He wanted to marry me. I said no, and he's killed himself. Madame Hugon slowly approached, dressed in black with her pale face and white hair. In the carriage the thought of Georges had left her, and Philippe Sin alone had occupied her mind. Perhaps that woman would give some explanations to the judges which might cause them to be more lenient, and her intention was to implore her to bear witness in her son's favor. Downstairs the doors of the mansion were wide open. She hesitated at the staircase with her poor legs, when suddenly shouts of fear had directed her steps. Then, upstairs, she beheld a man lying on the floor, his shirt stained with blood. It was Georges. It was her other child. Nana kept repeating in an idiotic way, He wanted to marry me. I said no, and he skilled himself. Without a cry, Madame Hugon stooped down. Yes, it was the other one. It was Georges. The one dishonored, the other dead. It did not surprise her in the downfall of her whole existence. Kneeling on the carpet, ignoring the place where she was, noticing no one, she looked fixedly in Georges's face. She listened with a hand upon his heart. Suddenly she uttered a faint sigh. She had felt his heart beat. Then she raised her head, examined the room and the woman, and seemed to recollect. A fire lighted up her vacant eyes. She was so grand and so terrible that Nana trembled as she continued to defend herself over that corpse which separated them. I swear to you, madame. If his brother was here, he could explain. His brother is a thief. He is in prison, said the mother harshly. Nana remained transfixed, gasping for breath. But why all that? The other had robbed. They were mad then in that family. She ceased struggling, no longer seeming to be in her own house, but leaving Madame Higon to give her own orders. Some of the servants had at last hastened to the spot. The old lady insisted on having Georges, insensible as he was, taken to her carriage. She would remove him from that house, though it killed him. Nana, with a stupefied gaze, watched the servants carrying that poor Zizi by his legs and shoulders. The mother followed behind, quite exhausted now, leaning on the furniture, as though sunk into the nothingness of all she loved. On the landing she sighed, and turning round said twice, "'Ah, you have done us much harm!' You have done us much harm. That was all. Nana seated herself in her stupor with her gloves still on her hands and her bonnet on her head. The house relapsed into a dull silence. The carriage had just gone off. And she remained immovable, without an idea, her head all buzzing with what had just transpired. A quarter of an hour later, Count Mifa found her in the same place. But then she eased herself with a great flow of words telling him of the misfortune repeating twenty times the same details, picking up the scissors smeared with blood, to imitate Zizi's gesture when he stabbed himself. And she seemed especially anxious to prove her innocence. Come now, darling, was it my fault? If you were justice, would you condemn me? I never told Philippe to steal, that's very certain, any more than I drove this poor fellow to kill himself. 
in all this i'm the most miserable they come and make fools of themselves here they cause me a great deal of pain i'm treated like a wretch of a woman and she burst out crying her nerves were highly unstrung which rendered her weak and doleful and deeply moved with an immense sorrow you too you don't seem very pleased ask zoe now if i'm at all to blame zoe speak explain to the count for some few minutes the maid having fetched from the dressing-room a towel and a basin of water had been rubbing the carpet to get rid of a stain of blood whilst it was still wet oh sir she declared madame is quite broken-hearted Mifa was greatly affected feeling stunned by the drama his thoughts full of that mother weeping for her two children he knew her great heart he saw her in her widow's weeds pining away all alone at les fondettes but nana's despair increased now the picture of zizi lying on the floor with a red spot on his shirt put her quite beside herself he was so pretty so gentle so caressing ah you know ducky it's so much the worse if you don't like it i loved him the baby i can't control myself it's stronger than i am and then it can't matter to you now he is no longer here you have what you wanted you may be quite sure of never catching us together again this last idea overwhelmed him with such regret that he ended by trying to console her she must bear up she was right it was not her fault but she stopped him to say listen you must run and bring me news of him at once i insist he took his hat and went off to obtain news of georges when he returned at the end of three-quarters of an hour he beheld nana leaning out of the window anxiously awaiting him and he called to her from the pavement that the little fellow was not dead and that they even hoped to save his life then she changed at once to a great joy she sang danced and thought life beautiful zoe however was not satisfied with her cleansing she kept looking at the stain and saying each time she passed you know madame it hasn't gone away and in fact as it dried the stain appeared a pale red on one of the white ornaments of the carpet it was on the very threshold of the room like a line of blood barring the way bah said nana happy once more the footsteps will wear it away by the morrow count mifa had also forgotten the incident when in the cab on the way to the rue richelieu he had sworn never to return to that woman heaven gave him a warning he looked on philippe's and georges calamity as foreboding his own ruin but neither the spectacle of madame hugo in tears nor the sight of the youth consumed with fever had had the power to make him keep his oath and from the short moment of emotion caused by the drama all that remained to him was the secret joy of being rid of a rival whose charming youth had always exasperated him he now experienced an exclusive passion one of those passions of men who have had no youth he loved nana with a necessity always to know that she was his alone to hear her to touch her to be under the influence of her breath it was an attachment which had gone beyond the mere gratification of his senses and had reached the purer feeling an anxious affection jealous of the past dreaming at times of redemption of pardon bestowed both of them kneeling before god the father each day religion regained some of its ascendancy over him he again practised going to confession and communicating struggling unceasingly mingling his remorse with the joys of sin and of penitence then his spiritual director having permitted him to wear out his passion he had made a habit of that daily damnation which he redeemed by bursts of faith full of a devout humility he very naively offered to heaven as an expiatory suffering the abominable torment he endured this torment continued to increase it raised his calvary of a believer of a grave and profound heart fallen into the mad sensuality of a courtesan what caused him the most agony were the continual infidelities of that woman for he could not accustom himself to share with others failing to understand her stupid infatuations he longed for an eternal love ever the same yet she had sworn to be faithful and he paid her for that but he felt that she lied unable to guard herself giving herself to her friends and the passers-by like some good animal born to live in a state of nakedness one morning that he observed Foucarmont leaving her house at a rather peculiar hour he sought an explanation she at once flew into a passion tired of his jealousy 
she had already on several occasions been very nice. For instance, the night when he had caught her with Georges, she had been the first to make it up, admitting her fault, loading him with caresses and pretty words to help him get over it. But at length he bored her with his obstinacy in not understanding women, and she roughly said, Well, yes, I've been Poucarmont's mistress. What next? Eh, hey, that puts your hair out of curl, my little muff. It was the first time she had called him a little muff to his face. He remained bursting with rage at the brazenness of her avowal, and as he clinched his fist, she walked towards him and looked him straight in the face. Now, that's enough, do you hear? If it doesn't please you, just oblige me by going off. I won't have you kicking up a row in my house. Understand that I intend to be free to do as I like. When a man pleases me, I'll have him here. Exactly, that's what I mean. And you must make up your mind at once. Yes or no, the door is open. She had gone and opened the door. He did not go. So now it became her way of attaching him to her all the more. For nothing at all, at the least quarrel, she gave him his choice, accompanied by some of the most abominable reflections. Ah, well, she would always be able to find someone better than he. She had only too many people to choose from. One could pick up men outside as many as one wanted, and fellows who were not such ninnies as he, whose blood boiled in their veins. He bowed his head. He waited for better times, when she would be in want of money. Then she became caressing, and he forgot everything. A night of love compensated for the tortures of a week. His reconciliation with his wife had made his home unbearable. The countess, cast off by Faucherie, who was once more completely under Rose's influence, sought forgetfulness in other amours in the attack of the feverish anxiety of her forty years, ever nervous, and filling the house with the exasperating commotion of her mode of living. Since her marriage, Estelle no longer saw her father. This skinny and insignificant-looking girl had suddenly developed into a woman with an iron will so absolute that Dagonet trembled before her. Now he accompanied her to church, converted and furious with his father-in-law who was ruining them with an abandoned female. M. Venot alone remained affectionate towards the Count whilst biding his time. He had even succeeded in gaining access to Nana. He frequented the two houses where one often came across his continual smile behind the doors and Mufa, miserable in his own home, driven from thence by dullness and shame, preferred rather to live amidst the insults of the Avenue de Villiers. Soon, only one question remained between Nana and the Count, that of money. One day, after formally promising to bring ten thousand francs, he had dared to present himself at the appointed time empty-handed. For the previous two days she had been exciting him with endless caresses. Such a breaking of his word, so many endearing little ways wasted threw her into an abuse of rage. She became quite white. Eh, hey, you've no money? Then, my little muff, return to whence you came, and quicker than that, too. What a sordid wretch! And he was going to kiss me. No money, no anything. You understand? He entered into some explanations. He would have the money the day after the morrow. But she interrupted him violently. And my bills that are coming due. They'll seize my goods whilst his lordship comes here on tick. Now, just look at yourself. Do you think I love you for yourself? When one has a mug like yours, one pays the women who are willing to put up with you. Damnation! If you don't bring me the ten thousand francs tonight, you shan't even so much as suck the tip of my little finger. Really, I must send you back to your wife. That night he brought the ten thousand francs. Nana held out her lips. He took a long kiss, which consoled him for all his day of agony. What annoyed the young woman was always having him attached to her skirts. She complained to M. Venot, imploring him to take her little muff to the countess. Their reconciliation did not appear to have been of much use, and she regretted having had anything to do with it, as he was forever at her back. The days when, blinded by anger, she forgot her interest, she swore to play him such a dirty trick that he would never again be able to come near her. But while she blackguarded him, slapping her thighs meanwhile, she might have even spat in his face, he would have remained and thanked her. Then they had continual quarrels about money. She roughly demanded it. She abused him in regard to the most miserable sums, odiously greedy every minute, delighting in cruelly telling him that she only tolerated him for his money and for nothing else, 
that she didn't care for him, that she loved another, and that she was very unfortunate in having to do with such an idiot as he. They did not even want to have him any longer at court, where there was a talk of requesting him to send in his resignation. The Empress had said, He is too disgusting. That was very true and nana always repeated the words as a parting shot in their quarrels really you are too disgusting she no longer put the least constraint upon herself now she had regained complete liberty every day she took her drive in the bois round the lake forming acquaintances there which became more intimate elsewhere it was the great angling match for men the baiting in the full light of day the hooking by illustrious harlots beneath the smile of toleration and the dazzling luxury of paris duchesses drew each other's attention to her the wives of wealthy tradesmen copied her bonnets at times her landau when striving to pass would arrest a long string of grand equipages containing financiers holding all europe in their cash-boxes and ministers whose big fingers were half throttling france and she formed a part of this world of the bois she occupied an important position there known by the people of every capital greatly in demand with all foreigners adding the mad fit of her debauchery to the splendours of that crowd like the very glory and keen enjoyment of a nation then the intimacies of a night mere birds of passage of which she herself lost all recollection on the morrow would take her to the grand restaurants often to the cafe de madrid when the weather was fine all the staff of the embassies defiled there she dined with lucy stuart who murdered the french language and who paid to be amused taking the girls at so much an evening with instructions to them to be funny while they themselves were so sick of everything and so worn out that they never even touched them and the girls called it going on the spree they returned home delighted at having been treated with such disdain and finished the night with some lover of their choice count mifa pretended to be ignorant of these goings-on when nana did not tell him of them herself he suffered, too, a great deal from the disgraces of his daily existence. The mansion in the Avenue de Villiers was becoming a regular hell, a madhouse in which sudden crazes at all hours of the day led to the most odious scenes. Nana had arrived at the point of battling with her servants. At one time she was especially good to Charles, the coachman. Whenever she stopped at a restaurant, she sent him out refreshments by the waiters. She would talk to him from inside her landau, highly amused, thinking him very funny as he roundly abused the other drivers whenever there was a block in the street. Then, without rhyme or reason, she completely changed and treated him as a fool. She was always wrangling about the straw, the bran, and the oats. In spite of her love for animals, she considered that her horses ate too much. So at length, one settling day, as she accused him of robbing her, Charles flew into a passion and bluntly called her a strumpet. Her horses, anyhow, were worth more than she— they did not let every one muck them about she retorted in a similar style and the count was obliged to separate them and turn the coachman off the premises but this was only the beginning of a general stampede of the servants victorine and francois went off after the discovery of a robbery of diamonds even julien disappeared and a story was circulated that the count had implored him to go giving him at the same time a large sum of money because madame had taken a great fancy to him every week fresh faces were seen in the servants hall never had there been such waste the house was like a passage through which the scum of the servants registry offices defiled in a massacring gallop zoe alone kept her place with her neat look and her only anxiety of organizing the disorder so long as she had not saved sufficient to settle down on her own account a plan which she had been working at for a long time past and yet those were only the avowable cares the count bore with madame maloire's stupidity playing at bezique with her in spite of her rank odour he put up with madame lerat and her cackling and with little louis and his doleful complaints of a child devoured by disease some putrefaction bequeathed by an unknown father but he had to endure other things far worse one night behind a door he had heard nana furiously telling her maid that a pretended rich man had just taken her in yes a handsome fellow who said he was american and owned gold mines in his own country a mean vagabond who had gone off whilst she was asleep without leaving a sou behind and even taking a packet of cigarette papers away with him and the count very pale had crept downstairs again on tiptoe so that he might feign ignorance of the occurrence on another occasion he was obliged to be aware of everything 
Nana, infatuated with a singer at a music hall and forsaken by him, wanted to commit suicide in a fit of gloomy sentimentality. She swallowed a glass of water in which she had soaked a handful of matches and was horribly ill in consequence, but did not die. The Count had to nurse her and listen to the story of her passion intermingled with tears and oaths never to care for men again. In her contempt for the pigs, as she called them, she could not, however, keep her heart free, having always some sweetheart about her skirts and indulging in the most inexplicable caprices through the depraved tastes of her wearied body. Since Zoe relaxed her supervision to meet her own ends, the good management of the household had disappeared to the extent that Mifa dared not open a door, draw a curtain or look into a cupboard. The machinery no longer worked. Gentlemen were hanging about everywhere. At every minute they were knocking up against each other. Now he invariably coughed before entering a room, having almost found the young woman with her arms round Francis's neck one evening that he had left the dressing-room for a couple of minutes to order the carriage, whilst the hairdresser was giving a few finishing touches to Madame's hair. It was for ever sudden abandonments behind his back. Pleasures snatched in odd corners, quickly, and in her chemise or in her most gorgeous costumes, with whoever happened to be with her. Then, delighted with her robbery, she would rejoin him, looking very red in the face. With him there would have been no pleasure. He was such an abominable nuisance. In the agony of his jealousy the unhappy man had reached the state of feeling easy whenever he left Nana and Satin alone together. He would have encouraged her in this connection for the sake of keeping the men away. But on this side also everything went wrong. Nana deceived Satin, the same as she deceived the Count, having a rage for the most monstrous crazes, picking up girls from the street corners. When returning home in her carriage, she would at times become enamoured of some strumpet caught sight of on the pavement, her senses inflamed, her imagination kindled, and she would take the woman with her, then pay her and send her away. At other times, disguised as a man, she would frequent houses of ill repute, and witness spectacles of debauchery which helped her to forget her weariness and Satin, annoyed at being continually forsaken, would disturb the house with the most atrocious scenes. She had ended by gaining complete mastery over Nana, who respected her. Mifa even thought of allying himself with her. When he did not dare to do anything himself, he would set Satin to work. Twice she had made her darling take him back, whilst he showed himself very obliging, giving her a word of warning or making himself scarce at the least sign. Only the understanding did not last long, for Satin, too, was cracked. On certain days she would smash everything, feeling half dead, ruining what little health she had left in excesses of anger or of dissipation, looking pretty, though, in spite of all. Zoe probably set her off, for she took her into corners as though she wished to gain her over in the interest of that grand business of hers, that plan of which she had never yet spoken to anyone. Singular fits of revolt, however, still took possession of Count Mifa. He, who had tolerated Satin for months past, who had ended by accepting strangers, all that troop of men galloping through Nana's bedroom, became enraged at the idea of being deceived by any of his friends or even acquaintances. When she owned to him her intimacy with Foucarmont, he suffered so much, he considered the young man's treachery so abominable that he wished to provoke him to a duel as he did not know whom to ask to be his seconds in such an affair he consulted la bordette the latter was so astounded that he could not refrain from laughing a duel about nana but dear sir all paris would laugh at you no one could fight for nana it would be too ridiculous the count became very pale he made a violent gesture then i will strike him in the street before every one for an hour la bordette had to reason with him a blow would make the story odious. By the evening everyone would know the real cause of the meeting. He would be the laughing-stock of the newspapers. And La Bordette kept returning to this conclusion. Impossible! It would be too ridiculous! Each time these words fell upon Mifa sharp and clean like the blow of a knife. He could not even fight for the woman he loved. Everyone would split their sides with laughing. Never before had he so painfully felt the misery of his love, that solemn feeling of his heart lost in that fooling of pleasure. This was his last revolt. He let himself be convinced. From that time he assisted at the procession of his friends, of all the men who lived there in the privacy of the mansion. In a few months Nana devoured them greedily one after the other. 
the increasing requirements of her luxury whetted her appetite she cleaned a man out with the crunch of her teeth first she had foucarmont who did not last a fortnight he had dreamed of leaving the navy in ten years of a seafaring life he had saved some thirty thousand francs which he wanted to risk in the united states and his prudent and even miserly instincts were silenced he gave all even his signature to accommodation bills thus affecting his future when nana turned him adrift he was penniless however she showed herself very kind-hearted she advised him to return to his ship what was the use of being obstinate as he had no money left he could not possibly remain with her he ought to understand that and be reasonable a ruined man fell from her hands like ripe fruit to rot on the earth all by himself next nana tackled steiner without disgust but also without love she called him a dirty jew she seemed to be gratifying an old hatred which she could not very well explain to herself he was fat he was stupid and she turned him about taking double mouthfuls wishing to have done with the prussian all the quicker he had given up simon his bosphorus speculation was already in jeopardy nana hastened his downfall by the most lavish expenditure for a month still he struggled performing miracles he covered europe with a colossal publicity posters advertisements prospectuses and extracted money from the most distant countries all those savings the louis of the speculators the same as the sous of the poor people were swallowed up in the avenue de villiers he had also gone into partnership with an iron founder in alsace there were there in a corner of the country workmen black with coal dust bathed with perspiration who night and day tightened their muscles and heard their bones crack to supply the means for nana's pleasures she devoured all like a great fire the thefts at the bourse the earnings of labour this time she finished steiner she returned him to the pavement sucked to the bone so emptied that he remained even incapable of inventing a fresh roguery in the collapse of his banking establishment he went crazy he trembled at the name of the police he was made a bankrupt and the mere word money bewildered him threw him into a childish state of embarrassment he who had handled millions one evening when with her he burst out crying he asked her to lend him a hundred francs to pay his servant and nana affected and amused by this ending of the terrible old man who for twenty years past had been skimming the paris market brought him the money saying you know i give him you because it's funny but listen my little man you're not of an age for me to keep you you must seek some other occupation then nana at once started on la Faloise. he had for a long time been soliciting the honour of being ruined by her so as to be a perfect swell that was what he was in want of he must have a woman to bring him out in two months paris would know him and he would read his own name in all the newspapers six weeks sufficed his inheritance consisted of landed estates fields pastures woods and farms he had to sell them rapidly one after the other at every bite nana devoured an acre the foliage frizzling beneath the sun the rich ripe corn the golden vines in september the tall grass in which the cows buried themselves up to their shoulders all went as though engulfed in some abyss and there were also a stream a lime quarry and three windmills which disappeared nana passed like an invading army like one of those clouds of locusts whose flight destroys a whole province similar to a flame of fire she burnt the earth wherever she placed her tiny foot farm after farm meadow after meadow she nibbled up the inheritance in her pretty way without even noticing what she was about just the same as she would crunch up a bag of burnt almonds placed on her knees between her meals it was a matter of no consequence they were merely sweeties but one night there only remained a small wood she swallowed it with a disdainful air for it was really not worth the trouble of opening one's mouth for la Faloise laughed in an idiotic way as he sucked the knob of his walking-stick debts were crushing him down he no longer possessed a hundred francs of income he saw himself obliged to go back to the country and live with a maniacal uncle but that did not matter he was a swell the figaro had twice printed his name and with his skinny neck rising out of his collar slightly turned down in front his waist encased in a waistcoat a great deal too tight he swaggered about 
uttering exclamations like a parrot and affecting the languors of a wooden puppet that has never had an emotion nana whom he irritated immensely ended by beating him faucherie however had returned brought by his cousin the unfortunate faucherie at this time had become quite a family man after breaking off with the countess he found himself in the hands of rose who treated him as a real husband mignon simply remained madame's major-domo installed as master the journalist used to lie to rose and whenever he deceived her had to take all sorts of precautions full of the scruples of a good spouse desirous of at length settling down nana's triumph was to hook him and to devour a newspaper he had started with the money of one of his friends she did not openly go about with him she took a delight on the contrary in treating him as a gentleman who must conceal his movements and whenever she spoke of rose she would say that poor rose the newspaper supplied her with flowers for a couple of months she had subscribers in the country she took everything from the leading article to the theatrical notes then after wearing out the editors dislocating the management she satisfied one of her big caprices a winter garden in a corner of her mansion which carried off the printing establishment it was merely by way of amusement however when mignon delighted with what was taking place hastened to see if he could not fix faucherie on her for good she asked him if he was poking fun at her a fellow without a sou living on his articles and his plays not if she knew it such stupidity was only worthy of a woman of talent like that poor rose and full of mistrust fearing some underhand dealing on mignon's part who was quite capable of denouncing them to his wife she dismissed faucherie who for some time had only been paying her in advertisements End of chapter 13, part 2